Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents On the Company's Service by Ellis K. Meacham Narrated by Stephen Crossley, a member of SAG-AFTRA Part 1 Officer in Tactical Command Chapter 1 Irritation welled up, tightening his throat. Merriweather stole a glance at Commodore Land beside him and saw the heightened colour in his cheeks. The proposition did not sit well with Land either, he decided. Sir George Barlow, acting Governor-General of India, sat across the table in icy composure, eyes fixed upon the speaker. And, of course, the Admiral anticipates that the Marine will take part in the combined operations against Mauritius and Java later this year. High time, he says, that the Royal Navy had a look at your state of readiness. Give you a chance to make up shortcomings, concluded Foreman Admiral Pellew's flag captain, settling back in his chair with a bland expression. Beside him, Captain Wolfe sat quietly with a faint smile on his face. Only a week ago, Wolfe had been first lieutenant in Apollo, 36 guns, when the Admiralty pouch from London by way of the Overland Mail, the Persian Gulf, Bombay Castle and Rapid, had brought the news that he was posted captain. There was no command available, but evidently the energetic Sir Edward Pellew did not intend that he should be idle meanwhile. "'Your Excellency,' began Commodore Land, "'it's unusual.' broke in Sir George, ignoring land. There should, of course, be the closest relationship and cooperation between the Navy and the Marine. Each has the same ultimate objective, destruction of the enemy. I'll not argue the point with Sir Edward, but it must be understood that Commodore Merriweather is under the orders of the Governor-General, the Company and Commandant of the Marine, and responsible solely to them. Certainly, Your Excellency, replied Captain Foreman easily. I am sure Wolf here clearly understands that he is no more than an observer. I might say that Admiral Pellew expressed the highest regard for Commodore Merriweather's abilities. It may well be that we shall learn a bit from him. The irritation persisted in spite of the fair words of Foreman. Merriweather reached into his memory for the term Lady Caroline Austin had used in conversation last night. Sophistry, he recalled. He had tracked down its definition this noon in the library of the Calcutta Club. There was some motive here lying beneath the surface, he was convinced. Very well, said Sir George briskly. It's settled then. Wolf, his midshipman aide, and one servant. You have suitable accommodations, Merriweather? Yes, Your Excellency. It meant evicting Larkin from the supercargo's cabin in Rapid and moving each junior officer to less comfortable quarters, but this was only an incident of the service. The irritation subsided a little as the discipline of a lifetime at sea asserted itself, but suspicion lingered. The capture of the privateer schooner last July and the prominent part played by Rapid in the taking of a French frigate must have brought home to the Royal Navy that the Bengal squadron of the Bombay Marine would be a force to reckon with. Sir George stood up in dismissal, and Merriweather marched up with the rest to the anteroom, where Loxley, the secretary, presided. Wolfe approached him with the same half-smile upon his face. Ah, Commodore, we'll get along famously, I am sure. I am a man of simple tastes, but I do like my wine cellar along. Is there an empty room where I may store it under lock and key? Wolfe was almost the same height as Merriweather, but slighter in body, with unwinking blue eyes, blonde hair and curling side whiskers, and the self-confident air of one whose complete acceptance by any group is assured. Up close, the fair complexion was marred by a number of tiny purple veins visible under the skin along each side of the high-arched nose. Merriweather decided he was about his own age and wondered fleetingly if the man were a heavy drinker. Larkin's pigeons had sickened and died during the voyage to China last fall, and the extra boatswain's locker was empty. Yes, of course, he told Wolfe, 
thinking of the small supply of wines and spirits that he must replenish for himself, though he did not anticipate many occasions this cruise when such luxuries would be necessary. Thank you. And how did you acquire that extraordinary scar on your face? The scar was nearly two years old, and Merriweather was unmindful of its existence except when it became irritated and caused difficulty in shaving. It was an honourable scar, and his fellow officers in the Marine either knew its origin or made discreet inquiry of others. He was not self-conscious, but the bald question from an officer he had not seen until an hour ago brought annoyance flushing up. Repelling borders, he said, turning away. It was only a moment before he regained his poise. It was ridiculous to let a tactless question upset him, particularly when this captain would be his guest aboard ship for an indefinite period. And do you require a boat, captain? he forced himself to ask. I was about to inquire as to that, said Wolf, still with the half-smile. I'm the guest of Captain Flournoy ashore, and if you can send a boat and working party of Oh, say, eight in round figures at noon tomorrow. I'll have my furniture and baggage ready to move. Very well, Captain, said Merriweather, thinking of the sea chest that held his worldly belongings. I expect away on the ebb, day after tomorrow. Quite, said Wolf. Merriweather joined Commodore Land to emerge into the blinding afternoon sun of Calcutta and mount the dockyard Tonga. In three minutes they had circled the square and pulled up beside Veloso's public house. In the cool, dim interior they found a table, and the white-haired proprietor brought London gin and lemons. Each took a swallow, and Land set down his glass with a thump. God damned whippersnappers! he exploded. We've shaken them up, taken prize money out of their pockets, and now they want to find out how! No more than a spying mission and then an after-the-fact report. He shook his head, black eyes snapping. I thought Sir George would give them short shrift. But he wants a foot in each camp. What with the political situation so tight? Merriweather felt the gin take effect, expanding through his body and relaxed a bit. He finished the glass, bit into the lemon and signalled Veloso. He could not afford to let the patronising smile and arrogant manner of a junior Royal Navy captain upset him. He was solely responsible for the mission of the Bengal squadron of the Bombay Marine. Land tasted the second glass, then continued his remarks, damning the Royal Navy and spineless politicians who held high office. Merriweather fixed himself in an attitude of rapt attention, but let his thoughts wander. This was the last day of 1806, and tomorrow would be his twenty-ninth birthday. A year ago he had been a first lieutenant in London, full of anxieties as to his prospects for promotion at the New Year's meeting of the Court of Directors of the Honourable East India Company, the new full-dress uniform sponged and pressed hanging ready for his appearance before the session. The promotion to captain had been only the first event in a year of movement, culminating in his acquittal early this month of charges of violating the laws of China before a court of inquiry at Bombay, and the loss to another of the woman he had convinced himself he loved. The thought of Flora Dean inevitably brought to mind Lady Caroline Austin, niece of Sir George, a woman of poisoned beauty, but so reserved that he had had difficulty making conversation with her on the three occasions they had been thrown together. Possibly the watch party for the new year tonight would thaw her. Merriweather became aware that Land had ceased his tirade and had asked a question. Certainly, sir. Right here. He unbuckled the oilskin-lined portfolio and handed over the commission to form the Bengal squadron, engrossed on parchment with its seals and ribbons to Land, who scanned it briefly. Now, Merriweather, I hope you are aware that this commission gives you a broad command to achieve a single objective. Sweep clear the Bay of Bengal and its approaches of the enemy. How you accomplish this result is your affair. 
I hope you've given the matter some thought. Yes, sir, replied Merriweather anxiously, reaching for the dozen sheets of foolscap in the portfolio on which he had drafted his tentative operational orders. Not now, interrupted Land. I haven't the foggiest idea at the moment of where to start, other than that report nearly two months old from Mr. Ross in the Cocos Islands. I take it you'll hold a council of war with your captains before you leave. He handed back the commission. Yes, sir. Tomorrow afternoon in Rapid. I hope you can be present. Oh, I'm invited elsewhere, but I'll be on board before you weigh anchor. Merriweather looked again at the commission. Some nameless clerk at Bombay Castle had made the instrument a work of art with his elaborate penmanship. He ran his eye down it for the fortieth time since he had received it. Commodore's Commission To Percival Merriweather Esquire, Captain in the Bombay Marine Greeting Whereas open hostilities have taken place between our Sovereign Lord, the King, and the French and Batavian Republics, and whereas we, the said United Company, are duly authorised and empowered by virtue of diverse charters in that behalf, given and granted unto us by the predecessors of our said Sovereign Lord, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, to raise and maintain forces and armies, both by sea and land, and to appoint such and so many generals, commanders, and other officers as we shall see fit for the purpose of encountering and resisting by force of arms, all and every the enemy and enemies of our sovereign lord the king and ourselves, and the said enemies and every of them, their ships, armour, ammunition, and other goods, to invade and destroy in such manner as in and by the said charters is provided, mentioned, and contained. Now we, the said United Company, in consideration of the premises and reposing a special trust and confidence in your good conduct, loyalty, and courage, do by these presents, and under and by virtue of the royal charter aforesaid, and all other powers in us vested, constitute and appoint you, Percival Merriweather Esquire, Captain in the Bombay Marine, to be during the hostilities aforesaid, and during our pleasure, and the pleasure of the Governor-General in Council, Commodore. There followed admonitions and directions of obedience to his orders addressed to all other commanders, officers and warrant officers of the Bombay ships, naval and marine service. An order to destroy or capture all forces of the French or Batavian republics in the Bay of Bengal, and a brief conclusion. It was signed and sealed by Commodore Sir John Waldron, Commandant of the Marine, Sir James Campbell, Superintendent of the Marine, and endorsed, approved by the Governor-General and Council under the Common Seal. Beyond the formal language to Merriweather, the Commission contained but a single order, sweep clear the Bay of Bengal of the enemy. The manner and means of accomplishing this was left entirely to his discretion. He thought of the books he had laboured through the past week, accounts of naval operations, strategy and tactics, which shed little light on how to find an elusive enemy in an area of almost a million square miles of open sea. Suddenly the meaning and implications of a broad command came home to him with all its frightening responsibilities. He tucked the commission back into the portfolio, buckled it, drained his glass and followed Commodore Land out to the Tonga. The watch party was at the town mansion of a high official in the company. He was uncertain of his host's exact title, but Sir George and Lady Barlow, other members of the council and two justices of the High Court of Judicature with their wives were among the glittering throng when he arrived. This was not one of the formal events of Calcutta society. There was no announcement of the arrival of guests, but they were quietly greeted, identified, and ushered into the drawing-room where servants presided over punch-bowls containing real ice. The new title of Commodore opened doors, Merriweather cynically concluded, taking a cup of punch. A little later he found himself paying his respects to Sir George and Lady Barlow and soon after found himself in the company of Lady Caroline, 
striving to find some subject that would penetrate her reserve. He was on his third attempt, when out of the corner of his eye he saw the blue coat and gold lace of the Royal Navy approaching. Ah, oh, there, Merriweather, delightful occasion. There was no escape. He turned and made the introduction. Lady Caroline, may I present Captain Wolfe? The captain made a deep bow. Enchanted, he said. I had no idea such beauty had found its way to Calcutta. Lady Caroline blushed and stammered in response. Her reserve penetrated. A Merriweather could see that Wolfe had made an impression upon her in a moment that he had not during several hours. The man's colour was high, his speech eloquent, and he soon led her away toward the ballroom where musicians were playing. Merriweather cursed his inability to make the light conversation and witty remarks that had flowed so easily from the lips of Wolfe. He went back for more punch, and then found himself cornered by the host, a portly gentleman with a vast concern for the price of cotton cloth and the wages demanded by seamen serving in East India men. By the time he had extricated himself from this affair, it was midnight. The new year was welcomed in with a medley of toasts, and supper was announced. Lingering beside the door, Merriweather watched the group coming from the ballroom, mostly the younger set in high spirits, giggling and chattering. Finally Lady Caroline emerged, chin high and spots of colour in her cheeks. Wolf beside her, smiling and turning toward her at each step to make some remark. She came across the floor at a determined pace, took Merriweather's arm, inclined her head slightly to Wolf, and led the way toward the dining room where the buffet was laid. As he turned, he saw Wolf make an elaborate bow and heard him say, Au revoir, you beautiful minx! Lady Caroline gave no indication that she heard but proceeded swiftly to the veranda where Sir George and Lady Barlow had gathered with the host and hostess. Even with the aid of the sparkling wines, Merriweather could obtain little response from her. She barely picked at the repast until she saw Merriweather finished, then whispered to him, Can you take me home? Certainly, he replied, if you wish. She stood up, moved around the table, and whispered in the ear of Lady Barlow, who appeared startled, looked hard at Merriweather, and then nodded. Lady Caroline took her leave of the host and hostess, as did Merriweather. Take the barouche and send it back, said Sir George in an undertone. The ride to the palace was quiet. Merriweather puzzled at the turn of events and unable to think of anything to say. Lady Caroline sitting rigidly against the arm of the seat. The gate swung open, the guard saluted, and the Indian watchman ushered them into the entrance hall. I know you must want to get back, she said quickly. I'll not detain you and thank you for an introduction to a cad. She turned and started through the door at the end of the hall. Merriweather was astounded. He had no idea of what was behind this remarkable statement. Wait, he called, but she hesitated in the doorway. I don't understand, he continued lamely. Have I offended you? She was weeping, Merriweather could see now, tears trickling down her cheeks and shoulders heaving. He advanced cautiously, holding out his hands to find them seized and her head pressed against his chest as she sobbed. He waited, holding her hands for the paroxysm to subside, then led her into the sitting-room behind the door and applied his handkerchief until the tears were dried. She sat down and Merriweather took a chair opposite, still unable to fathom the reason for her distress or the meaning of the accusation she had hurled at him. After a space, she lifted her face, composure restored, and said in a low voice, It's hard to be a young widow, especially after you come out of mourning. People misunderstand you. Men think you're fair game for their schemes, that all they need do is beckon to have you fall into bed. Merriweather had heard vaguely that Lady Caroline's late husband had died at Trafalgar last year, 
but on the two previous occasions he had been in her company, he had given the matter no thought, and certainly had not considered the fact of widowhood to be an overt invitation to solicit a casual liaison. She continued, That horrible man, Captain Wolf, made a most explicit and insulting proposal to me tonight, and then laughed at me. Merriweather wondered for a moment if it were the proposal or the laugh that had so upset her. Did you tell him I was widowed? she demanded. Why, no, he replied, a little nettled. I never saw the man before this, or rather, yesterday afternoon. The implications of his roles as the one making an unwelcome introduction, and now as a prospective champion, began to sink in. Gad! Was he under some chivalrous obligation here? The man had provoked irritation yesterday afternoon with his patronizing half-smile and tactless question, but he would be in close association with him for an indefinite period at sea. Was he under an obligation of honor to this woman he had only seen a few times before, to go back and call out, Wolf? Lady Caroline resolved the dilemma. I'm sorry I made such a scene, she said, standing up and stretching out her hand. It was not your fault. You could not know his character. Now you must go back to the party, and thank you for your understanding. Merriweather protested, but she was firm, and he took his departure. The barouche had long since gone back to await the Governor-General. He had no desire to return to the affair himself, and walked back to the dockyard. He was still debating what he should have done. Had she decided he was a poltroon and let him off? Nonsense, he decided, as he signalled Hamlin from the gig not to pipe the side. In his cabin he pulled off the full-dress uniform and saw Sang, his steward, hang it away in a locker. Gin! No, a pot of tea, please, Sang, and I'll not require anything further. It was seven bells into the mid-watch but he felt compelled to read and edit again the draft of his operational order, upon which his whole future might depend. It would be copied off in the morning, then distributed to his captains, the Governor-General and the Marine. The brief conversation with Land yesterday afternoon had brought home again to him the tremendous responsibilities he bore for the success or failure of the operation. He weighed each paragraph, seeking weakness, amending and emending until at the tenth page he found the tea cold, his eyes not focusing, and blew out the lamp to fall across the brass bed. As he lay back, the curious events of the evening crossed his mind again. Could Lady Caroline be the kind of female whose desire to be the centre of attention caused her to provoke conflict among her admirers? Her subsequent conduct did not confirm the fact, but Merriweather resolved that he would be cautious. Chapter 2 By noon all departments in Rapid are reported ready for departure tomorrow, and the post-watch had left for a last liberty in Calcutta until sunset. Mr. Midshipman Hamlin, Mr. Davis, the purser, and Webster, a taciturn middle-aged seaman who refused to disclose the sources of his education, have made the fair copies of the order. Merriweather re-read and signed them, then took the gig to the dockyard to meet McClellan, who had been his first lieutenant a year ago, and go on to the Calcutta Club for lunch this New Year's Day. You can't guess what day this is, Mac. Merriweather said as the waitress set Scots whiskey and gin before them. Your birthday, said McClellan, raising his glass and looking for confirmation. Many happy returns and a muckle more of them. The big Scots officer glowed with goodwill as he drank the toast. I only wish I were going with you, Captain, on this sweep. And I too. With you as my chief of staff, I'd have no worries. And now, what's the news of Calcutta? He was back on board by six bells of the afternoon watch. The charts of the Bay of Bengal and its approaches tacked on the bulkhead 
looking at them blindly as though by sufficient concentration he might divine the location of the French cruisers. Within the hour Morrison of Tiger arrived with his officers. Macrae was not far behind, informing Merriweather that only yesterday had he felt this state of readiness in Comet sufficient to commission her. He led the group aft and stood aside as they went below to the cabin. He heard the watch hail and saw the launch coming alongside the port gangway, her gunnels almost awash. Wolf came up the ladder to the squeal of the bosun's pipe, followed by a midshipman. Kinney was the name in the orders, and Merriweather greeted him. Welcome aboard, Captain. And do you require more hands? Yes, a responsible warrant officer to check my manifest and stow my cellar and some artisans to set up the furniture in my cabin. My servant Di will be present to show them where. Very well. Mr. Davis will see to the stowage of the cellar, and the carpenter will send his mates to set up your furniture. I regret I am detained at the moment by the necessity of presenting my plan of operation to my commanders. Merriweather turned to go below. Your plan of operation, said Wolfe, well, now, I should be present for that. The officers are in my cabin, Merriweather agreed, and you are welcome. The assemblage stood up as he entered, the first recognition of his new rank. At ease, gentlemen, he told them, and took his seat behind the desk. He had only had time to say a few platitudes when Wolf came in. Captain Wolf of the Royal Navy, gentlemen, he told them. May I present Captains Morrison and McRae of the Marine? Wolf bowed stiffly twice. And their officers. He managed the names of all but the third lieutenant in Tiger. And my officers, Lieutenants Larkin, McCamey and Dobbs, Dr. Buttram and Mr. Hamlin. The assemblage crowded even the spacious cabin in rapid. Wolf took the chair pushed forward by Sang as all took seats or stood pressed against the bulkheads. For the first time in his life, Merriweather felt a twinge of stage fright. He looked at the outline of his order for fully half a minute, then began in a nervous voice the introduction he had learned by rote. Gentlemen, our mission is to sweep clear the Bay of Bengal and its approaches of the enemy. As you know, the mouth of the bay is a thousand miles south of here and more than a thousand miles wide. It is obviously impossible for a single squadron to cover this vast area, and equally obvious that this is not necessary. We need not concern ourselves, for instance, with the Coromandel coast or the eastern shores of India. And why not, Commodore? Wolf sat staring at him with the half-smile on his lips. Knocked off stride, Merriweather stammered. Why... This season, the northeast monsoon makes it a lee shore. There are no harbours sheltered from the east, and the underwriters refuse to insure vessels calling at ports on that coast from October to April. So there is no shipping. Wolf stared at him a moment more, then said, Quite. I think it a valuable item of information for these officers. Pray proceed. Annoyance almost choked him as Merriweather wondered for a moment if he dared go back to Sir George and inform him that this officer was personally obnoxious and must be replaced. It would be a confession of weakness, he decided instantly. He tried to pick up the lost thread of his presentation. So, gentlemen, we do not attempt the impossible, but concentrate upon the probable, seeking our enemy in the customary shipping lanes for this season. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Wolf about to speak again, and hurried on, ignoring him. A ship approaching from the south, Mauritius, for example, has the choice of trying to beat almost into the eye of the wind at great expense of labour and materiel, or of running close hauled far enough east that she can then come about and sail back to her destination. He picked up the ruler from his desk and pointed to a cluster of islands on the chart in nearly fifteen degrees south latitude. Mr. Ross, who has plantations in the Cocos Islands, has reported that four French ships landed there and took on water and citrus fruit six weeks ago. They departed eastwardly, 
I suspect to go about and proceed northwestwardly along the coast of Sumatra, then across the shipping lanes into the Strait of Malacca. He paused and took a swallow of water from the glass on his desk. And why just at that point? asked Wolf suddenly. Merriweather got the mouthful down without strangling. Small end of the horn. Nearly all shipping is westbound this season from China and the Indies, he managed. Four smaller ships are reported overdue from Amboina and the Celebes. The China convoy came through under escort last month, and the Commodore reported two sightings just west of the Strait, a brig and a large schooner, but they did not attack. He had one Indian straggler of which we have no report. He looked Wolf in the eye. He had attempted to describe the situation and evaluate the meagre intelligence upon which he had based the operation in enough detail so that these officers would have a vivid mental picture of the entire affair. Even young Hamlin there might find himself called upon to act in an emergency without time for consultation with a higher authority. A Royal Navy sloop came through the strait three weeks ago and never sighted a sail, said Wolfe. The captain was offering ten pounds for any sighting that proved to be French, too. He smiled at Merriweather, then looked away at the chart on the bulkhead. Now, gentlemen, said Merriweather, after a pause to recover his equanimity, I propose this disposition. First, Captain Morrison in Tiger will take station a hundred miles southeast of the Sandheads and maintain a patrol across the shipping lanes to Calcutta. This is a most important assignment, as we know four ships have been captured in this area in the past year, he concluded in haste, seeing disappointment in Morrison's thin, intense face. It was unfortunate that his command was one of the slow, slab-sided, top-heavy brigs. Floating coffins, the marine called them, designed with a shallow draft and heavy armament to penetrate tidal estuaries and rivers. He must have an anchor point on which he could rely, he justified himself. And with Tiger's poor windward sailing qualities, her ten twenty-four pounder carronades were more valuable athwart the shipping lanes leading to Calcutta. Second, Comet and Rapid will follow the usual route south-eastward to the Strait, looking at Rangoon and the Gulf of Martaban, investigating the Bentinck Channel and offshore islands along the way, and then calling at Penang. If no contact is made and lacking intelligence at Penang, we shall sail westward through the Nicobar Islands towards Ceylon. If all this turns up nothing, we start over. Now, Morrison, do not spare your questions or comments. You'll have your turn too, McRae. He settled back, ready to defend or amend the plan. Morrison looked at the chart a moment and cleared his throat. Then Wolfe said, Why not just the reverse, Commodore? Run down to Ceylon and beat back to the Strait. That way you might very well intercept both the cruisers and their prizes. He sat back with an air of triumph. This was one question for which Merriweather was completely prepared. He had had the same thought, and laboriously analysed the alternatives during the past week before settling on his operational order. Captain, your suggestion has considerable merit, but I confess I considered it at length before making a decision. I decided against it for these reasons. First, I think a prize once clear of Sumatra with a fair wind would unhesitatingly turn south. It would be purely fortuitous if we happened to intercept. Second, we would waste the time sailing south through waters that are untravelled at this season, and then face a long beat to windward. Third, by following the shipping lane southeast, we show the flag, protect the shipping en route to Calcutta and have the chance of picking up intelligence. Fourth and most important, privateers will undoubtedly station themselves where they might intercept the maximum amount of traffic, and that is at the approaches to the strait and off the sandheads. Merriweather paused. And now your comments, Morrison. I'm in full agreement, except I'd like more active assignment, he said in his deep voice. 
Dan McRae. Oh, in the narrow sea, sir, that's where the prizes are, and these French should be close by. Then, unless there is objection from higher authority, this will be our initial order. He saw Sang peering through the door. Time to set up refreshments and call an end to the council. One more thing. Dr. Buttram will call upon you early in the forenoon watch tomorrow to examine crews and inspect ships for any symptoms of pestilence or infestation. Merriweather stood up, signalling the end of the meeting. He saw Wolf approach, face wreathed in smiles. Well, Commodore, did I overplay my part as devil's advocate? Devils? began Merriweather. Oh, I see. Perhaps, he thought, the man was instructed to play such a part, and certainly his questions had elicited amplification of the bases for the order that might indeed be valuable to the junior officers. His irritation melted, and he smiled back at Wolf. They certainly were searching questions, Captain, almost the same as those I asked myself in reaching the decision. And now, gentlemen, a toast. They were halfway through the buffet when Sang brought the note to him. Amid the jovial conversation, no one noticed, and Merriweather broke the seal and read the single line. See me in my quarters tonight at your earlier convenience. There was a stylistic cipher below that he recognized as the initial B. He slid the note into his breast pocket and addressed himself again to the ham. His conscience was reasonably clear, but he found himself gobbling his food and forced himself to eat deliberately, joining in the conversation until raisins, cheese and port had been served. He saw McCray and Morrison over the side, then called away the gig. There was little delay while the dockyard tonga was sent for. The courtesy titled Commodore worked wonders here too, Merriweather noted. In a few minutes he was ushered into the library where Sir George sat before a stack of documents. Evening, Merriweather, growled Sir George. I have not seen a copy of your operation order as yet. No, Your Excellency, it will be over in the morning. But I can never mind that was not the matter I wished to see you about. Sir George paused and looked a little self-conscious. Lady Barlow was concerned, and I must say I am curious. What happened last night to send Caroline home so early? I don't really know, Your Excellency, Merriweather began, trying to think of some way to avoid the blunt question. Lady Barlow gathered that something passed between Caroline and that captain, Wolf, that upset her. There could have. I admit I introduced Captain Wolf to her, said Merriweather, carefully. He took her off to dance, and I did not see them again until she rejoined me to go into supper. But what reason did she give you for leaving? Sir, Your Excellency, she said, thank you for an introduction to a cad, and then said something about people misunderstanding a young widow. And what did you understand from that? I concluded that Wolf had said something, made some remark to Lady Caroline that was distasteful to her. I tried to inquire further, but she said it was not my fault and dismissed me. Aha! said Barlow. I begin to understand. Wolf, I've heard, has some reputation in the fleet as a rake, though he's married to a daughter of one of the Admiralty Commissioners. Well, Lady Barlow and I want no scandal. A few remarks by a man in his cups, with no overt action, does not justify a call to the field of honour. Barlow sat staring into the middle distance for a moment. I confess, however, the man did not appeal to me. Do you want me to veto his appointment as observer in the Bengal squadron? The proposal caught Merriweather by surprise. He thought of yesterday's tactless question, the condescending air, the distress of Lady Caroline last night, the rude interrogation as to the bases of his operational order this afternoon, and then the sincere smile and half-apology for playing the part of devil's advocate. The man evidently had ability and understanding of naval affairs, 
and two, he could not condemn Wolfe for an alcoholically inspired proposition to a beautiful, unattached woman. He had transgressed in that direction himself. And one never knew whether such a proposal could be considered an insult or accepted as a compliment. The warm smile of this afternoon outweighed the other factors. Your Excellency, the man appears able. He gave an excellent critique of my plan this afternoon, and there would be delay and possibly hard feelings on the part of Admiral Pellew and others. Sir George, head down, considered for a moment, then looked up keenly at Merriweather. I think you would rather I do just that. But you have this damnable sense of fair play. Well, I'll take no action. I only hope you do not regret your decision. He shook his head. And now I'm sure you'll want to say farewell to Lady Barlow and Lady Caroline. There were more raisins, cheese, sweetmeats, port and conversation. It was midnight before he escaped, uncomfortably aware that some matter, he hoped it was not still the affair of the night before, was troubling Sir George. Chapter 3 The trip down the Hoogley was uneventful. Off the sandheads, as the pilots were dropped, Merriweather took the opportunity to shift his flag into Comet. He had no doubts of McRae's ability to command, but with a patchwork crew and strange officers, he wished to see for himself her state of readiness and sailing qualities. There followed two strenuous days and nights of general exercises, both internal and tactical. The ships sailed in formation, executing manoeuvres in obedience to the arbitrary signals. They rigged pumps and dragged hoses to the scenes of imaginary fires. They cleared for action, launched boats, rescued men overboard, towed and were towed, strung hammock nettings and repelled boarders. At noon the second day, Rapid put over a target raft and the ships came about in turn, firing their batteries until the canvas targets were shredded. Merriweather winced at the cost, but he was using up old powder and letting the new men hear the broadside speak. Comet came last in the line on the final passage, her starboard gun crews anxiously training and sighting the five eighteen-pounders, and the two long nine pivot guns that had been added to her battery at Calcutta. Fire! roared Dylan, McRae's first lieutenant, and flames spouted from the side. The ship heeled to port as smoke blotted out the target. From their perch in the lee shrouds, Merriweather and McRae saw a cloud of splinters fly up, and the entire target raft vanished. Well done! shouted Merriweather. I think you are ready, Captain. I think as much myself, said McRae with one of his infrequent smiles. Merriweather felt a sense of elation. He knew Rapid was ready, was sure Morrison and Tiger could be depended on, and now McRae had whipped Comet into an efficient ship. This mission would not fail. After declining a drink with McRae, Merriweather went back to Rapid in the first dog watch. As he came over the side, the shrill boatswain's pipe ceased its squealing, just as his pennant reached the peak. He saw that Larkin's usually impassive face was livid, his pale blue eyes blazing. What is it, Larkin? he asked. The tall American was silent for a moment, looked aft, and then said bluntly, That captain, he's drunk. He paused, looking hard at Merriweather, and continued, Been drunk, sir, ever since you left the ship. He hesitated a moment, then said in a quivering voice, And this morning he tried to assume command of the ship from me. What? Yes, sir. And he's challenged me to a duel. Considering his condition, I refuse the honor. Quite right. And now let us see this gentleman. He started aft. He's in your cabin, sir. More convenient for service from the pantry, he said. Well, I'm damned. Now signal the squadron to get under way. Line ahead. Rapid is guide. Course southeast, a half-east. 
shielded stern lanterns to be rigged on guide and second ship. Merriweather waited while Larkin passed the word to McCamey and Hamlin, and then wrote the order on the slate, as the flag hoist was too blocked. The setting sun illuminated the cabin through the stern windows, revealing the figure in full uniform sprawled across the brass bed on the rumpled coverlet. On his desk, a tray held a dark bottle, its neck red with the broken wax seal of a vintage sack, but the crystal wine glass was on the surface of the desk amid a whole congregation of white circles etched into the varnished finish. In the corner of the cabin, the small figure of Sang perched on the edge of a chair. His gorge rose at the sight, but he forced himself to be civil. Good evening, Captain. The figure moved, rolled into a sitting position, then unsteadily stood up, the vacant eyes focusing finally on him. May we assist you to your quarters? What? God damn your eyes, don't patronize me, you Bombay lubber! Wolf picked up the half full glass, drained it, and dropped it to shatter on the desk top. You are not yourself, Captain, said Merriweather, though the blood was pounding in his ears. We wish only to assist you in your disorder, and I'll have Dr. Buttram wait on you. Wait on me? mimicked Wolf. He stepped forward and slapped Merriweather's left cheek with his open hand. I'll wait on you on the field of honour, if a bastard such as you knows what that means. Merriweather's fist was clenched, and he half-stepped forward with the instinct of the lower deck and the boatswain's mate from which he had risen to strike down this man and his unforgivable insults. He managed to restrain himself. I excuse you. You're not responsible, he said thickly. Mr. Larkin, will you assist the captain to his quarters and then ask Dr. Buttram to wait on him? Wolf stood rocking on his feet. Not responsible, he said. You excuse me? He seemed almost to become sober, but Larkin did not hesitate. He snapped Wolf's arm up behind his back and propelled him through the door. Merriweather stood bemused as Sang, clucking in dismay, began to pick up the fragments of glass on the desk top. Was it too late to go back to the Sandheads and transfer this captain to the pilot lugger? Half an hour later, Buttram knocked and entered. Well, sir, I've given the captain something to make him sleep and enough purgatives to keep him busy the next two days. Larkin has put his padlock back on the cellar, and here's the key. Not much more I can do now. Thank you, Doctor. The elation of an hour ago had been replaced by depression. Was this an omen for the operation? After daylight the next morning, Tiger hoisted a signal. Request permission to carry out orders. Merriweather came on deck wrapped in his old boat cloak against the morning chill. By dead reckoning, the squadron was 135 miles southeast of the Sandheads, and in position to maintain a patrol across the trade routes. It was as good a point as any to part company with the brig. Affirmative and good luck, he told Hamlin, and be sure you get our position from Mr. Dobbs to enter in the log. The signal soared up, and he watched Tiger's hoist come down then saw her wear about and head southwest, already shortening sail, on the first leg of an interminable succession of courses, reaches and tacks. She must claw back, close-hauled, northwardly, then go about southeastwardly to close the triangle and hold her position here. Merriweather commiserated with Morrison, but there was as much chance for action here as in any other area of the Bay of Bengal. Merriweather came back to the cabin to eat the poached egg on toast with ham on the side that Sang served him, and drink a second cup of tea. Only three days out of port there was still fresh food. The events of last night seemed unreal as a dream as he settled into the routine at sea. Even the white rings etched by wine into the surface of his desk had vanished, the lemon odour of polish still in the air. 
he permitted himself only a brief thought of Wolf. Pray God with no wine there would be no repetition. Two days later, Midshipman Kinney appeared in his cabin. Sir, Captain Wolf requests permission to call upon you. The dark young man appeared sheepishly nervous. Why, certainly, Merriweather told him, surprised, at the captain's convenience. A half hour later, Wolf entered the cabin in full-dress uniform, cocked hat under his left arm, but not wearing his sword. He was pale, and there was a noticeable tremor in his hands. Yes, Captain? Sir, I hardly know how to commence, said Wolf in a high, strained voice. I can only say I am miserably ashamed of myself, and I beg your pardon for my inexcusable conduct. It will not happen again, sir. Wolf remained stiffly at attention before the desk. Merriweather felt a wave of compassion wash over him. It required moral courage for this officer to abase himself and make the apology. His conduct had bordered on mutiny, and certainly had been unbecoming an officer and gentleman. But Merriweather could testify from personal experience as to the insidious effects of wine. Very well, Captain. I accept your apology, and the matter is closed. The two ships made a weary beat to windward through Preparous North Channel toward the shallow Gulf of Martaban, sailing at the limits of visual signal range even with the oversized flags Merriweather had had the sailmaker run up so as to cover the maximum area. They spoke to two country ships, but their masters could furnish no intelligence. Finally, they came to anchor in eight fathoms off the mouth of the Rangoon River and Larkin took the cutter into the pilot station, with Sang as an interpreter. Four hours later, he was back with nothing to report. The master pilot says nine small vessels have called in the past fortnight, but none have seen a thing. Looks as though the frogs may have gone back south, sir. Hard to believe, grumbled Merriweather unless they caught that straggly India man under content with a four-way split in prize money. He contained his disappointment and signalled the squadron underway. Could Wolf have been right? Should he have followed the reverse of his course in the initial sweep? He could not be sure, but all logic had pointed to the eastern sector of the Bay of Bengal as the better hunting ground. So far, the mission was a failure. The squadron headed a point east of south, looking in at the myriad islands of the Mergui archipelago along the west coast of the Malay Peninsula, sending boat crews into land and reconnoitre the bays and sounds to the east, but with no real expectation of finding the French hiding among them. In three weeks, they spoke to a Norwegian bark, an American brig, and half a dozen Indian or Burmese dows none of whom had any information. Finally, in the approach to the Strait of Malacca, it came home to Merriweather that even these narrow waters, the small end of the funnel, as he had so glibly termed them on the chart, encompassed thousands of square miles of empty ocean. Well, Captain, it has been a waterhole thus far, he told Wolf at dinner that night. It was the second time he had invited the captain to dine with him since the apology, and he had found him pleasant and entertaining each time. Tonight Midshipman Hamlin and Kinney were also guests, each yet a little wary of the other, and not anxious to be noticed by their seniors. Quite, replied Wolf, a needle in a haystack. He smiled and continued, There is a great deal of chance in everything at sea. A mile east or west, and you might sail right by the plate fleet, let alone a pair of fast schooners. What are your plans now? Merriweather hesitated a moment. He had made the decision two days ago in a brief conference with McRae, hove to off Similan Island, and there was no reason to conceal it from anyone on board, though he was uncomfortably aware that Wolfe was keeping a private log. We are now at seven degrees five minutes north, ninety-seven degrees ten minutes east. 
I think we may as well call at Georgetown on Penang and see what news the governor has there. Quite. And now, Captain, if you'll excuse us, I have a splitting headache. The men withdrew, and Merriweather went on deck to give Larkin the new course and signal it to McRae. Rapid sighted lights on Penang just after midnight two days later but lay off until dawn to make the approach to the anchorage between the island and mainland in daylight. They picked up the pilot, a retired master's mate from the Royal Navy, who spoke in thick Devonshire as he looked aloft at the broad pennant. Only four ships present, he said pleasantly. American, Norwegian and Swedish. And His Majesty's sloop Argus, but she's out of commission. There'll be no salutes for your flag, Commodore. Just as well, save powder, responded Merriweather, thinking sourly that unless he had more success in the future, it was unlikely that his flag would ever receive a salute. They managed to work into the anchorage, catching a favourable slant of wind and heading for the company dock. Half a mile south, off what must be the dockyard, he saw a sloop at anchor barges carrying sheer legs moored to either side. She carried a mizzenmast, but no fore or mainmast. That's Argus, twenty-two, Captain Richard Ackroyd, Royal Navy Commodore, volunteered the pilot. She was caught in a typhoon last October east of Bintan, lost her foremast and sprung her mainmast. Not a stick of timber fit to make a spar in this place. The Navy had to send a Rangoon to find enough pine, and they're just now ready to step the new mast with those sheer legs. Merriweather remembered his own ordeal with the typhoon last fall in the China Sea, and though he had lost his mizzen royal mast, the others had survived. With such scarcity of suitable timber down here, he hoped he would not require replacements. Comet and Rapid came to anchor off the company dock at four bells in the forenoon watch, and half an hour later he was at Government House inquiring for Governor Dundas. Not here, said the clerk at the desk in the outer office. And who might you be? Merriweather commanding the Bengal Squadron of the Marine, he replied. Then I'll speak with the First Secretary, please. Mr. Pearson is sick. The Assistant Secretary, Mr. Thomas Stamford Raffles, is acting. The clerk sniffed and said, Two ships would not seem to be much of a squadron. The balance of my command is cruising elsewhere, said Merriweather, a little stung by the cheeky attitude of this clerk. Announce me, please, to your Mr. Raffles. Your name? demanded the clerk, and departed toward the inner office. In a moment he was back. Come in, sir. Merriweather entered a largely dimly lighted office to find a young man behind a long table covered with papers. He was younger than Merriweather by several years, it appeared. As the man stood up, an ornate gold watch chain hung with seals stretched across his unbuttoned waistcoat made a musical jingle. Tom Raffles, Commodore, he said, extending his hand. I seem to be holding the fort alone today. Have a chair. We had word of your appointment to the Bengal Squadron, but did not expect to see you here so soon. The man was handsome, dark hair over wide-set grey eyes, and had an easy smile. He wore an elaborately ruffled shirt under the waistcoat, with a neck piece of scarlet tied about the high collar. In spite of the foppish attire, Merriweather found himself liking the young man immediately. He exuded an aura of wisdom beyond his years, coupled with the energy to act upon a decision. He sat down and came to the point. Sir, we have made a sweep from the sandhead southeast along the shipping lanes this past month, but have neither seen nor heard anything of the four privateers we have reason to believe are operating in the area. Would you have any later information? Raffles looked at him directly over interlaced fingers delicately supporting his chin. Oh, Commodore, I received the information forwarded by Mr. Ross in the Cocos Islands last month, but no ship calling here has reported any further sightings. We had a single India man pass two weeks ago, 
already reported as a straggler from the China convoy. But she did not stop here. Of course, nearly all shipping has been westbound at this season of the year, and the French would be stationed west of the strait to intercept. Of course, but I hope some of your local trade might have heard something. Even a rumour would be helpful. No, commenced Raffles, then paused. Only thing, Commodore, not over an hour ago a native farmer from something over fifty miles northwest of here brought in a load of chickens and told the pork captain he had seen a column of smoke rising from one of the offshore islands that is not regularly inhabited, but he wondered who might be on it. Can you get this farmer back? Probably. Raffles rang a bell on the desk and the clerk came in. Menzies, see if you can get the port captain to bring in that Malay who made the report this morning about smoke from the island. Yes, sir, said the man, and started sulkily out. Afternoon will be time enough, Raffles called after him, and explained, I'm due at home for lunch in a quarter hour, and you shall be my guest. With the sense of failure hanging over him, Merriweather was anxious for intelligence, even this scrap about a column of smoke from an uninhabited island. He would have gone to the port captain himself in the interests of time. He opened his mouth. No protest, Commodore, interposed Raffles. You were losing no time, and I wish you to meet my darling wife. Shall we go? He rose, took a handsome coat and hat from a rack beside the door, and put them on, then buttoned his waistcoat. Have to keep up appearances, even in the tropics, Commodore. He led the way out into the blinding sunlight where a barouche waited. It was only a short ride to the house of Mr. Raffles, set on a hill west of Georgetown among bright flowers and blooming shrubs. But Merriweather was glad to reach this cool refuge from the noonday heat. A servant took his hat, and he followed Raffles into a sitting room where a punker swung rhythmically from the ceiling and kept the air in motion. A woman sat in a wicker chair, a sewing basket beside her, and a partly embroidered square of cloth hanging on the chair arm. She stood up and Raffles kissed her unselfconsciously. Livy, this is Commodore Merriweather of the Bombay Marine. My wife Olivia, Commodore. Merriweather bowed and straightened up to meet her direct gaze. I am delighted Tom brought you, Commodore. It is very dull here most of the time. She spoke in a husky, caressing voice, somewhat at variance with her slender figure. Her hair and eyes were dark, and her mobile features indicated a woman of spirit. But, Merriweather saw with some surprise, she must have been nearly ten years older than Raffles. I hope I am not intruding, ma'am. Not at all. This is such a dull place, she said again, and cut her expressive eyes toward Raffles and back to Merriweather. Pays well, though, dear, and the chances for promotion are excellent, said Raffles with his easy smile. Oh, and how is poor Mr. Pearson this morning? No better, I'm afraid. A drink and a bit of lunch, Commodore. A Malay girl brought a tray of squat glasses filled with a cool, brownish liquid that gave off a slight aroma of rum. A straight cooler, Commodore, explained Mrs. Raffles. Cold tea, lime and coconut juice, a dash of bitters, and just a touch of rum for your constitution. Tom invented it. The concoction was tart and delicious, and they soon went in to lunch. This was an intelligent and attractive couple, Merriweather decided, taking his seat. The luncheon was enlivened by a continuous flow of conversation between Raffles and his wife. Apparently she was fully informed as to every detail of the government of this small new presidency, and her comments were shrewd. He found his mission soon discussed and disposed of as Raffles began to talk of the future of the company's trade out here. This location has not been very successful thus far, explained Raffles. I've been here nearly two years, but the trade has not increased. It is not a convenient port of call. The anchorage is exposed at either end. The strait here is much too wide to be controlled by anything less than a squadron. 
and all we have is one disabled sloop at present. And the climate is most enervating, broke in Mrs. Raffles. True, but this is in the tropics, my dear. Calcutta is not much better. At least there is more social activity. The Governor-General and Council, she said sharply. Raffles smiled, and she smiled back at him. We have enough for my taste here, he said. Merriweather felt comfortably relaxed, enjoying the interchange between this pair, but he was ready to leave. You've been on east through the strait, Commodore? Yes, most recently last fall. Did you ever stop at a tiny native village, Singapore, on the mainland, almost at the eastern end of the strait? Why, no, I don't think I even knew there was one. I went down there last fall, took a passage on a country ship and looked over the whole area. The company and Crown both need a better post than this to command the strait. That place has the finest harbour I've seen out here, and the channel there is narrow enough to control with a single ship. I'm surprised the Dutch or Portuguese or French haven't already colonised it. No siesta today, my dear. The Commodore is anxious to learn why an island is smoking. Raffles rose, kissed her, and led the way out after Merriweather had expressed his thanks to this vibrant woman for the luncheon. Back at Government House, they found the clerk's desk vacant, but a small Malay was sitting on the bench at the door, and a paunchy officer in the uniform of a sailing master in the Marine his empty right sleeve pinned to the jacket was waiting. Commodore Merriweather, may I present Mr. Johnson, our port captain? Johnson touched his hat with his left hand. Come. Raffles stood aside as Johnson, the Malay, and Merriweather preceded him into the chamber. I speak the language, said Raffles in an aside, as he hung his coat and hat on the rack, then unbuttoned the waistcoat and took his seat. The Malay remained standing before the desk, head down and hands clasped together before him. A sheathed crease was thrust into a substantial leather belt about his waist. He looked, Merriweather thought suddenly, for all the world like one of the Achenes pirates he had captured last year off the Andaman Islands. Raffles wasted no time speaking at once. The man straightened up, unclasped his hands, replied, listened, then spoke several rapid sentences with gestures. Raffles turned to Merriweather. This man lives a hundred miles north of here on the mainland. He and his party paddled down here to Georgetown to trade chickens for iron. As near as I can understand, they passed this group of islands about here. Raffles rose and stepped over to the chart on the wall, pointing to a cluster of dots. They are uninhabited, he says. No fresh water except at this time of the year. There was a column of smoke rising up, and he thought there might be a crew of Achenes pirates around, so they kept on. He came back to his chair. He saw nothing, no ships, press Merriweather. Raffles spoke again to the Malay. No, he says. They were afraid and paddled as hard as they could. Not much help, I'm afraid, but on your way back you might take a look. He paused. Thank you, Johnson, he said, and then added something unintelligible to the Malay. Thank you, Johnson, echoed Merriweather. I'm happy you saw fit to report what this man told you. In his own mind, he had written this matter off, as he already had the entire voyage to Penang. It was not out of his way to look in on the islands on his way northwestward, however, and it had been a pleasant interlude to meet young Raffles and his charming wife. He turned back to face Raffles across the table. I'm most obliged to you, sir, and thank you again for the luncheon. You are welcome, Commodore, and please would you say nothing of my mention of Singapore today? Merriweather was about to go out when Menzies, the sullen clerk, came in. Captain Ackroyd again, sir, he told Raffles. Oh, Merriweather, wait a moment. You should meet your opposite number in the Royal Navy here. In a moment, an officer entered, saying in a high, carrying voice, Damn these dockyard jacklegs, Raffles! Now MacDonald says he has to refit the base of the mainmast. 
Some damn fool measured the step an inch too much. Raffles smiled at him. Well, Captain, he said, it is far better than if they had measured an inch too little. You can always take off a bit, but it is hard to add to a piece of timber. He turned to Merriweather. May I present Captain Richard Ackroyd, Commodore Merriweather of the Honourable Company's Bombay Marine commanding the Bengal Squadron. The two officers bowed and murmured. Ackroyd almost instantly returned to the attack. Now, Raffles, will you tell that confounded churl MacDonald to keep his men at work? No more four-hour siestas until those masts are fitted and set up. They marched off again as soon as the noon gun fired today and those sheer-leg barges are rubbing my sides bare. Ackroyd was a small, wiry man with black curly hair, glittering slate-gray eyes, sharp nose, and a cruel, protruding mouth. He interrupted Raffles' attempted explanation, saying with a mirthless smile, You hear the platitudes these politicians mouth, Commodore? Another two weeks at best before I am in commission again and you'll have snapped up all the prize money by then. Well, Captain, if I'm as successful the next two weeks as I have been for the past month, you've lost nothing. What? A water haul so far? Ackroyd smiled again. That makes me feel better. Lord knows I need the money, and I've been four months here at the mercy of these John Company idlers. The man grated on Merriweather and he made his excuses, leaving Raffles to continue his discussion with Ackroyd. He was halfway out to Rapid in the gig, when he realised that the pall of depression that had enveloped him since that awful afternoon last month had lifted. Perhaps it had been that delightful Raffles pair, or the mood, like a low fever, had simply worn itself out. In any event, the sense of frustration was gone, and he was sanguine again. He ordered the coxswain to steer for Comet, and went aboard to acquaint Macrae with the situation. He had learned next to nothing here at Penang, but he was in good spirits, as he gave the orders to get under way. Chapter 4 It was less than an hour to dawn when the lookout hailed the deck. Where away? roared Dobbs. Rod on the starboard beam, sir. Looks like a fire. Merriweather was in his canvas chair against the weather rail, unable to sleep while the squadron sailed these narrow seas. He could see nothing from the deck and did not expect he could see anything more of value from the main top. There had to be a fire to make the smoke the Malay had reported, and he was happy the particular atoll was now identified. Signal Comet to heave to, he told Dobbs, and get a bearing on that fire. The ships had only the simplest system of night signals. Three flashes of the dark lantern, three times repeated, and Comet's profile astern altered in the night glass. Satisfied that the consort had understood and obeyed, Dobbs brought Rapid into the wind and she lay too, rolling in the long swell canvas slatting, yards creaking and blocks squealing as lines slackened and tightened. With the steady pressure of the northeast breeze, both ships were drifting to leeward, but Merriweather did not intend to approach the islands any closer until after daylight. Mr. Dobbs, would you be kind enough to send for Gunny? The marine detachments in both ships had participated in the general drills last month, but here was a heaven-sent opportunity for a realistic amphibious exercise under the command of the Jemadar, the senior non-commissioned Sepoy Marine officer present. Yes, sir! The erect figure was now visible against the increasing light to the east. We have a report of a fire on that island, Gunny. I wish to embark the landing force together with that of Comet, and make a reconnaissance. I don't expect we'll find more than a pair of frightened fishermen, but it should be a useful exercise. Aye, aye, sir. Full kit, sir? Forty pounds of equipment in addition to the musket should make the exercise realistic enough, Merriweather decided. We may have time to fire a few rounds at targets, too. It was almost light enough for Comet to read a flag hoist now. He wrote out the message, 
and handed it to Dobbs. And pass the word to the gunner to mount that four-pounder boat gun in the launch, with both round shot and canister. It was also an opportunity to try a new piece of equipment, acquired last month at Bombay Castle. He saw Hamlin, junior officer of the watch, coming aft. You are boat officer in the launch, Hamlin. High time the boy had a taste of responsibility. The cheerful mood that had come over him yesterday afternoon persisted as Merriweather went below to eat the breakfast laid out by Sang, and then pull on the oiled landing force boots. His sword and the pair of double-barreled pistols he had taken from Abercrombie last year were laid out on the bed, but he decided not to encumber himself with them. Another thought occurred to him. It was only common courtesy to invite Wolf and Kinney to go along for the exercise and he stepped around to Wolf's room to proffer the invitation. By six bells in the morning watch, the ships had beaten into an anchorage two miles off the atoll in eight fathoms, and both had their launches in the water. Through the glass, Merriweather could see a sand spit toward the south end of the island, and the faintest intimation of smoke still rising behind the trees near the centre of the island. It was less than three-quarters of a mile in length, he estimated. A number of coconut palms rose in the centre, which indicated there would not be too much undergrowth to impede a party making its way across the island. There was a narrow beach opposite the palm grove and no coral visible offshore. The marines embarked in their orderly fashion. Totten, the gunner's mate, and his three seamen strikers already clustered about the gun in the bow, with shot rack and copper boat magazine beside them. Wolf appeared on the deck coatless, sword belted on, and a blue kerchief knotted about his head in lieu of a hat. Kinney was at his side, Dirk at his hip. They went into the boat and Merriweather timed the rise of the launch, then dropped from the ladder into the stern. Shove off, Hamlin told the coxswain. Give way. The boat pulled away from the ship and converged on the launch carrying Comet's landing force. Merriweather picked up his speaking trumpet. Dylan, land on the south spit and send your party north. This party will cross the centre to meet you. This might be no more than a drill, but the men were high-spirited and in dead earnest as the two boats pulled away on diverging courses. Half an hour later, Merriweather's boat approached a moderate surf. The beach was littered with broken lumps of coral. Drop your stern anchor, he told Hamlin. Pull on in, but make sure your stern hook keeps that line taut. Though the surf was nominal on this leeward side of the island, the stern anchor would keep the launch bow on, her gun covering the landing force and prevent her broaching in a much heavier sea. This bit of knowledge, like the rest of the exercise, would be valuable to a young officer. It was only a moment before the keel scraped and the bow hook went over the side hauling the painter over his shoulder to the beach. The marines disembarked in knee-deep water, reached the narrow strand and formed up. Scouts slanted off right and left and the senior private soldier in each eight-man squad took his position at the point, musket held at port arms. Merriweather came ashore his boots sloshing full of water, followed closely by Wolf and Kinney. He paused to bend each leg up behind him and empty the boots, seeing the erect figure of Gunny beside his bugler disappearing into the trees between the right and centre squad, the Naik his second in command between the centre and left. The first shot was clearly from a musket, as was the next ten seconds later. They were followed by the sharper report of a pistol. The sounds came from a quarter mile away across the island, not from the marine detachment, still visible less than a hundred yards from the beach. Merriweather balanced on one leg as the last of the water drained from his boot. Something was going on here. Hamlin, take the launch around the north point and down the east side, he shouted out to the boat. Totten, load your gun with solid shot. Canister on top and look lively. The bow hook was already trotting into the water, coiling the painter as he went, 
and the seaman in the stern was hauling in on the anchor cable as the crew backed oars. Merriweather turned to follow the marines through the grove, and saw Wolf already far ahead of him to the right, Kinney trailing after him. He noticed that Wolf appeared to limp as he hurried along, and started to shout for him to wait, then decided no use, and followed after the troops. He came up with Gunny just as he could see sunlight glinting on the water through the tree trunks. Wolf had disappeared from sight somewhere to the right. Another two hundred yards, and they could see the beach bordering a small cove, no more than an indentation in the shore of the island. The point men halted, muskets held crosswise overhead to check the squads as the scouts reconnoitred. Merriweather and Gunny came forward and saw what looked like an enormous rabbit hutch built of driftwood on the beach about the exposed ribs of a wrecked dhow. Sand had been heaped against the barrier and piled to form a sort of platform at either side on which fires still smouldered. The crude redoubt was occupied, he realised, as he saw a flash of movement and the barrel of a musket protruding. Two hundred yards up the beach, the Malay version of a boogaloo was moored, stern just outside the breakers, and opposite it was a group of ten or twelve natives lounging in shallow pits dug in the sand behind driftwood thrust into the sand to form a kind of fence. Sir, said Gunny in a low voice, I think there are Europeans in that fort. He looked left and right to his nikes and made a signal. The men almost instantly went through the loading drill, each man extracting a cartridge from the box, biting off the bullet, pouring powder down the barrel, and ramming home ball and wad, then priming the lock. I shall send two squads to the left and— There was a flash of white shirt to the right through the trees, just opposite a patch of undergrowth fifty yards south of the fort. Wolf came leaping across the dozen yards that separated the scrub from the grove, sword in hand. Four Malays brandishing creases exploded from the patch, and Wolf caught one driving his sword clean through the Malay's back. The others started to run southwardly, and Wolf pursued them down the beach. Then a second Malay turned, suddenly swinging his crease. Wolf parried the stroke without effort, and his riposte drove the blade through the man's body. Gunny uttered a harsh expletive, and Merriweather said, Damnation! The men in the pits raced for the boogaloo through the surf as the marines went forward at the double. They were out of effective musket range, and the entire operation had been blown sky-high by Wolf's impetuous action. At the edge of the grove, the squads halted, took aim, and fired a volley. There was no apparent effect. The Malays had scrambled into the small vessel and had sweeps going as their stone anchor came in. They were going to get clean away. Merriweather stood with Gunny on the beach, watching the Boogaloo pull off, its sail now going up in jerks as it headed north. Even a party of a dozen Malay pirates was better than a waterhall, he thought sourly, turning to go toward the driftwood stronghold. Wait! Gunny shaded his eyes, then pointed north. The launch! Coming into view around the end of the island was the boat, her oars rhythmically rising and falling like the wings of a monstrous bird. The launch ought to course to intercept the boogaloo, and Merriweather could see Totten and his crew standing beside the gun in the bow. The boogaloo swung to starboard in an instinctive effort to escape. Then her helmsman realized the launch was the swifter of the two, and changed course to port to ram and destroy the smaller vessel. Hold her bow on! Merriweather shouted uselessly. He could see Hamlin standing in the stern beside the coxswain, his gaze intent upon the approaching boogaloo. Fire! Oh, fire! prayed Merriweather aloud. The launch, fifty years from the bow of a vessel three times her size, suddenly sheered to starboard and was off the port bow of the clumsier native boat before it could turn. Totten and his strikers slewed the gun about, stood aside, and fired, the sullen report sounding muffled here on the beach. 
a canister of 80 musket balls on top of a round shot, even though fired from a four-pounder boat gun, was deadly at that range. The charge swept diagonally across the deck from foremast to tiller, striking down almost half the Malays manning sweeps in the waist and killing the steersman. The launch came rowing around in a circle astern, Totten ramming home another charge, then fired again across the stern quarter forward. The sweeps had ceased to move, and the boogaloo, no hand at her tiller, came into the wind, rolling in the swell. Hamlin brought the launch along the starboard side and pointed the gun into the vessel. The midshipman swung over the side, dirk in one hand, pistol in the other, followed by bow hook and stern hook. In a few minutes, the launch had the boogaloo in tow. Hamlin at her tiller brought her back to be anchored again just outside the breakers. Merriweather turned to find Dillon, first lieutenant in Comet, panting at his side. Didn't know there was such a hurry, Commodore, he gasped. His party of marines was drawn up on the beach south of the rabbit hutch, holding two Malay prisoners. Nor I, Merriweather told him. Now, can you put two squads of marines in that boogaloo and bring her around to the squadron? Midshipman Hamlin is prizemaster. Merriweather headed for the driftwood fort, passing by the embers of the fire. Inside the curious structure were a number of European men and one woman. Captain Wolfe was already there, his sword in hand and still bloody on the blade. Somehow he had managed to get a picturesque smear of blood on his cheek and another across the breast of his white shirt. Who's in command here? demanded Merriweather. A stocky middle-aged man with grey side-whiskers, wearing the buff breeches of the maritime service and a soiled white shirt, stepped forward, still holding a pistol. I am Captain James Forehand, lately commander of the Indiaman, Duchy of Lancaster, captured two weeks ago by the French, and marooned here since. Two weeks? You must have been captured almost in sight of Penang. Right off there confirmed the captain, pointing west across the island. About five miles. We had a crew of Laskers. Only my four mates and these warrant officers were Europeans. The Laskers ran below, and we could not get a gun laid or fired. He shook his head. That was the trouble with the Lasker crews, Merriweather thought. Fairly competent as seamen, but they would not fight, at least not for the company. Their employment in Indiamen was discouraged, but low wages and the cheap rations they subsisted on were an inducement to many owners. What type of ship took you? inquired Merriweather. A brig. Ten guns, I counted. The French put a prize crew aboard, but the Laskers agreed to go on and work the ship. So long as they get their rations, they don't care who commands the ship. Who is the woman? And how many have you here? asked Merriweather, looking about. Sixteen, including the surgeon and my wife, of course. The woman was leaning against the parapet a dozen feet away, a half-grown black kitten cuddled against her bosom. She was dimpling and smiling at Captain Wolfe as he leaned on his blood-stained sword, its point negligently thrust into the sand, speaking to her in a low voice that did not carry. She was young, no more than eighteen or twenty, with a heart-shaped, empty, pretty face. Merriweather thought for a moment that Wolf was cradle-robbing, but no more so than this grizzled captain who had married the child. Oh, well, none of his business, he decided, and turned back to forehand. And how long have those Malays been here? Two days, a little more. They came at dawn, day before yesterday, I think. We had only the two muskets the French left us, a horn of powder and a bag of small shot for hunting. I had a brace of pistols in my chest. We winged two or three of them the first morning, and then they just sat down and waited for us to run out of water. Almost did at that. The captain pushed a water breaker with his foot, and it rolled easily with only a gurgle. We kept fires going at each side of our shelter at night to prevent surprise, but I'm sure they'd made up their minds to rush us this morning. Just before you appeared, four of them ran into those bushes over there where your man found them. 
I think they had only a pair or so of muskets themselves, though they all carried creases. Are you ready to move aboard? Merriweather asked. And how much baggage do you have? That French commander was a real gentleman. He let us take our chests and my wife's trunks. He pointed to the chests stacked along the side of the fort forming part of the rude barricade. And how does it happen your wife is along on a China cruise, Captain? Merriweather was genuinely curious. It was not unheard of by any means for a captain to bring his wife on a voyage, but it was seldom done in these last few years of war all around the world. Why, Lucy was a passenger coming out to live with her brother at Madras. Both parents dead. I had lost my wife last year, so we decided to marry at Joanna. Very well. I'll give you a working party to help load your gear. Merriweather went on to other duties, seeing in passing Wolf bowing over Lucy's hand, kissing it in the French fashion, then vaulting easily over the barrier to saunter, still with that slight limp, down to the boat. Two hours later, the squadron was underway back toward Penang, the Boogaloo under tow by Rapid. To the mortification of Prize Master Hamlin, he could not make the cranky vessel with its fibre sails hold a course that would conform with that of the squadron. However, the boy had reacted today with courage and judgment when confronted with a sudden emergency, and Merriweather took pleasure in mentioning his services, together with those of Totten, in the report he wrote during the first dog watch. To Wolf's exploit, he devoted a single line. He had just signed and sealed the report with the intention of leaving it with Raffles tomorrow morning for forwarding, when Buttram knocked and entered. Behind him, Merriweather saw another figure. Captain, this is Dr. Keese, surgeon in the company's service and lately serving in the Duchy of Lancaster. Keyes was a man past middle age with blonde hair faded grey and a lined, good-humoured face. Merriweather remembered vaguely seeing him in the hutch on the beach this morning, but now he wore a coat and held his hat correctly under his arm, bowing at the introduction. Be seated, gentlemen, invited Merriweather with a smile. I've just finished mentioning Dr. Buttram in my report for the excellent manner in which he removed that Malay's mangled arm today. In all truth, the doctor had spent a full afternoon treating the men in the Boogaloo who had suffered wounds from the launch's boat gun. If you have your report ready, doctor, I'll append it to mine. Yes, sir, ready a little later, said Buttram easily. But Dr. Keyes here gave me a hand this afternoon and he has some information I think will interest you. Merriweather looked inquiringly at Keyes, who looked back with keen blue eyes. Yes, Captain, but I heard you called Commodore today, too. Only a courtesy title, Merriweather told him. The doctor here refuses to promote me, and I do not mind. Go ahead. The surgeon smiled briefly, then said bluntly, Sir, I have reason to believe the Duchy of Lancaster may be a pest ship by now, and a drifter anchored not too far away. Pest ship? Yes, sir. Typhoid, or it might be typhus or even contagious brain fever. The early symptoms are much the same. I had diagnosed three cases among the Laskers the morning we were captured. The surgeon sat back, then continued. Captain Forehand is not an easy man to advise. Keep him forward, he says, and in an hour we were taken. I'd guess nearly the whole damn crew could be down by now, considering the water we took on at the Anambus Islands last month. Water? Merriweather knew that impure water was often blamed for sickness, and the closer to civilization the source from which it was drawn the more often it seemed to spawn a fatal disease, however clear and sparkling it came from the stream. Yes, sir, said Keyes. We were knocked about by a typhoon in the South China Sea, and the next thing we knew the bosun reported he was pumping fresh water from the bilges. Of course, the casks were stove, and we took on fresh water from that island. It was clear and running, but I could see the smoke of a village upstream. 
Captain said he had watered there before, and it was all right. Fortunately, the casks serving our mess aft were sound, and none of the new water was used. How serious is this? The fact is, Keyes went on, some of those Laskers have been drinking worse water than that all their lives. Some few of them will take sick, like the ones I saw. But it's not them I'm worried about, it's the French prize crew. Water that will make Alaskas sick will kill a white man, and Alaskas know nothing of navigation. That is why I think the ship may be adrift, or anchored by now not too far away. It was circumstantial enough, Merriweather thought. Another matter to keep in mind which, however, did not solve his problem of where to find the French cruisers. Your party is clean, I trust? Well, thank you, Doctor. I shall bear the matter in mind, and after we clear Penang tomorrow, we'll keep a sharp lookout for the ship. Merriweather went on deck to write his night orders to be signalled to Comet before dark. It had been a long day. With some mild exertion, and Merriweather lay down across the bed. It seemed only a moment before the messenger knocked. He rose, slid into his shoes, decided he did not need the boat cloak, and started on deck. Larkin had reluctantly surrendered his room to Captain Forehand and his wife, but it was only for tonight Merriweather justified himself. The night lantern was burning dimly in the passage as he made his way to the companionway and started up the ladder. He had reached the deck and paused for a moment for his eyes to adjust to the darkness when there was a crash below, followed by a succession of piercing screams. He swung down the ladder and beheld Lucy, her shift clutched well above her knees running along the passage toward him, emitting a shriek at every step. Close behind her was Forehand, in drawers and shirt, bellowing, his face contorted with rage. The girl reached Merriweather and agilely dodged behind him to reach the ladder. Here now, Captain, sheer off, Merriweather cried, pushing Forehand away. What's going on here? He fended off two more clumsy rushes as the girl perched on the ladder, ready to climb on deck, or jump and run again. Forehand came to a standstill, then mopped sweat from his brow and dabbed with his sleeve at his eyes. Merriweather saw that the man was weeping. Down the passage, he caught a flicker of movement and the door of Wolf's cabin closed with a click. You promised, Forehand suddenly shouted, after I forgave you for that supercargo at Macau. Pooh, said the girl. It was nothing. You don't pleasure me. All you want is to get me with child. You have no thought how I feel. Ya whore! Forehand moved forward again. Merriweather pushed him back. Now, I don't understand all this, Merriweather commenced, but I must be on deck. I understand only too well. Forehand started to the supercargo's cabin and kicked at the door. It opened almost instantly, and there stood Wolf in a blue silk dressing gown. You swine, shouted Forehand, and swung his fist at the taller man. Wolf blocked the blow easily and shoved the man away. My seconds will wait on you in the morning, he told Forehand. You are a witness, Commodore. I am the injured party. Injured party, screamed Forehand, after I find my wife naked in your cabin. Enough. The entire tawdry scene caused Merriweather's stomach to revolt. Young lady, you will go into your quarters and bolt the door. You, sir, he told Forehand, get your clothing and wait in my cabin. As for you, Wolf, remain in your room. I shall post a guard in the passage to see that these orders are carried out. Now, move. Merriweather, this is an affair of honour. Not in my ship, sir. Merriweather reached behind Wolf and took the handle of the door as the man, face flushed with rage, stepped back, and the door closed on him. Forehand stood a moment, then hurried into Larkin's cabin. The girl came down from her perch on the ladder, pulled at her shift and smoothed it over her hips, preening herself with a downcast smile, then clasped her bare hands about her breasts. Merriweather looked at her a moment, 
there was no mistaking the invitation. She was willing to play the harlot for him this night as well as for Wolf, and the thought disgusted him. Now get in that cabin, Mrs. Forehand, as soon as your husband is out, and bolt the door. As though summoned, Forehand came out, buckling his belt. His tears had dried, and he stared straight ahead with a strained expression. They watched Forehand out of sight, and Lucy stepped into the room. I'll be waiting, she whispered, then closed the door. Merriweather felt a flush of heat in his face in spite of his revulsion. She was certainly a whore, he thought, but damned pretty with it. Merriweather climbed the ladder. On deck, he verified the squadron's position, ordered the signal given Comet to heave to until daylight, and remained to see the manoeuvre accomplished. Only then did he think of posting his watchman below. He hesitated, doubting the necessity now almost an hour after the affair, then decided not to and went below. Forehand was not in the cabin, nor was he in the officer's head or the pantry where Sang slept on his pallet. Hell's bells! Had the man gone on deck? Yet Merriweather was sure he would have seen him, and there was no access to officers' country aft below decks from the forward compartments in this ex-slave ship. The only explanation must be that Forehand had rejoined his wife and somehow made peace with the wench. He hesitated a moment more, not wanting to rekindle the affair of an hour ago, then reluctantly decided he must make sure Forehand was back with his wife. Out in the passage, he knocked on the door. No response. He knocked again and tried the handle. It was locked or bolted or both. These were solidly constructed rooms, not the flimsy partitions and curtains put up in a man of war or Indiaman to form cabins designed to be knocked down when the ship was cleared for action. He heard a click and saw Wolf peering through the crack of his door. Have you seen Forehand? demanded Merriweather. Not since you closed this door on my nose. Merriweather went up the companion ladder and called to McCamey. Send the carpenter aft with tools to open a door. He came back to stand outside the door. Wolf, in dressing gown and slippers, joined him after a moment. I can't imagine where that fellow got such an idea, said Wolf suddenly. I never touched the woman. Neither made any reference to the earlier order for Wolf to remain in his room. Finally, the carpenter came down the companionway, hammer, long-nosed pincers and a jimmy in hand. He tried the door handle, held his lantern to the keyhole, and then pushed the pincers gingerly in. He took a firm grip and rotated the pincers. There was a click, and he tried the handle again. Damn thing is bolted, he said. After jimmy it after all, but we won't break the lock now. He pushed the bent steel blade between the door and jam, moving it up and down, and then pushed the handle sharply. There was a screech of metal suddenly withdrawn from oak, and the door opened part way. The carpenter shoved again, forcing the door back against some obstacle, and brought his lantern up. Good God! He's hanged himself! Merriweather slid through the partially open door behind the carpenter, in the yellow light of the lantern, four hands empurpled face swung from a line knotted about his neck and threw a ring bolt in the overhead, his toes less than six inches from the deck. A small stool lay overturned beside him, but Merriweather's gaze was fixed on the bed. Across it, head hanging over the near edge, was Lucy forehand, still in her shift eyes staring wide from a face suffused with blood and dark bruises about her neck. He turned to catch Forehand's body as the carpenter slashed his knife through the line and helped ease him to the deck. Call Dr. Buttram, please, he told Wolf. He turned back and found the carpenter with his ear pressed to Forehand's chest. Can't hear nothing, he said, standing up. It was only a moment before Buttram burst in, medical kit in hand. The examination was brief. 
Forehand and his wife were both dead, she by manual strangulation, he by hanging. Murder and suicide, wondered Buttram. What brought this on? Merriweather shook his head, and they straightened the girl on the bed, laid forehand beside her, and covered them with a single sheet. There was a rustle of movement behind a gown hanging against the bulkhead, and Merriweather reached down to grasp the half-grown cat by the nape of the neck. He handed the kitten out the door to Sang without comment, before turning the key in the lock. Thank you, Mr. Svensson, he told the carpenter. Good night, Wolf. Merriweather led Buttram into his cabin. We are in the territorial waters of Penang, and this will be a matter for the governor and coroner, he reminded Buttram as they wrote their reports. It was an unpleasant thought that came to Merriweather midway through the composition. The girl had been vain, foolish, and amoral, but she had not deserved death in this fashion. He, in all innocence, might well be responsible for her murder. As he remembered events, he had told her to go in the cabin and lock the door. But once the door had closed, he could not remember the click of lock or thump of bolt. He suddenly realized that she had left the door unlocked, expecting him to visit her while Forehand remained incarcerated in the cabin. It was all conjecture, of course, but the conviction remained. He bore a share of the guilt for her death, both in the failure to station a guard and his failure to disavow any intention of visiting her. Gloom descended upon him. It was three more days of waiting in the stifling heat of the anchorage at Penang before the governor and his coroner were satisfied. There were the burials, and then a chest and trunk to be inventoried and sealed. They found a marriage certificate dated last June, signed by the chaplain in another Indiaman, and a handwritten will, in which forehand mentioned nine children by two previous marriages. All these items had to be shipped back to London to the ship's husband of the Duchy of Lancaster at an address in Marylebone High Street. Merriweather found young Raffles a tower of strength in dealing with the legal niceties of the affair. He had edited Merriweather's bald report of the events of that horrible morning, and without changing or omitting a single fact, put in such a form that it satisfied the hair-splitting coroner and his six-man jury. After the verdict came in, death by murder of Lucy Forehand at the hands of Andrew Forehand, and death by his own hand of Andrew Forehand. Raffles intercepted Merriweather and insisted that he come to dinner. It was too late in the day to get under way by now, so he pushed back his gnawing anxiety to get on with the interrupted mission of the Bengal squadron and accepted. There were two other couples and an unattached woman at the informal affair. Raffles' wife was sparkling in her element. There was a Major Anderson commanding the garrison, and a Mr. Winningham, one of the company's agents, who had ambitions to go back to England and stand for Parliament from his district in Surrey. Their wives were pretty and lively, and with the unattached woman Mrs. Hartley, a slender, attractive widow, kept up an entertaining exchange of gossip and wit with Mrs. Raffles. There came a pause in the conversation, and Mrs. Anderson said brightly, it was in your ship that girl was murdered? Is it true that it was because of the attentions of an officer to her? Neither me nor any officer of mine, Merriweather replied instantly. He looked to Raffles, who came to his rescue. There was no such evidence at the inquest, Raffles said smoothly. We'll never learn the man's motive. It was a May and December marriage, you know. He turned the topic of conversation to other fields. There had been evidence of the quarrel and the accusation of Wolf by forehand, but any contact with the woman Wolf had categorically denied, attributing the matter to an unfounded insane jealousy on the part of the husband. The coroner had ordered the reference to him by the dead man stricken from the record, so Raffles was technically correct but there must be a hundred rumours flying about in Georgetown tonight. 
After three London gins, Merriweather felt himself relax into good humour again, forgetting his ordeal with the law. As the party went in to dinner, Mrs. Raffles paused beside him a moment. Be a dear, she whispered, and be especially attentive to Kate Hartley. She is a lonely woman. Merriweather nodded, a little puzzled, and went in. He found the woman charming. After dinner, he pretended to smoke a cigar with Raffles, Anderson, and Winningham over a beaker of brandy, and then rejoined the ladies to stumble through an evening of whist. The affair did not break up until an hour after midnight. The other two couples had departed, and Merriweather was preparing to take his leave with thanks for the entertainment, when he detected a sort of wordless message exchanged between Mrs. Raffles and Mrs. Hartley. A question had been asked and answered, he surmised. It's only in the next house down the lane, Commodore, said Mrs. Raffles. On your way to the landing, I'd be most obliged if you would see Kate to her house. At this point, the gig's crew waiting at the landing had probably drunk their fill of rum from the public house a stone's throw away and were asleep anyway. It was barely a hundred yards, but Mrs. Hartley seized his hand and he felt her tremble as he led her across uneven turf to her door, where a sleepy Malay servant let her in. Oh, come in, Commodore. The evening is young. A brandy? She had wept a little afterward in mortification, and apologized for her unbridled display of passion. It was almost daylight when he pulled on his clothing and crept out. She was a lonely woman, he justified her, still full of life and deprived of a husband in her prime. Yet he had the feeling that he had been used. In the cold light of dawn, that wordless interchange between Olivia Raffles and Kate Hartley last night was perfectly intelligible. Entirely unaware at the time, Merriweather realized that during the evening he had been vetted and passed like a prize bull. Kate had decided she wanted him, and Olivia had forthwith procured the assignation. His thoughts wandered for a moment to Lady Caroline. Was it possible that Wolfe had been correct in his assumption there? The thought unaccountably made him uncomfortable as he came down to the landing. Chapter 5 Two days later the squadron cleared the northern tip of Sumatra. One of those dots over there on the horizon was Pulo Rondo, where he had burned Abercrombie's pirate stronghold last May. The son of Abercrombie came to mind, probably now living in some Indian village, being reared as a native, his English heritage forgotten. The thought of the child still troubled him, but he told himself again it was none of his affair. He turned and paced the weather side of the quarter-deck, considering a change in his operation order, to head south, in the hope of overtaking or intercepting a prize or cruiser, but immediately concluded that his original plan was sound. He signalled Comet to change course to north-northwest, intending to look in on the Nicobar Islands before heading for Ceylon. It was just after the first watch had been called and already dark, with rapid labouring along in a moderate swell, close-hauled under reduced sail, when Sang made his grisly discovery. Coming down the companionway ladder, Merriweather saw the small figure kneeling on the deck in the passage. He thought for a moment that something had been spilled, what with the motion of the ship, and that the steward was wiping it up. Then he saw black fur, and the cord still about the kitten's neck. Sahib! The cat has been hanged. Its neck was stretched, and there were drops of blood glistening on the cat's throat where it had torn at the noose with its claws in a final frenzy. Where was it? Sang pointed silently to the handle of the door behind which Forehand and his wife had died, tears in his eyes. Merriweather stepped over to look, and saw scratches on the woodwork below it and a few specks of blood. Well, I'm damned. I passed this way half an hour ago. 
who's below now? Sang did not reply, merely inclining his head and shifting his sad eyes toward the supercargo's cabin. Oh, Merriweather paused. There was nothing he could do, no proof, and even if there had been, who would take seriously the execution of a kitten? It had been an appealing little animal, affectionate and playful, and he had granted Sang's request to keep it. But there were many people who simply could not abide cats. He felt regret for the small life that had been so cruelly extinguished, but it was no cause for an inquiry. I'm sorry, Sang. He was a nice little fellow. Best drop him over the side and forget the matter. And then will you ask Dr. Buttram to come in at his convenience? He went on into his cabin. Buttram came in a quarter hour later, red in the face and indignant. What a monstrous thing! he exploded. No, said Merriweather. Common enough. Did you ever see a pack of boys tie two cats together by their tails and hang them over a branch? This was gentle by comparison. It's still the act of a diseased mind. Perhaps. But that's not what I wanted to discuss with you. This Dr. Keyes. Is he a competent surgeon? Yes. A bit old-fashioned and opinionated, but that's to be expected at his age. He was a surgeon in a line regiment under Cornwallis in the American War, and then came back to establish a practice in Plymouth. When his wife died and his children had left, he sold his practice and signed on with the company. Why, he is fifty-five if he's a day, and this is his first voyage out here. He is qualified, then? Certainly. Why do you ask, Captain? It seems, said Merriweather, at the last minute, I was ashore at Mr. Raffles' house, he decided he wanted a fling in the Bombay Marine, and Macrae took him in as a volunteer. If you recommend him, I'll authorise issuance of an acting warrant as assistant surgeon. I can't make him senior to you, of course. Buttram laughed shortly. I don't think rank would be of much concern to Keyes. He'll go his own way. But he is entirely qualified as a medical officer. He hesitated, then looked searchingly at Merriweather. And now, let me hark back to another matter. It is a very delicate subject, entirely confidential, sir, and perhaps you'll not want me to go further. This man, Wolfe, I don't know what you were going to say, Merriweather said, so continue. Buttram put the tips of his fingers together and looked at the overhead. Of course, I spent a time as part of my medical education observing the inmates of Bedlam. There is no valid explanation of the causes of madness, not much more than the old superstition that such persons are possessed by demons. We do know that some diseases of the body, such as syphilis, can cause lesions or damage to the brain and ultimately affect the mind. But I've dissected the brain of a howling lunatic, and it was no different from that of a healthy man. I have an idea of what you were leading up to, Doctor. I admit, five or six weeks is a very short period of observation, continued Buttram slowly. But I have had more contact with Wolf than you have, sir. I made it a point to cultivate him after that first outburst, and I've played chess with him nearly every afternoon since. He took his fingers apart and looked directly at Merriweather. Sir, it is as though there were two men inhabiting the same body. He's a competitor, and I admit he wins at chess more often than he loses. But when he does lose, there's pure murderous hate looking out from his eyes. Oh, he restrains it well enough. But having seen it displayed when his control was overcome by wine, I suspect the depth of the mania that exists in him. Just a moment, Doctor, demanded Merriweather. Are you telling me the man's insane? Not certifiably, sir. That's what I've been trying to explain. It would be simple enough if he had obvious delusions or the gibbering and ranting symptoms of the typical madman. 
I have read in translation some of the notes on the theories of two Frenchmen, Mesmer and Pinel. But medicine knows very little of those matters yet. I do not believe a physician or surgeon is qualified to make any sort of a diagnosis of a mania of the kind I suspect in Wolf. I limit my opinion to the observation that this man is dangerous. I think he has two natures, one that he customarily exhibits to his associates, and another that lurks beneath, awaiting an opportunity to leap out and seize control. It has done so twice now. Twice? Yes, sir. The second time was last week when he made the senseless attack on the Malays. How about the night forehand killed his wife? Possibly. I saw him when he was under control, and of course you have no proof as to the cat, though there seems to be a sort of symbolism in hanging it on the door of the room where the murder and suicide occurred. You realise, said Merriweather, that if Wolf learned you had made these statements, he could have you cast in damages for slander? Of course. And I trust your discretion implicitly, sir. I only wish you to be on your guard, replied Buttram, rising. If you'll excuse me, sir, wait. What is your opinion of Keyes's surmise that a pestilence may have overtaken the Indiaman? No opinion, sir. I'm sure Keyes knows typhoid symptoms when he sees them, and it can be most deadly, especially to Europeans out here. It had been an interesting conversation. The concept of two minds, one sane, the other mad, inhabiting the same body was novel. Yet Merriweather had encountered numbers of people in his life whose duplicity was hidden behind a facade of honesty or chastity or loyalty. These common traits were not the same as the thing Buttram envisioned, he concluded, and put the matter aside. He needed no medical advice to be on his guard against Wolfe. By noon the next day, Merriweather had the mountains of Greater Nicobar in sight off the starboard bow. There were few anchorages on either side of the archipelago, but in this season a vessel would seek shelter from the northeast monsoon on the western side, and that was where he intended to look. Comet was nearly four miles abeam to starboard, and Merriweather asked Dobbs whether an alteration of course would be necessary for her to weather the southern tip of the island with the wind steady out of the northeast. No, sir, said Dobbs, looking out toward Comet. She'll clear it by... Aha! He's signalling. He picked up the glass and swung into the mizzen shrouds. Sail bearing north-northeast, he shouted down. Merriweather conjured up a mental picture of the situation. With Comet's true bearing northeast of Rapid, four miles distant, the target must be northeast and by east from his present position, which would put it eight or ten miles off the eastern shore of Great Nicobar. His train of thought was interrupted by another shout from Dobbs. Signals! Two sails in sight! Acknowledge, Merriweather told the signal quartermaster, and harked back to the problem of interception. It was an awkward situation. Comet with her windward sailing qualities and four-mile advantage to the northeast of Rapid, might be barely able to hold a course to intercept the ships. But it would be foolish thus to divide his force and make piecemeal attacks upon what could be superior forces. And two, if the targets decided to avoid a fight, they could go about and escape through St. George's Channel between Great Nicobar and Little Nicobar to make a long stern chase of it. Rapid effectively blocked escape to the southwest, but it was essential that Comet gain the weather gauge in order to counter any manoeuvre the enemy, and he suddenly knew in his bones it was what the enemy might attempt. He picked up the slate to write his message and was momentarily distracted by the passing of a shining, close-shaven pate. He realised that it was Midshipman Kinney, but did not pause in his composition of the message. There was no arbitrary signal for this order, and it must be spelled out as economically as possible. Take weather gauge, flag sails north. He watched the hoists go up and down, 
each acknowledged by Comet, then saw her profile change as she went about and settled on a reach that would give her the easting necessary to put her to windward of the targets. As for Rapid, there was a weary period of working her to the northeast, with the necessity of going about every few minutes as she clawed her way into the eye of the wind in a succession of tacks. Merriweather fretted inwardly, but he compelled himself to preserve an appearance of calm, while McCamey worked the ship. It was more than an hour and Comet had disappeared to the east, before Hamlin hailed from the main top. What course? Merriweather shouted back, unable to wait for McCamey's leisurely inquiry. Looks bows on, near south, sir. Two ships in line ahead. Two ships sailing in line ahead suggested men of war rather than free and easy privateers. Both are square rigged, but the second ship's sails are brailed up, shouted down Hamlin. What in hell? Merriweather picked up the glass and started forward. The thing did not add up. Two ships in line ahead, the second ship not under sail. He stopped dead. It was so simple he had overlooked the solution. The second ship must be under tow. He went up the mainmast and then to perch on the royal yard. It was difficult to find those specks in the field of the glass with the continuous motion of the ship, but once he had located them, he held them. The leading ship was close hauled on the port tack, and the following ship indeed had her sails brailed up. Even as he watched, she all took course to starboard, the intervals between her masts widening, then yawed back to port. There must be no one at her helm. Merriweather heard McCamey's command to go about and scrambled out of the way for the manoeuvre. By the time Rapid had settled on the port tack, he had reached a tentative conclusion. The ship under tow must be the Duchy of Lancaster, her crew stricken by disease and the towing ship would have to be the French brig that had captured her. He could see the logic of the matter. Once dragged south of the Nicobars, there was unlimited sea room where the prize might drift until such time as the captor considered it safe to board the valuable ship again. He found the target again in his glass. It was only a few minutes before the brig altered shape, wearing around to head northwest. The other ship remained in place. Evidently, the tow had been cast off as Rapid was sighted, and with the appearance of a ship-rigged vessel, the privateer was making a run for St. George's Channel. Merriweather prayed that McCrae had had time to sail back westward far enough to intercept. He clung to his perch, trying to sort out the situation. At least he could retake the pest ship for what it was worth, but he had no chance of overtaking the brig. He descended to the deck. Half an hour later there was another shout from Hamlin. Deck there! Briggs hauled her wind! Merriweather went into the rigging again. Rapid was on the port tack on a reach eastward. From the main top he could see the brig coming south, all sail set with the wind on her quarter. Evidently her commander had sighted Comet, and decided there was a better chance of escape in this direction rather than trying to outsail the schooner through narrow waters to the north. He heard McCamey give the preliminary order to go about. Belay that, he shouted down. A little more easting, and the brig could not double back on him as that frigate had done last summer, leaving only a long stern chase. He had no doubt that Rapid had the heels of any brig but it was hard to wait through those dragging minutes as her topsails became visible until the bearings satisfied him. Where ship? he shouted down. Hands to the braces! Port your helm! Merriweather reached the quarterdeck in time to give the final orders to the helm as the ship wore about almost before the wind. Easy helm. Meet her. Course south-southwest and by west he told the quartermaster, and send the hands to quarters, Mr. McCamey. Sail ho! came the hail from the masthead. It's Comet! Due north! Well, the thing had worked out. 
he had the Frenchman pinned against a lee shore, both his ships holding the weather gauge. The privateer could escape now only through the gross incompetence of Merriweather or Macrae, or by overwhelming one or both of his ships, or by blind luck. He looked out to see her, now hull up, every sail set, a bone in her teeth driving south. Five miles astern he could see the Indy man rolling aimlessly in the swell. It would be some hours yet before she drifted on to soundings off Great Nicobar, but in any event, the first responsibility under Merriweather's commission was to destroy or capture that cruiser. He heard the batteries reporting, and Dobbs, officer of the deck at quarters, touched his hat and reported all stations manned and ready. Hoses were strung out, buckets filled with water, sand spread on deck, slow matches burning in tubs beside the guns, pikes and cutlasses in the racks abaft each mast, and the marine detachment deployed on forecastle, poop and in the tops, their muskets glinting in the late afternoon sun. Come a point to port, Merriweather told the helmsman. The bearing of the Frenchman was almost steady, the ships on collision courses for a point not too far southwest. He looked aft. Comet was now visible from the deck under a tower of canvas. McRae had positioned her exactly to cut off any escape northwardly, and it was Rapid's sole responsibility to bring the cruiser to bay. The scene assumed a dreamlike quality, with Wolf on deck, sword belted on wearing his cocked hat, eyes sparkling, the butts of pistols protruding from the pockets of his coat, still apparently favouring his left leg. Merriweather looked about. No sign of Kinney now, but he was sure he had seen him. Scalp shaved clean only a bit ago. A shout brought his attention back to the brig. She had broken a flag, the trickler, of course. Hoist our colours, he told Dobbs, and signal, engage the enemy. There was really no necessity for the signal, but it went into the log. It was less than two miles now, and high time the guns were loaded and run out. A nod to Larkin, and the deck burst into activity. Merriweather focused the glass on the brig, and saw that her ports were also open and guns run out. He could not identify their calibre, but he counted six. The sun was well down to the west outlining the mountains of Great Nicobar, and her southern tip was less than five miles ahead. He was cutting things damned fine. Try a ranging shot, Mr. Larkin, he called forward. The blonde hair flashed as Larkin bent over the forward pivot, setting the sights on the long nine-pounder. He stood aside, gauged the pitch of the ship, and pulled the lanyard. The spiteful report blasted out, and Merriweather strained his eyes for a sign of the fall of shot. There was a spout off the port bow of the target. Short and a little to the left, he called, and Larkin waved an acknowledgement. When Merriweather looked back at the brig, she was turning toward him, seeking to cross his bow. It was a bold manoeuvre. There was no profit for a privateer to engage a ship of war but the French captain had realised that Rapid would intercept within minutes and decided to force the issue with a chance of success. Comet was three miles astern and coming fast, but she would not be in time to help here. The brig was now close-hauled, thrashing through the swells, but Rapid would fall reach on her in a moment and lose the advantage of the weather gauge. He was conscious of Wolf shouting something at him, but the words were lost in the sound of the second shot from the pivot gun. He hesitated the fraction of a moment it took to observe the shot, and saw splinters fly from the forecastle of the brig. Nothing crippling, he thought, turning to the helm. Hands to the braces, he told Dobbs. Wear ship, port your helm. The ship swung about to the reciprocal of the course of the privateer, but still to windward, as the hands tailed onto the braces. Steady as you go. Nothing to the left. The enemy was half a mile ahead, only a point on the port bow. Keep the hands at the braces. The French captain had precipitated a situation with several alternatives. 
and a wrong choice here might mean disaster. The man was holding on resolutely, Merriweather thought, looking through the glass. If the brig held her course, Rapid might turn across her bow for a raking broadside, or continuing on course for an almost muzzle-to-muzzle -muzzle exchange. If he turned south and the brig held on, Rapid would in turn be raked from the stern and would lose the weather gauge without a chance for revenge. The Frenchman had his hands at the braces too, ready to play the game of bluff and artful dodger with Rapid. Where ship? shouted Merriweather. Starboard your helm. He waited a moment for the effect. The brig had reacted like lightning to the first movement of the ship and was swinging to the south. Midships, meet her! he shouted to the quartermaster. Belay, as you were, he told Dobbs, and the yards were trimmed back as Rapid continued on course. The feint had succeeded. The side of the cruiser erupted in flame, but the guns, hastily laid in a ship turning across a moderate swell, managed only one hit forward. Come two points to port, he told the helm. Stand by, he shouted to McCamey, commanding the port battery. Fire as your guns bear. Rapid was drawing across the defenceless stern of the brig less than half a cable's length away. Merriweather could read the name picked out in guilt. Majeur. The huge twenty-four-pound forward carronade was the first gun to fire, striking through the stern lights followed by the whole battery. A hundred and two pounds of iron balls smashing lengthwise through a wooden ship was devastating. But Merriweather had no time to consider the matter. The powder smoke was rolling down toward the brig, blotting out sight of her. But over it, he could see her masts widening. She was still wearing about to starboard. In a moment, she would be in a position to repay the broadside with vengeance. Starboard helm! Wear ship! Rapid came about alertly to port to cross the stern of the Frenchman again with the starboard battery standing ready. Two shots were fired from the privateer, one striking home about midships. Merriweather waved to Larkin, and the shots crashed out from bow to stern in succession as Larkin came running down the battery to end on the quarter-deck. Every shot took effect, it appeared. Dobbs shouted at him, pointing out over the port quarter. Comet was sweeping across his stern, guns run out and ready to fire into the French ship. He saw the trickler come down, but it was too late to stop the broadside Comet sent into her. The enemy came up into the wind, black smoke now pouring from her shattered stern lights. Rapid and Comet hove to on either side of the prize. Guns run out to cover her. Away, fire party! Away, Marines! roared Dobbs. The boatswain and his party were manhandling the portable pump into the launch, then throwing lengths of canvas hose, buckets, axes, and crowbars into the boat, even as it was being hoisted from its cradle. The men had no intention of being cheated of prize money by fire. The cutter was half full of seawater to serve as a ready reservoir on deck. Her coxswain had pulled both plugs and water was still pouring from her bottom as she rose in turn to be lowered into the water, the coxswain now hammering the plugs home again in frantic haste. Larkin and the boatswain were rowing double time for the prize, even as Comet's launch was pulling toward the other side. The marines under Gunny embarked in the second boat in disciplined haste. Hamlin, awaiting Wolfe, fairly dancing with impatience in her stern. Merriweather saw the fire party swarm up the side of the brig, then lay hoses aft as the pump was rigged. It was only a few minutes before the smoke had turned white, then diminished to invisibility as Comet's party joined the action. The marines were formed up across the waist and on the forecastle, their muskets at the ready. Merriweather was suddenly so weary he could hardly stand. The sun was now behind the mountains of Great Nicobar, and darkness would not be far behind at this season. He wished desperately for a moment to have a glass of gin, but put the thought aside to deal with the situation. The carpenter was reporting that Rapid had been hulled twice above the waterline. There was no immediate danger, 
and repairs were underway. He signalled Comet to provide her share of the prize crew, Dylan, her first lieutenant, to be master. He called Whitfield, the senior boatswain's mate, informed him that he was acting boatswain, second in command, told him to pick eight steady men to help man the brig, and to tell Gunny to leave five marines each from Comet and Rapid with a Nike in command as a guard. The launch bringing back the fire party was alongside, the men taking far longer to unload their gear than they had to load it. Buttram appeared before him in the gathering dusk, his bare arms and shirt spotted with blood. Sir, we have a passenger mortally wounded, and five men with slight wounds or by splinters. Passenger? asked Merriweather, puzzled. That's what I would call him. Young Kinney. He was on the main deck when the second shot struck. A four-foot piece of oak went right through his belly. No chance at all. He is unconscious. A blessing, but I expect he will expire within the hour. The young surgeon shook his head. A very pleasant lad. He endured a great deal without complaint. Well, I'll discuss the matter later. And now what about that pest ship? Merriweather jumped and then strove to dissemble. He had completely forgotten the Duchy of Lancaster adrift on a lee shore some miles north. He saw Boatswain Tompkins hovering in the background and sought to gain time. Yes, sir, the French is not disabled. The standing and running rigging is in good shape. Her cabin is a bit scorched. A shot hit the lamp and scattered oil. That's all the fire was. He paused. A middle-aged, crag-faced seaman from Preston near Liverpool who had first gone to sea in the Royal Navy, then in the slave trade before he was drafted into the Bombay Marine. He continued with an air of wonder. Sir, every shot went clean through that ship and never touched a man. Three broadsides and not a drop of blood. Who believe it? She's secured, I hope. Yes, sir. The Marines run everybody on deck and there's no fight in them. Very well, Mr. Tompkins. I've sent Whitfield and eight leading seamen for the prize crew. And now, that India man that's adrift north of here, we've got to get her under tow or anchored safely. Leave the boats in the water, and I'll require a crew when we come up with her. Merriweather cut his eyes at Buttram in the gloom, daring him to say anything. Tompkins touched his hat and went forward. Merriweather turned to Buttram again. How much danger is there from infection, assuming that ship is infested with fever? Well, Captain, a party boarding her should carry its own food and water, and avoid contact with the sick, of course. All human excrement should be disposed of, the living quarters and galleys flushed out and disinfected. I have a formula I can make up for that with supplies on board. It might help to fumigate the ship with brimstone as well. I can't predict the chances, of course, but if a man stays clean, avoids direct contact, and consumes uncontaminated food and water, he should escape infection. But the party must remain in quarantine for at least two weeks after the last exposure. Merriweather turned the matter over in his mind. Any party he put on board would be lost to him for the balance of the operation, and he certainly could not spare enough men to work that huge ship. It was possible from his medical advice that a considerable number of the Laskers survived, however, and under resolute command they might be able to sail her downwind to Ceylon. It was his duty to try to preserve the valuable ship and cargo for the company, but not at the expense of crippling his squadron in the process. Signals, prepare to get underway, course north, a point west. There was barely enough light left to read the flags. And now to Comet. Send Keys on board with Kit. It would be a while before Comet could ferry him across, and Merriweather went down to the sick bay. Buttram was hovering over a cot on which young Kinney lay. There was no visible sign of respiration, and Buttram pulled the sheet up over the waxen face and shaven pate. He's gone. A massive internal hemorrhage. Merriweather barely knew the lad, but he had appeared alert and likable. 
Rapid had pumped two raking broadsides and Comet one through the French cruiser without wounding a man, while the two hits the privateer managed to kill a Royal Navy warrant officer and wounded five seamen. Call the sailmaker and I'll try to have the service at two bells in the forenoon watch. And what's wrong with that fellow? There was a seaman head bandaged lying on another cot. Oh, Stokes got a nasty knock and cut on the head. I'm keeping him here tonight in case he has concussion. Very well. I've ordered Keese on board. When he comes, bring him to the cabin. Merriweather went on deck and aft through the gloom, hoping Comet's boat would soon arrive. At the break of the poop he encountered Wolf, still wearing his sword and cocked hat. Merriweather, I must see you immediately. Merriweather led the way below to the cabin and Wolf entered, propelling a man dressed in the semblance of a uniform ahead of him. The man was ashen, trembling visibly and held his left wrist in his right hand. The left hand was wrapped in a bloody rag. Merriweather took off his hat and seated himself at the desk. Yes, Captain. Wolf's face was wreathed in smiles. That was a beautiful manoeuvre, Commodore. You even deceived me. The faint, and they're wearing back immediately to cross his stern again. Ah, beautiful. Nelson could not have improved upon it. Merriweather felt a glow of satisfaction at this unexpected praise. Thank you, Captain. I found myself in a fortunate position. Where you deliberately placed yourself, continued Wolf. I certainly shall see that Admiral Pellew receives a full account of this action. He paused portentously. And I've pulled off a bit of a coup myself this afternoon. This is the captain of the brig. Luckily, I have a fair command of French, and with a little persuasion, Wolf smiled triumphantly, he gave me their operational plan. He paused again and leaned forward. Sir, he parted company with two schooners only this morning. Since the Indy man was his prize alone, they refused to help him try to save it. But a heading for a rendezvous of Co Phuket with a third ship a week from today. Excellent, Captain. And what is wrong with this man? I thought there were no casualties in the Frenchman. Wolf laughed shortly. As I said, I had to persuade him to talk. He only has two fingers damaged, though he was a bit stubborn at the outset. A Spanish trick I learned when I was serving at Gibraltar. Merriweather kept his face impassive. This officer had used torture to extract information from a prisoner in violation of the conventions of war. There was no question the intelligence was valuable, but the means by which Wolf had obtained it was barbarous. Thank you, Captain. I shall act upon this information as soon as that Indian man is secured. He stood up in dismissal. And send this man to the sick bay. Wolf's mouth came open, face crimson. He sputtered a moment, then blurted, I'm damned! Vital and urgent intelligence, and you delay to secure a stinking John Company packet? That's enough, Captain, said Merriweather sharply. But by the way, your aide midshipman Kinney died a few minutes ago from a wound received in the action this afternoon. Oh, Kinney. Died, did he? Well, not much loss there. He was a dirty fellow without ability or future. The flush faded from Wolf's face. Well, God rest his soul, he added almost inaudibly and turned away for a moment, then turned back to face Merriweather, a tear glistening on his cheek. I'll put this remarkable failure to act on this information in my report. As you will, broke in Merriweather, you are excused. Wolf went out, followed by the Frenchman still holding his wrist passing Buttram and Keese in the passage. Merriweather sat down wearily again at the desk. Much as he would prefer to go charging off in pursuit of the privateers, he must first try to preserve the company's investment in the Indiaman. He called the messenger and sent him with instructions to the watch officer to order execution of the previous order and get the squadron under way. 
he left the boats in the water, towing alongside from a boom, to be used in the impending operation. When the two surgeons entered, Merriweather came bluntly to the point with Keyes. I had intended to give you an acting warrant as surgeon in the Marine, Doctor. Now it seems we have come up with your ship, and you are her senior officer present. Yes, sir, but only a surgeon. Precisely what we require at the moment, Doctor. If I can give you a man qualified to sail her, and one able to navigate, assuming there are some healthy Laskers left, are you willing to help take her to Ceylon? Keese's blue eyes snapped. In a moment, sir, and I'll have her disinfected and cleaned too. There should be enough drugs and disinfectants left in the apothecary locker. I doubt if anyone has meddled with more than the medicinal brandy. Very well. Hold yourself in readiness. We should come up with your ship in another hour. I had intended to do no more than get a line on her tonight to hold her off the beach, but in light of certain information I have received, I must move immediately. Now, Buttram, there's a French officer waiting in your sick bay with an injured hand, and on your way out, ask the watch to pass the word for Eldridge and Webster to lay aft to the cabin. As Merriweather waited the few moments before the knock came, he thought sourly that Wolf continued to be a problem, though he had produced the intelligence so desperately needed. He recalled Buttram's concept of two personalities inhabiting the same body. Well, tonight the suppressed one had leaped out again, and quite unpleasantly. Possibly he could endure the man through the rest of this commission, but he was afraid something might snap. When the knock came, he invited Eldridge in, asking Webster to wait. Sit down, Eldridge, he told the boatswain's mate. You read and write, I know, but how much more education did you have? Not much, Eldridge confessed, uncomfortable at being seated in the cabin. I don't cipher very well, sir. All right. That Indian man up ahead has been infected by fever, typhoid, typhus, the doctors are not sure at this point. We are reasonably sure the French prize crew is dead or disabled, but that a number of Laskers probably survive. Given enough hands, can you get her under sail and take her to Colombo? Get her under sail, I can, and steer any course that's set, but I can't navigate, sir. Very well, you're truthful. Are you afraid of the fever, Eldridge? Not much, sir. I guess. I had a case of it when I was a boy. I had in mind, said Merriweather slowly, issuing an acting warrant, master's mate or boatswain, take your choice, to you to sail the Indiaman to Ceylon. I'll provide you with a navigator. Are you game? He watched Eldridge's face as determination succeeded surprise. And if you'll take some instruction in navigation along the way, I'll recommend the permanent appointment to Bombay Castle. Yes, sir, said Eldridge. And if you don't mind, I would as lief be a master's mate. Very well, Mr. Eldridge, said Merriweather, rising to shake the young man's hand. He went over to a locker under the transom and pulled out a well-worn book. Mr. Bircham, lately a midshipman in this ship, left this behind. It details every step and calculation in the navigational process, and with some practical instruction, it should teach you enough to pass an examination for master's mate. Eldridge took the volume almost reverently. Now get your gear and bedding together. Draw pistols, powder and shot from the gunner, and I'll give you this to help you along in case of trouble. He pulled one of the four blunderbusses from the rack beside the door and handed it to Eldridge. A gun like this made me a captain in the Marine, and it may bring luck to you. I was a topman, and a boatswain's mate too. Now understand this. Provisions and water will come from this ship. Do not eat or drink anything you find in the other. Obey the doctor's orders as to matters of health and the disposition of the ship once you reach Ceylon but you are captain of the Duchy of Lancaster. He watched Eldridge stride out the door, book and blunderbusses in either hand, and hoped that he had not just imposed a sentence of death upon him. 
Webster came in. A bony man approaching middle age who would have been handsome except for the ravages of disease and dissipation in his face. Merriweather had discovered his education last year and customarily drafted him to assist in making fair copies of orders and reports in his classical handwriting. Sit down, Webster. What rating do you hold at the moment? Ordinary seaman, sir. Let's see. You were rated quartermaster off the Cape of Good Hope and disrated for drunkenness at Calcutta. Yes, sir. Rated again and disrated at Macau. Rated once more and disrated at Bombay. Drink each time. You are an excellent quartermaster. A tinge of red appeared in the sallow cheeks as Webster met his gaze squarely. Yes, sir. Drink and women. They've been my ruination. I threw away an inheritance in London, went bankrupt as an underwriter at Lloyd's and escaped to see ahead of my creditors. I was gently born and had a good education, but I can't let women or spirits alone. No hope for me this late date. Merriweather looked down at his desk. He had known the man was educated and possessed ability, but on each appearance at the mast, Webster had interposed no defence and accepted his punishment. Very well, Webster. I do not intend to reform you. I think and you think it is hopeless. I do want to borrow your considerable talents for a time, if you will consent. Webster looked at him impassively, a touch of colour still in his face. The Indian man up ahead has been stricken with disease, evidently killing all the white men aboard her. Dr. Keese, her surgeon, and Eldridge have agreed to board her, and if there are enough Laskers surviving, to try to take her to Ceylon. They need a man acquainted with the theory to navigate her. What do you say? Webster looked aside for a moment. And why not? he said at last. I can navigate. And it's as good a berth as any for me. I'll do it, but I'll make you no promises once we arrive at Colombo. Good Webster, we understand one another, and I am rating you quartermaster again. Now, if you will, please give all the instruction you can to Eldridge in the theory and practice of navigation during the voyage. Merriweather pulled down another of the blunderbusses from the rack and handed it to Webster. I gave Eldridge the mate of this. It often serves to preserve good order and discipline at sea. And good luck, Webster. The man took the weapon and went out, while Merriweather sat for a moment, wondering at the vagaries of fate. There was no guarantee of success or happiness in this world, even with a gentle birth and a classical education, he concluded. Chapter 6 The weather was making up, wind freshening, no stars visible, and an occasional white cap appearing among the swells. The darkness to the east foretold the approaching squall, and stinging drops of rain splattered down as the launch pulled away for the Duchy of Lancaster. Merriweather sat in the stern, bareheaded in shirt and trousers, preferring to be wet with rain rather than sweat under a boat cloak. Dr. Keith, Eldridge and Webster had their baggage beside them, and three large parcels wrapped in oilskins containing rations and a water breaker each were stowed forward. The coxswain steered for a dim light which must be on the India man. She appeared to be lying quartering into the wind and sea as the boat pulled around the bow and into her lee, then circled to come along the port side at the gangway. And Eldridge said Merriweather suddenly as the thought struck him. Be sure to get rid of that hawser she was being towed by. Be like an anchor underfoot otherwise. Eldridge had a lighted lantern in hand and was anxiously looking up the high side of the ship. No ladder, he said, and picked up the grapnel. He hurled it up into darkness, heard it strike wood, jerked the line taut and tested its hold. The ship was both pitching and rolling in the swell and the bow hook and stern hook were fending off as the oarsman held the launch close. Eldridge gauged the pitch and roll, leaped to take as high a hold as he could and went up the line as the Indian man rolled to port. 
disappearing from sight like a fakir performing the rope trick. A moment later, he shouted down, Tie the lantern on the line! It seemed an interminable time before there was another shout from above, and a Jacob's ladder cascaded down. Up you go, Merriweather told Webster, and the quartermaster scrambled up. There was a flaw in the wind for a moment, and a nauseating stench came into the boat. Good God, said Keyes, those French corpses must still be aft. I'll have to get them overboard somehow. All right, Doctor, can you make it? Let me know as soon as you can if there are enough able-bodied men to work the ship. What he would do if there were no Laskers able to work, Merriweather refused to consider at this point. Keyes took hold of the ladder, swung himself up, was slammed once against the side as the ship rolled to starboard, and went out of sight. The boat crew had its hands full, holding close and fending off, as the rain came down with increasing force. It must have been a quarter of an hour before the voice of Keyes came down out of the darkness. Boat ahoy! There seem to be thirty-nine Laskers healthy, including their leading seamen. Eldridge thinks he can manage. And now we're ready for our gear and provisions. A hook at the end of a line came down, and one by one the items were hauled up to the deck. Lanterns were now hanging in the shrouds, casting a yellow glow on the wet side of the Indiaman. A head appeared over the bulwark. Are you ready, Eldridge? shouted Merriweather. After a hesitation there came the reply. Yes, sir. I think so. Well, good luck. Merriweather turned to the coxswain. Shove off. Return to the ship. The launch was a quarter of a mile away, pulling hard against the wind and seas when the faint sound of a shot came from downwind. Merriweather whirled to look back at the Indy man, lanterns now mere pinpoints to mark her position. There was nothing he could do, he justified himself. It was sink or swim for Eldridge and his party. He could not risk the chance of bringing infection into Rapid. The launch pulled on toward the ship. Eldridge came back from the locker under the break of the poop with three more lighted lanterns and set them on deck while he looked for the Jacob's ladder. The stench coming from the open companionways leading aft was almost unbearable. He found the ladder rolled and lashed against the bulwark and cut it loose, then slipped the eye splices over the cleats at the gangway. Heads up! he shouted, and kicked the roll over the side. A moment later Webster appeared on deck, and after an interval the head of Dr. Keyes materialised at the top of the ladder, and he and Webster pulled him over the side. The doctor's knuckles were skinned and he was rubbing his knees. I'll look for the charts and navigating instruments said Webster, picking up a lantern and heading aft. Come on forward, said Keyes. There are a few hands speak some English, but Sharma is their leading seaman if he's still alive. At the forecastle entry, Keyes paused. There was a lantern hanging inside, smoked and guttering, and a stench came out, not of death and corruption, but of sickness and feces. Sharma! shouted Keyes. He paused to listen, then, Sharma on deck! There was a rustle of movement below, and a grey-bearded Indian appeared at the foot of the ladder. Sir, the man said in astonishment, you have returned. Sharma, how many able-bodied men have you? The Indian thought a moment, counting on his fingers, then replied, Thirty-eight, sir, and me, and eleven more still sick. All the Frenchmen are dead. Very well, Sharma, now get them on deck. We have to get the ship under way. The man went back out of sight, and Eldridge led the way back to the gangway. Can you handle her with that many men? asked Keyes. Yes, sir, I think so, if I can make those buggers understand me. Well, Sharma will relay the orders in their lingo, and they appear to know their business on the way to China. I'll tell the Commodore to send up our gear. Once the baggage and provisions were on deck, there appeared to be no further necessity for the boat to stand by. Eldridge put his head over the side as he heard Merriweather shout the question. He hesitated a moment, 
feeling suddenly lonely and abandoned, full of doubts of his ability to control this huge ship, with a skeleton crew that spoke so little English, or to take her a thousand-odd miles across the Bay of Bengal. He wondered if he might sicken and die like those men aft, to become a liquid mass of corruption in a derelict, doomed to drift until it wrecked against some godforsaken coast. He had been confident enough a few hours ago, elated at his promotion, temporary though it might prove to be, and accepting the envious congratulations of the other petty officers. They had wondered that he had chosen to be a master's mate when the rank of boatswain was the pinnacle of ambition of nearly every rating in the lower deck. But Algeta made that choice deliberately. He had long since observed that a qualified boatswain was far too valuable a warrant officer ever to be promoted to commissioned rank. That scar-faced captain down in the boat had risen from the lower deck by way of topman and a boatswain's mate to be a commodore, now it was said. And what one man had done, another might. The memory of that misty morning five years ago when he left the stone cottage in Northumberland crossed Eldridge's mind. After his father died, the eldest son came back to assume the lease on the croft. He had told Eldridge bluntly that what with his wife, mother and two younger sisters still at home, as well as his own three toddlers, there was no room for a well-grown sixteen-year-old lad. So Eldridge had walked to the Tyneside and found a bare subsistence digging and clearing ditches for the corporation of Newcastle, and later became a navvy on the docks. The chance to sign on as a landsman in a coastwise brig was irresistible, but she had paid off after the voyage at Liverpool. Two years of swinging a pick and plying a shovel had broadened Eldridge's shoulders and developed his muscles, and with the advantage of being able to splice and tie the correct knot, he had found a berth in the slaver rapid as an ordinary seaman on her last voyage to the Congo and West Indies. This past year had been astonishing. Drafted into a service he had never heard of, the Bombay Marine, Eldridge had been drafted from London around the world to India and China, and he had progressed from ordinary seaman to topman, then to boatswain's mate, and now to acting master's mate. Ambition flooded up again. He had fought by the side of Captain Merriweather, and Merriweather had been fair to him. By God, he would justify Merriweather, take this towering ship to Ceylon and learn enough in the process not only to be a master's mate but reach commissioned rank. Eldridge shouted down his answer to Merriweather's inquiry. Yes, sir, I think so. He heard, Good luck almost drowned out in a splatter of rain, then saw the launch fend off and pull away into darkness. As he turned from the side, Eldridge heard the twitter of conversation in a foreign tongue, and looked forward to see movement flowing from the forecastle to gather in the shadowy waste. Sharma and Dr. Keyes stood together at the base of the mainmast, a lantern casting dim yellow light on the scene. The rain came down harder, with gusts of wind out of the northeast. Webster came forward, water trickling from his chin. She answers her helm all right, sir, he told Eldridge. Compass seems true, though I'm not sure about the table of corrections. The chorometers were run down, but I've wound and reset them to agree with the watch I brought from Rapid. There are charts in the roundhouse, though I can't find one for the approaches to Colombo. I'm ready to get under way, but... That smell aft is more than I can bear. And me, said Eldridge, unwrapping the oilskin, and taking out the blunderbuss and a pair of pistols he had had the gunner load and prime for him. There were scraps of oilskin tied over the locks of the guns to protect the priming from the rain. He thrust the pistols into his waistband and went forward, laying the blunderbuss beside the mast outside the pool of light. Are all hands on deck? he asked Keese. Yes, sir, interposed Sharma. I've told them what you planned, sir. All right, Sharma, but first I want those bodies aft, out and over the side. I want all bedding, clothing, baggage, slop buckets and everything movable after them. Tell all hands to go aft and turn to. Velasca looked at him sideways, his eyes gleaming in the lantern light. Sir, he commenced, tell them. 
The leader turned to the assembly and began to speak, looking anxiously over his shoulder twice at Eldridge. There were several shrill cries apparently of protest from the group, and Sharma spread his hands, then gestured with his thumb toward Eldridge. The men moved restively and a little hum of conversation arose. Eldridge lost patience. Turn to, he grated, and Sharma took a step back in alarm. Sir, they are afraid, and some, their religion does not permit. Just then a man with glittering eyes and a stylized beard stepped forward and began to speak with vigorous gestures. He turned to the hands and shouted, pointing forward. The half-dozen men turned and started toward the forecastle entry. The others looked undecided. Sir, this man is telling them not to obey, not to risk sickness or defile their hands with the rotting corpses of Christians. God damn, thought Eldridge in a cold fury, faced with outright mutiny before he had even taken command. He could not tolerate the stench or the risk of infection for himself, Keyes or Webster. The afterquarters must be cleared at any cost. He stepped back, picked up the blunderbuss, stripping the oilskin cover from the lock and pulling the hammer back to full cock. The bearded man was still shouting and gesturing toward the forecastle as more Laskers were now heading toward it. You! roared Eldridge, stepping back into the lighted area. The bearded man whirled and Eldridge fired the blunderbuss at point-blank range into his chest. He turned toward the crew, swinging the bell muzzle from side to side, smelling the acrid powder smoke as it blew by him. He was conscious of a movement to his right, and there stood Webster, the mate of his blunderbuss menacing the assembly. Tell them to turn to! Sharma spoke briefly. The men hesitated only a moment before filing aft, looking with alarm at the grim faces of Webster and Eldridge and the short, ugly weapons in their hands. In an hour, the cabins aft were emptied. There had been five French corpses taken out on mattresses, wrapped in bedding and dumped over the side. There had been no time for a committal service, even if he had known the words, Eldridge reflected. Everything portable followed the bodies, and then Keyes sent a dozen pails of a shrewd-smelling liquid in to be splashed across the deck in each room and passage before they were swabbed out. It took another hour to get topsail, spanker, and a foresail set, then with Webster at the wheel, Sharma positioned to pass the word to the hands at the braces. Eldridge gave his first command. Starboard your helm! With the ship's head almost east, the wind was on her port bow. Starboard it is, sir. The sternway on the ship pulled the stern slowly about to port as the rudder bit, then the foresail and main topsail filled with tremendous reports. The sternway checked, and the ship paid off as the scanty crew heaved at the braces to trim the yards as she came around. Shift your helm. Port it is, sir. Midships. Meet her, said Eldridge as the vessel gained headway. He stepped over to look at the compass in the lighted binnacle. Your course is... South, southeast, sir, interposed Webster. South, southeast, continued Eldridge. Look lively, he shouted to Sharma. Trim her more. That's it. On the port tack... Under topsail, spanker, and one headsail, the Duchy of Lancaster staggered sluggishly across the heavy swells, raindrops bouncing on her deck as Eldridge, swaying automatically with the movement of the ship, watched the compass and then the trim of the sails. He was not weary. The exhilaration persisted. He was the captain, and he would take this great ship to Ceylon come what may. As he watched the straining sails and felt the movement of the ship, a thought struck him. Thunderation, the cable! He ran forward without explanation to Webster, found the boatswain's locker and an axe, and groped his way to the forward bits. The cable went out through the fair leads, rigid as an iron bar. It must be dragging a hundred feet below the keel, impeding the ship's progress almost as much as would an anchor. 
It took three sharp blows with the axe before the severed end vanished over the bow. As he made his way aft, Eldridge felt that the ship was free at last, no longer staggering but fairly dancing over the swells. He decided to catch a catnap in the lee of the roundhouse. After an hour, he relieved Webster at the wheel. Daybreak was late and grey, rain still falling, but Great Nicobar Island was now on the starboard quarter. Webster came out of the roundhouse and touched his forehead. I recommend you change course to due west, Captain. It may give us a landfall well north of Ceylon, but it will be easy enough to coast around to Colombo. And I can't trust these chronometers since I set them. They're already two minutes out with the watch I brought to set them by. Very well. Take the wheel. He went to the break of the poop to find Sharma and the watch on deck sheltering from the rain. Hands to the braces, Sharma. The ship wore around to the west and settled on her new course. Sharma produced two Laskers who could steer a course, and one relieved the helm. Eldridge found the parcel of food on the water breakers still on deck by the gangway. He took a drink of water in a tin cup from the cask and a dollop of lime juice from the jug, blunting his hunger with biscuit, cheese, and raisins. From time to time he looked up to see how the sails drew, and then to starboard toward that island. It was now broad on the starboard beam, and a recollection struck him. And now, Webster, suppose you commence teaching me how to navigate a ship. Aye, aye, sir. You might just take a bearing on Great Nicobar, sir, and if she bears due north, as I think she does now, right in the log. Webster paused to extract the big silver watch from his pocket. Seven hours, ten minutes anti-meridium, local time. Took departure, southern tip of Great Nicobar Island, bearing due north, distance four miles, course west, making good five knots. Eldridge headed for the roundhouse. It was a small step, but in the right direction. Chapter 7 Merriweather took another reading from the boat compass. The Indiaman was going to leeward much faster than Comet or Rapid, and the distance had widened appreciably. He wondered again at the shot he had heard, and hoped that Eldridge had survived to get some sail set. The squall had struck gusts of wind picking up spume from the wave crests and hurling the salt taste mixed with rain into his face. A dark shape with pinpricks of light loomed ahead, and he thought of the orders he must give tonight for the next phase of the operation. Steer for Comet, he told the coxswain. Macrae had not been informed of the fresh intelligence Wolfe had supplied this afternoon, and a brief council of war would be helpful. A quarter hour later, Macrae said flatly, I don't put much stock in information given to escape torture. He turned to the chart spread on his desk. And why Kopuket as a rendezvous unless it just happens to be the point that's dead in the eye of the wind? It's either a long reach north away from the shipping lanes or a longer harder reach through the strait before he could hope to be able to run down to it. I just don't believe it. Diamond Point on Sumatra right opposite Penang would be more logical if those Frenchmen actually plan a rendezvous which I doubt. It was nearly the longest speech Merriweather had ever heard the little Scots officer deliver. Macrae remained standing, leaning over his desk, hands flat on either margin of the chart, the eye with the cast in it focusing almost straight as his gaze bored into Merriweather's. It was the officer in tactical command's sole responsibility to evaluate the intelligence Wolfer produced, but if he were wrong, the consequences would likewise be his alone. Still, there was no profit in a cruiser making a long reach north away from the shipping lanes merely to conclude a rendezvous. The date, a week hence, was persuasive. It would roughly mark the midpoint of a normal privateering venture based upon the information supplied by Ross in the Cocos Islands two months ago. Then again, those Frenchmen rarely acted in concert, 
as witness the fact that they had refused assistance to Majeur in salvaging the Indiaman, if her captain could be believed at all. What you say is logical, Macrae. Merriweather shifted in the chair, uncrossing his legs, breaking the spell of Macrae's gaze, and he sat back down behind the desk. But in addition to the torture, the man had some motive, resentment, if nothing more, to betray his consorts. He had already lost his own ship and prize, and misery loves company. He thought a moment. And if three cruisers did show up at the rendezvous, there would be a good chance that we might be taken, and the captain rescued, which would be little enough comfort for a man who has lost his own ship and a prize that would have made him wealthy for life. I tell you, captain, the thing does not ring true. Merriweather had never before heard such conviction in Macrae's voice, and he wondered for a moment if the man might possess the fabled Celtic gift of second sight. By nature, Merriweather disliked compromise. While it might be easier, there was no overwhelming reason to make his reach to the north through untravelled waters, when he could possibly make enough easting by running back down the strait past Penang and he would again be in the small end of the horn. Very well, Macrae, you are most convincing. I'll send Dillon on north with the prize, and we will go back southeast through the strait. But I do intend to look in on Ko Phuket before the week is out. On deck, he found the squall had passed, wind and rain abating, and he entered the launch again to pull over to Majeur. He gave Dillon a tall, broad, calm man his orders, spoke briefly to Whitfield, made sure the prize was in capable hands before parting company, and came back on board rapid. He was so weary he thought he would drop, but he remained on deck until he was sure the prize was moving, then signalled Comet to get under way. Dr. Buttram intercepted Merriweather on his way below. Sir, I need to talk again with you. Certainly. Merriweather pulled off his soaked clothing, rubbed himself dry, and shrugged into the silk gown he had brought back from Canton last fall. The tea Sang had prepared was hot and comforting. I told you this afternoon I'd discuss the matter of Kinney's death, or rather some events preceding it, further with you. Yes, Merriweather said, and I must mark the place in the prayer book for the service in the morning. You saw his head continued Buttram inexorably, shaved to the bare skin. Yes, but only in passing, an hour or so before he was wounded. It was done yesterday morning by that servant of Wolf's, but at his direction. Why, in heaven's name? It seems, said Buttram slowly, that Captain Wolf was convinced the boy was infested with lice or some other kind of vermin. I examined him three times in the past week and found nothing, though I did give him an ointment just in case. This morning, as I understand the matter, Wolf called the boy to his room and had Dyer shave the hair off his head. Kinney was terribly upset, though he went about his duties as usual. Merriweather recalled Wolf's reaction to the news of Kinney's death this afternoon. How did he happen to be on the main deck anyway? He was assigned there to observe the time it took for powder charges to come up from the magazine to the guns. I have his notes. They were still clutched in his hand when he was carried into the cockpit. Buttram handed Merriweather a foolscap sheet. Well, I'm damned. Merriweather looked at the cryptic figures. Only two broadsides. I'm afraid we didn't give him much to work with. It's beside the point, Buttram continued. Legitimate enough information, I dare say, if one is inspecting the state of readiness of a warship. The point I am making is... Wolf is insane. I believe you tended toward that opinion in our last discussion. Yes, but now I am ready to certify him, said Buttram in a high, strained tone. Merriweather sat silent a moment, then said deliberately, Doctor, Wolf will make a fool of you. He is entirely normal in his appearance and could make a convincing and logical explanation of any of the actions you relied on. 
A flat assertion that he saw lice in Kinney's hair would outweigh your negative statement. True, he was drunk once, but no harm resulted. His attack on the Malays was merely an impetuous act of valour. We have no evidence as to the matters of the woman and the cat. Now what else have you? Great balls of fire! exploded Buttram, leaping to his feet, face livid. You've become a sea lawyer! I'm not, and sit down, Doctor. I am only stating how the matter would appear to a disinterested person. Wolf is in this ship under orders as an observer for the Royal Navy. I can require him to conform to reasonable rules of conduct which I did in the matter of the wine, but, legally, he is not under my command. But I conceive my authority is limited to an order to leave the ship. A thought struck him, and Merriweather asked, What was wrong with that French captain? That is another thing. The man had the joints of two fingers crushed in such a manner as to damage the nerves and cause intense agony. I've read about the device, a trick brought to Spain by the Moors and then refined by the Inquisition. The pain was insupportable. Gangrene a certainty because of the destruction of circulation, so I had to amputate both fingers. Luckily, it was the left hand. Buttram shook his head. Merriweather told himself in disgust that he shared the guilt of Wolf's barbarity, had condoned the matter after the fact, and intended to act ultimately upon the intelligence produced by the torture, though it violated the conventions of war. He dissembled and a subdued Buttram took his leave as Merriweather retired to roll and toss halfway through the mid-watch, dreading the coming morning and the burial service for Kinney. It was slow going. The wind had drawn almost east after the unsettled weather becoming light and variable in the process. It took two days to cover the distance from Great Nicobar to a position where a blue smudge on the horizon indicated a landfall on Diamond Point. Merriweather wished a dozen times that he had disregarded Macrae and made the easier reach north. But he had developed an almost superstitious belief that he would find the French at the point Macrae had mentioned. Wolfe had appeared on deck in full uniform just before the committal services for Kinney yesterday morning, looked at the compass, and then at Merriweather, a reach north would have been easier, Commodore, he had said. You may be cutting this damn fine. Five days yet, Merriweather replied, but I cover the narrow seas again as well. True, said Wolfe more pleasantly, and it is a matter upon which reasonable minds may differ. He had paused and looked down at the waist where the hands were beginning to gather in response to the word the boatswain's mates were shouting down the companionways. And Commodore, would you mind if I read the service for poor Kinney? It would be a comfort to be able to say as much in the letter I shall write to his mother and father. Why, not at all, Captain, said the startled Merriweather. I should have made the suggestion myself. Wolfe made a surprisingly professional affair of the service, his voice sounding out as he read the prayers with sonorous grace over the bare heads of the crew. Comet was hove to on the starboard beam, her hands ranged along the side, flag at half-mast. The plank tilted, and the canvas-shrouded bodies slid from under the red ensign into the sea. Hats on! Larkin looked to Merriweather for permission to dismiss. Just a moment. Merriweather, during his last commission, had made a custom of announcing promotions after a burial at sea. Two boatswain's mates had been temporarily promoted and transferred, and the boatswain had recommended that Lyle, Coxon for the launch, and Briggs for Topman to be given temporary ratings. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the articles for the government of the Bombay Marine, I hereby rate Lyle and Briggs to be boatswain's mates for the time being. You may dismiss the hands, Mr. Larkin. Wolf had been standing by, prayer book still in hand. You read an impressive service, Captain, Merriweather told him. The words are in the Book of Common Prayer, said Wolf, looking a little embarrassed. 
but I read them with a full heart. But I have another headache. I must get a potion from Buttram. The man was a perfect enigma, Merriweather thought, as he watched him go below. Now there was that distant cloud on the horizon that Dobbs insisted must be Diamond Point, the sun already up and hot and the wind shifting again almost northeast. It was inspection day for Rapid, and Merriweather followed Larkin, Tompkins and the gunner along the weather decks, examining standing and running rigging, the boats, catted anchors, the pumps, and main capstan before looking at the polished brass of the guns. You might consider using chafing gear when you replace those lines, Mr. Tompkins. That main topsail brace seems to cut like a saw. The bosun made a note. Otherwise, a very good topside inspection. The party filed below to be met by Dr. Buttram, the purser and the carpenter. The two shot holes had been sawed square, plugged, corked and painted. The galley was clean, kettles and pots gleaming, knives and cleavers hung neatly in their places. The party progressed on into the sick bay and then the cockpit, both scrubbed spotless. The cooper joined the group and they went down to the hold to inspect water casks and the victual storerooms, sweat beginning to drip from Merriweather's chin here in the bowels of the ship. Sir! At the top of the ladder a head appeared, and Merriweather recognised Hamlin's voice. All right. Sir, sail's bearing about northeast. Mr. McCamey thinks two ships are chasing a third. Merriweather pondered the situation. Rapid's course was already southeast as close hauled as she would lie, and Diamond Point was almost dead ahead. There was no reason to alter course at this time with so little information. Very well. Tell Mr. McCamey to hold on and signal the sighting to Comet if she hasn't already seen them herself. He went on behind the Doctor, Cooper and Purser to thump casks, make sure they were full and properly secured with enough dunnage to hold them against any roll or pitch the ship might make. Impatience surged up. He chafed to be on deck, but compelled himself to follow through the routine for another half hour until he could terminate the inspections as fully completed. Very good. I am pleased with our state of readiness, he told the group as it finally came back to the main deck. A few repairs and corrections are yet to be made, but on the whole, very good. He forced himself to climb the ladder deliberately. On deck, nothing seemed to have changed. The ship was still close-hauled on the port tack, heading southeast, diamond point still an indistinct blur ahead. He could see nothing from the deck of the sails reported, but Mr. McCamey came rolling over in his round-shouldered gait to report the targets were apparently headed southeast also. Merriweather looked at the signal log saw Comet's acknowledgement of the message and invited Larkin and Buttram below for tea. He saw Wolf emerge on deck and on impulse extended the invitation to him. The burial service yesterday had exposed a facet of the man he had not suspected. Half an hour later, he could restrain himself no longer and took the glass to the main top. He found the targets but could make no more of them than had already been reported. There did appear to be three, all presenting their sterns to him, their masts almost in line, so that he could not even determine whether they were ships or schooners. One appeared much smaller, but whether it was smaller or merely more distant he could not tell from this angle. They appeared to be comfortably weathering Diamond Point, and he came back down to go in the cubbyhole with Dobbs and make sure his own course would do the same. Damnation! he grumbled to Dobbs as they emerged. Except we need the easting, this may be another water haul. I don't think we've gained an inch, and if we did come up with them, they'd probably be country ships at that. Well, sir, I doubt it. They appear to be sailing right smartly. The morning wore on, the breeze slackening the sun, an intolerably bright brass disc in a cloudless sky. Merriweather had found a bit of shade cast by the mizzen topsail against the starboard rail and remained there, his shirt sticking to his back. 
Sang brought up a bite of lunch and cold tea laced with lime juice. The last cast of the log had indicated less than four knots, and the targets were not yet in sight from the deck, though Diamond Point was now distinctly outlined off the starboard bow. Larkin relieved McCamey for the afternoon watch and came over to discuss the situation. Merriweather was a bit short with him and then despised himself. Larkin found his own spot of shade. This had been a frustrating operation, now over a month old, with one privateer and an infected India man to show for it. Somehow, he had thought he would sweep clear the Bay of Bengal and capture or destroy the enemy in short order. He had understood the immensity of the area in which the cruisers could operate, but his plan to seek them in the shipping lanes, the narrow seas, and the small end of the horn had appeared sound and in fact he could yet perceive no defect in it. Possibly those sails up ahead were French, but the odds were against it. Depression settled upon Merriweather as it had before his first visit to Penang. He was even now risking his career in the face of Wolfe's positive intelligence coming back southeast at the illogical insistence of Macrae when he should have gone north. Cutting it damn fine, Wolfe had said yesterday morning. Merriweather wondered if he would ever rest easily as a commander, and wished for a moment that he was still a first lieutenant, responsible for no more than the efficient internal workings and discipline of a single ship, while the lofty captain made the decisions. He had spent two reasonably happy years in that estate before he was catapulted into command of a ship, and now he found himself charged with a mission beyond his abilities, he told himself and with the Royal Navy peering over his shoulder to observe and document his downfall. He was in a blue funk, doubting and pitying himself. He shrugged his shoulders, as though to dislodge the demon perched upon his back and tried to think of a more cheerful subject. He had sent Aldridge and Dr. Keyes, along with that ruined gentleman Webster, to risk death in the Duchy of Lancaster, in an attempt to take the pest ship a thousand odd miles to safety for the benefit of the company. He remembered Eldridge, young and keen though uneducated, and his cynical appeal to the man's ambition with a temporary appointment to warrant rank. His conscience did not trouble him so much as to Keyes and Webster. They knew their chances. But he had sent the party to carry out a mission he would have shrunk from himself. Cold steel and gunfire he could understand and face. Pestilence, deliberately courted, was another matter. He wondered again at the shot he had heard as the boat pulled away from the Indiaman, and hoped Eldridge survived. Hell's bells, this train of thought was no better than the last. He tried to think of Lady Caroline, but her image blurred in his mind somehow overlaid with that of the other widow, Kate Hartley at Penang. She had connived with Livy Raffles to use him, agreeable as the matter had been, but he still felt a touch of resentment at the assurance with which these two females had manipulated him. Deck there! Two ships hold their wind! The hell from the masthead brought him back to the present with a jerk. What course? shouted Merriweather, diverted from his bitter thoughts. There was a pause, then. Looks about north-northwest, sir. There was another appreciable interval, then. Sail ho! Broad on the port bow! Merriweather could stand the suspense no longer. There was too much activity on the horizon. He snatched up the glass and went into the rigging to see for himself. At the main trucks he braced himself and sought the targets. There was no doubt now. They both were large schooners, almost the mates of Comet. They were now on the starboard tack headed almost north-northwest. Beyond them he could see a sail, still headed southeast, some kind of a small country trader scuttling to safety. He shifted the glass and picked up the fourth sail well to the east of the schooners. She was shipwrecked, and the cut of her sails was unmistakable. 
She must be the Royal Navy sloop Argus he had seen refitting at Penang, with Captain Ackroyd about to make contact with potential prizes. She was in a favourable position, holding the weather gauge on the schooners, while Rapid and Comet were far to leeward of the course they were now making good. Even as he watched, the sloop's shape altered slightly and she headed to intercept the privateers. It was a fluid situation, and Merriweather struggled to come to a decision. There was a bare chance that if Comet went about now, she might, with her superior windward qualities, just intercept the schooners. And unless the sloop was close enough by then, she might very well be overwhelmed by superior force. On the other hand, the Frenchman could wear about at any time and go back southeast without hindrance. The sloop would be much more valuable to windward and astern of the enemy while Rapid and Comet attempted the interception. But there was no way to order her there, even if a Royal Navy captain would obey a signal from the Bombay Marine. His action might be misinterpreted, but it was essential to prevent the doubling back of the cruisers when they saw their escape northwestwardly cut off. Someone must plug that avenue of escape. Signals! he shouted down. Hamlin raised his face far below, slate in hand. To Comet! Engage the enemy! He saw Dobbs looking up expectantly, the hands already poised at the braces in anticipation of the command to go about. Execute! he told Hamlin, coming to the deck, and to Dobbs. Steady as you go. Comet came to the wind and went about alertly on the starboard tack. Merriweather knew McCrae, with his passion for navigation, would set the best possible course for the interception. He consoled himself with the fact that Comet carried ten eighteen-pounders, and had added two long nine pivot guns last month at Calcutta. Rapid plunged on southeastwardly as close-hauled as she would lie, diamond point still almost dead ahead. All the vessels were now visible from the deck, the schooners hull up but dead to windward. Comet was well ahead of them but still to leeward, slanting toward a point of intersection of their course to the northwest. The sloop was to windward of the targets, also aiming toward a theoretical point of interception, while Rapid thrashed on southeastwardly, striving to reach a position where she might shut off the open avenue of escape in that direction. It was mid-afternoon, and the pitch was literally bubbling in the seams of the deck under the pitiless glare of the sun. Wolf was on deck in his shirt, a wetted blue kerchief tied about his head, but he made no comment on the situation. There came a flaw in the breeze, and Dobbs ordered the helm over to starboard, gaining a few yards to windward by the manoeuvre. Merriweather took another bearing on the schooners. He was not yet in a position where he could go about and join in the chase. It was still possible for the schooners to pass to windward of him if they decided to go about. Nothing to do but hold on, fighting for every yard to windward gained. He came back to his bit of shade and thankfully drank the cool cup of water that Sang offered him. Well, Captain, he had commenced to wolf when the shout from the masthead interrupted. He looked aft and saw the schooners turning together, their profiles visible for a moment, then narrowing again as they came almost bows on. The movement had been beautifully timed. A few minutes more, and both the sloop and comet would have been in position to cut them off. Now they had nothing more than a stern chase, and Merriweather feared he could not get far enough to windward in time to interfere with their escape. Still, there was a chance he might be able to make contact with them, what with the flaws in the wind that Dobbs was alertly taking advantage of to gain every inch to windward. Merriweather took the time to examine the schooners carefully through his glass. They were beautiful examples of the Yankee shipbuilder's art, built fast enough to catch almost any other vessel or run away from frigates or sloops, and yet carry sufficient armament to make them most formidable to a ship as lightly armed as rapid. That young republic, though officially neutral, could not resist the opportunity to give the old British lion's tail a twist, 
even though it were by proxy. Merriweather took the glass away from his eye. Send the hands to quarters, Mr. Dobbs. The sound of the drum and shrill of whistles erupted, precipitating a flurry of disciplined confusion. Nearly every man had been on deck sightseeing in anticipation of the order. All stations manned and ready, Dobbs soon reported. God damn, said Wolf. Any fool could have foreseen that. All Argus had to do was hold the weather gauge on their quarter, not try to intercept, and we would have had them. Merriweather was startled at the outburst, but for once he could agree with Wolf without reservation. He went back to the binnacle and confirmed the bearing. There was yet a bare chance he could throw Rapid across the enemy's course and cripple or interfere with them enough to give time for Comet and Argus to come up. Larkin commanded the starboard battery and customarily remained forward at the pivot gun, thus making the widest possible separation of first lieutenant and captain. It was a sensible precaution, minimizing the possibility of the loss of both in a single broadside. Merriweather went forward, greeting the gun captains in the starboard battery by name as he passed, to join Larkin on the forecastle. He looked at Diamond Point, still almost dead ahead, and then back at the French, holding on as close hold as they would lie, hoping to pass to windward of Rapid. He took time to look at the sight mounted on the long nine-pounder pivot gun with its measured scales for elevation and deflection. The invention of his old first lieutenant McClellan and hoped the bill for a hundred pounds he had drawn on Bombay Castle last year in payment had been honoured. Larkin, last year McClellan overloaded the aftergun, a charge and a half as I remember it. Do you think you could risk the same? Larkin's pale blue eyes sparkled. Of course, sir. The gun may jump in her track, but I don't believe it will burst. I'll try it. He turned to Totten, the gunner's mate. See if we have cartridges made up with half loads for saluting and bring up a dozen for each gun in copper buckets with lids. Totten and his striker headed below for the magazine while Merriweather strolled aft, speaking to the port gun crews as he passed. At the binnacle, he took another bearing on the schooners. By God, they had drawn a quarter of a point to starboard from dead astern. He was to windward at last, however small the advantage might be. Unless there was an appreciable shift in the wind, the French could not now weather Diamond Point without first coming to grips with Rapid. McRae was almost three miles dead astern of the cruisers, every sail set, while the slower sloop was farther behind and well to the east. There came another minute flaw in the breeze, and Dobbs snapped out his order to the helm. A few more yards gained to windward. Mr. McKamey, I'd be obliged if you would exchange stations with Mr. Larkin for a bit. McKamey silently touched his hat and rolled forward. Larkin and Totten critically examined the shot in the rack, finally selecting a half-dozen of the roundest with no visible imperfections. The powder charge, plus a half cartridge, went down the bore, followed by a wad, the ball, and another wad. Don't prime it yet, Larkin cautioned the gunner's mate, looking astern. The nearest of the schooners must be a mile and a half away and gaining on rapid. He checked the bearing of Diamond Point again. He could still weather it, but it would be an extremely close matter for the Frenchman. Buttram and Davis, dripping with sweat, came on deck from the cockpit to observe the situation, then hurried back to their station when the word was passed for both batteries to load and run out their guns. Wolf had belted on his sword, pistol butts now protruding from his waistband. Sang brought up his sword and the pair of double-barreled pistols, and Merriweather told him to lay them beside the skylight. Too soon to burden himself with their weight, he told himself, it was already an hour into the first dog watch, and the sun was setting on the starboard quarter, outlining the sails of the privateers. There might be a land breeze after sunset to help edge them out, he thought, as impatience boiled up. If you don't mind, Captain, said Larkin, I'll try a ranging shot now. 
A quill was inserted in the touch hole. Priming a powder trickled from the horn. The lock was cocked and Larkin set the sight at extreme elevation and a quarter of the way to the left on the deflection scale. He squatted behind the gun, peering through the sights, adjusting the coin, then directing the rotation of the platform to correct the train. Mark and lock. All clear. The crew scattered to either side and turned their backs as Larkin stepped off the platform, paused a moment as the stern rose gently on a swell, and twitched the lanyard. The report was excessively unpleasant. The gun recoiled violently and leaped six inches into the air as the tackles checked it. But it did not jump its track, Merriweather was thankful to see as he shifted his gaze to the cruiser. The splash appeared to be right under her bow. On her forecastle, he could see a group gathered about a gun now trained out toward Rapid. A little left and a little short, he called to Larkin. The crew was already swabbing out, and the new charge went down the bore. Larkin moved the sight a notch to the right on the deflection scale. Loaded, primed and cocked, sang out Totten. There was a tiny adjustment made in the train, and the gun blasted out again. Merriweather caught the hit in the field of his glass, apparently right on the carriage of the bow chaser on the cruiser's forecastle. The gun was on its side. Half a dozen men sprawled on the deck about it. Good shot. You've disabled their bow chaser, but try to hit a little more aft, spars or rigging if you can. Larkin made another minute adjustment of the sight and the gun was heaved back to battery. Merriweather thought of the contrast between the methodical McClellan with his over, under and half the distance system of laying a gun to find a target and the intuitive corrections that Larkin applied. The long nine fired again, and Merriweather could see no sign of the fall of shot. Either it was just over, or had hit the hull. He had started to take the glass from his eye when he caught motion in his field of view. The square-rigged foretop hamper was bending down to leeward as the gaff fell, collapsing the foresail. The jibs and forestaysail, cut loose at the top, blew over the bow to drag underfoot. The shot must have hit right at the truss bands of the foretopmast, cutting halyards and forestays and wreaking damage that would take hours, if not days, to repair. Well done, Mr. Larkin! shouted Merriweather, and a cheer erupted from the hands, capering at their stations. The schooner fell behind, now almost dead in the water as the second privateer pressed on, leaving her crippled consort behind. Merriweather wondered what her next manoeuvre would be, with Diamond Point now looming dead ahead. He was tempted to close the distance, but his windward position had been too hard won, and if he came closer, there was a possibility that the enemy with her handier rig might slide by him to escape. Here the coast of Sumatra slanted back to the northwest from Diamond Point before it again trended out to the northeast to form a wide sound. Once the ship had penetrated to any great distance, it would be on a lee shore with a long laborious beat to windward to escape it. The cruiser had the choice of making the turn back to the northwest and spinning out the chase a little longer, with a chance of escape in the dark, or of trying to force its way past Rapid to weather Diamond Point. Why don't you close on him? demanded Wolf. Merriweather was too concerned with the situation to feel irritation, watching the other ship for the first tell-tale indication of her intentions. He saw her rudder kick over, hands tailing onto the braces controlling the square topsail, and had opened his mouth to give the order to his own helm when some instinct halted him. The schooner's rudder came back midships. The topsails were trimmed back and she plunged ahead on her original course. It had been a feint, designed to lure Rapid into a turn that would have lost just enough ground for the enemy to make his escape. There's your answer, he told Wolf absently. The die was cast. The enemy intended to fight its way past Rapid. Comet was still almost three miles behind and gaining slowly. But if that privateer could shoot away a spar and cripple Rapid, she had little chance of coming up in time. 
The sloop had abandoned the chase and was approaching the other cruiser, already hoisting out her boats to take possession of the prize. The boatswain's mates were hanging up battle lanterns, dim enough in the light remaining, but necessary to light the stations as darkness fell. The two vessels were slanting toward a point of intersection not far ahead. You may fire when ready, he called forward to Larkin. It was still too far, even for the long nine, but the range was lessening. The Frenchman held on. He could not afford to sag off any farther toward the land if he were to retain any chance of weathering the point. Merriweather looked through the glass again. The schooner's decks were crowded with men. Evidently, she had not yet furnished any prize crews and carried her original complement. The forward pivot blasted out, making him jump, but he could not make out the fall of shot. The aftergun fired and he saw the hole appear in the schooner's mainsail, but no crippling damage. Larkin came down the starboard battery, conferring briefly with each gun captain. Comet was coming, but it was up to Rapid to stop the enemy at this juncture. The starboard battery was trained around as far as it could point, the guns at maximum elevation. Merriweather saw the orange glow of the privateer's broadside and heard one shot howl overhead. But the splashes of the other balls were nearly a cable's length to starboard. Both pivot guns fired again, but he could see no effect. Less than half a mile now, he judged, and closing rapidly. Starboard battery, fire! came the command from Larkin. The smoke went down in a solid cloud, obscuring the enemy. There was disciplined activity along the deck as gun crews reloaded and hauled the pieces back to battery. Every gun captain was looking forward to Larkin, who stood holding his hand up, gazing at the enemy. Half elevation, he called, and coins were knocked in. Fire! The broadside blasted out, and the red-orange glare blinded Merriweather momentarily. When the smoke blew clear, he saw the schooner still coming, her flying jib blowing free and gaps in her bulwarks but undaunted. She fired her broadside again and there was a crash right beside him as a ball came through the bulwark and shattered the skylight. Rapid's third broadside exploded, and over the smoke Merriweather saw the spars of the schooner only a few hundred feet away. The enemy, he realized, was giving him the choice of being rammed or of letting the schooner pass. That captain was no poltroon. The battery was run out again. He heard the word grape shot pass down a moment ago, and the sound of the guns was deeper this time. Grape on top of a round shot at this range should be deadly, but the spars were still visible above the smoke, undamaged. If both ships held on, they would come together a cable's length ahead, he calculated, or the Frenchman conceivably could turn a stir of him at the last moment. He held on watching intently for the first sign that would indicate the schooner's intention. The privateer fired again, and there was a horrendous crash aloft. He saw the main topmast sway halfway up its height, then hung for a moment, supported by its shrouds. Heads up! he shouted forward as the hands amidships scattered. There was another rending crack, and the mast parted. The port shrouds held it momentarily against the pressure of the wind, then the whole upper works, half the topmast with the royal mast and pole above it, came straight down, the splintered butt smashing through the pin rail and penetrating the deck beside the mainmast. There was a tangle of shrouds and canvas above, caught over the stump of the topmast that momentarily held the wreckage upright. Four marines assigned to the main top had come down with it, and they came sliding and jumping out of the wreckage to reach the deck. Top men! shouted Merriweather. Get a turn around that mast! If he could get lines secured about the wreckage and the stump of the topmast to hold it upright, he might yet be able to work the ship. He saw Lyle, boatswain's mate, and Briggs' top man, his most recent promotions, climbing into the tangled mess, even as he heard Larkin's command of the starboard battery. 
the gunners, ignoring the risk of being crushed by the precariously balanced mast, ran back to their guns, and the broadside flamed out grape shot at point blank range. Port your helm! called Merriweather, not taking time to observe the effects of the broadside. He looked up. The shattered mast still held upright, and the men were now throwing hitches into a length of cable that encircled the fallen topmast and the lower mast. Sails on the fore and mizzen masts were still drawing, and the ship was closing toward the Frenchman. Grabnolls! Grabnolls! he shouted forward and saw Mr. Tompkins and three of his mates already poised to throw. Thank God for the drills and training this past year. Rapid's bow was swinging to starboard, but the privateer was moving faster, her stern already opposite him at the break of the poop. Even as he watched, he saw her rudder go over to starboard, white foam visible under her counter in the last bit of light as she turned downwind. It was his last chance. He could never catch her. She would pull away a bit and then turn back to weather Diamond Point. Throw! Throw! he shouted in desperation. With the swing of the bow of Rapid and the turn downwind of the schooner, the distance was less than a hundred feet, but it would widen in seconds as she settled before the wind. It was a long heave for an iron grapnel attached to a six-foot length of chain. The four men swung the grapnels like slings, then released them almost simultaneously in high arcs. Two fell short by yards, one hit the stern quarter of the schooner and bounced back into the sea. The fourth sailed right over the taffrail, and the seaman jerked the line to set the points in the rail, then took a double turn about the forward bits. Merriweather prayed that the workmanship of those Yankee shipbuilders had been honest, that that rail would hold and that the hemp in that slender line was sound. Midships, he told the quartermaster to take some of the strain off the line. It was almost black dark now, but by the forward battle lantern he saw the men retrieving their grapnels and throwing again. Two of them apparently made connection and were snubbed to the bits. The schooner would not run away now. Men with axes and lanterns appeared on the stern of the privateer, striking and prying at the embedded grapnels and slashing at the chain lengths. Merriweather opened his mouth to shout the order, then heard the musket volley follow Gunny's command. The men on the poop fell, and the three threads of hemp stretched tight as fiddle strings. The helmsman! shouted Merriweather. The marines in the foretop fired and in a moment the schooner's rudder slammed to port under the pressure to leeward. The schooner, her rudder jammed hard over, came about, heading into the wind as rapid of necessity followed suit. It was as though he had hold of the tail of a tiger, he thought, just before the port battery of the privateer erupted in a ragged broadside, as her guns bore for a moment before rapid sagged away astern. There were hits forward, leaving the foot of the flying jib flying loose with the forestay severed. There had been solid hits in the hull as well, Merriweather realized, but there were more urgent matters to deal with. The schooner's backed topsails were giving her sternway, and she was coming down on Rapid's bow. In a moment, the ships would come together, and the men he had seen on the privateer's deck would swarm over the side to board him. The forward pivot gun blasted out, its orange flame lighting the stern of the enemy. He could not see the effect of the shot in the darkness as the acrid powder smoke blew aft. No other gun would bear, but the marines were keeping up a steady fire with their muskets from the foretop and forecastle. Repel boarders! Merriweather shouted for it, and heard the cry echoed along the deck as the men seized cutlasses and pikes from the racks at the base of each mast. He tried to find his pistols and sword where he had laid them beside the shattered skylight, but could not put his hands upon them. He straightened up, looking out to port, but he could see no sign of comet in the darkness. He groped again and touched the polished wood of one of the pistols, then abandoned the search for his sword to snatch a cutlass from the rack at the mizzenmast before running forward. 
the poop of the schooner was almost against the starboard bow. There was a continuous banging of muskets and popping of pistols now from the decks of both ships, but no one could see much in the darkness to aim at. The ships came together with a grinding crash, and a cheer went up from the Frenchman, echoed a moment later from Rapid. Merriweather gained the forecastle, where the marine detachment was drawn up in a double line with bayonets fixed. There was a moment of hiatus. Both ships suddenly silent as though time had been suspended, while enemy peered through darkness at adversary across a narrow gap. Then the ships came together again with a screech of wood rubbing against wood, and the spell was broken. A shout came up from the privateer, and a mass of men rushed across her poop to pour into rapid. Hit them! Merriweather roared. The marines volley knocked down the leaders but the rest of the invaders met the party from the waist led by the boatswain and McCamey head on. Merriweather found himself on the forecastle in the gap between the marines and the wasters, and slashed at a face in the dim light of the battle lanterns burning in the rigging, then drove his cutlass into the mass of bodies pressing forward. He felt it penetrate, but it was wrenched from his hand as the man fell. He found himself pinned momentarily against the forecastle railing, and while he pulled the pistol from his belt, he looked to the right to see Wolf driving forward, his sword a flicker of light as he mercilessly cut his way into the boarding party. The man was an absolute marvel with the sword, he thought, as he got the pistol loose to fire one barrel after the other into the enemy. Two men fell, making a little space, and the Marines surged forward with bayonets. Merriweather gave a wordless shout of encouragement to the men and realized that he was unarmed, cutlass lost, pistol empty. He saw the gleam of a cutlass lying loose on the deck, and bent to snatch it up. Too late, he saw the Frenchman driving the pike down at him and tried desperately to twist aside. Someone came between them, deflecting the pike with a sword, then deftly driving the blade through the man. He regained his feet, cutlass in hand, and realized that Wolf had been his benefactor. Thank you, Wolf, he shouted, and charged back into the melee. Wolf continued his attack, using his sword with the detached finesse of the expert. A Frenchman sidled to the left out of Wolf's sight and aimed a pistol at him. Merriweather had only an instant to slash the cutlass backhanded and upward, feeling the edge bite into bone in the man's forearm and saw the pistol fly into the air as it discharged. Much obliged, Captain! Wolf shouted over his shoulder as he pressed forward again. The man had been unpleasant, was possibly even insane, as Buttram insisted. His judgment had been poor on occasion. He was cruel and ruthless, but his courage could not be questioned. He had owed his life to Wolf, but now they were quits the debt repaid. Merriweather turned back to the fight and saw the sails close aboard to port. Comet came grinding along the port bow and a flood of men poured onto Rapid's forecastle led by little McCrae with a pike longer than he was. The reinforcements swept the boarders from the deck, driving them back into the privateer, then joined with Rapid's men to pursue them up the deck of the Frenchman. There were cries for quarter, and in a few minutes... The cruiser had struck her colours. Merriweather accepted the surrender from a tearful, dark young second lieutenant, with Gunny serving as interpreter. The schooner's captain was dead, killed by a musket ball as he stood by the helm, and the first lieutenant was down at the cockpit with a foot mangled by grape shot. Well, said McCrae, looking about the deck in the yellow lantern light. I don't like the smell of this at all. What do you mean? That there are more men below than on deck. Of course the marines are flushing them out, and the gunner and his mates have control of the magazine and armoury, but I suggest a search be made from the bilges to the cross-trees for arms. I would expect an attempt to retake the ship. Merriweather paused a moment. 
He had acquired an almost superstitious respect for the perception McCrae possessed since his prediction of finding the cruisers off Diamond Point had so uncannily proved out. I intend to order Larkin into her as prize master and send Gunny with all the Marines as a guard. We will make the search, of course. Do you have a junior officer you can spare to be second in command? No, sir. I have only two watchkeeping officers on board since Dylan took command of the first prize. But if you'll consider him, I have a crackerjack quartermaster. McPhee's his name. Served his apprenticeship in the Herring Fleet out of Malig. A distant cousin of mine, too. If you say so, I'll issue an acting warrant as master's mate to him. Better make it bosun, Commodore. Very well. And now, if you will look after matters here for a bit, I'll send Larkin over to take command. I don't know how badly Rapid is damaged yet, but I'm afraid that main topmast wreckage will fall any minute. One thing more, said McRae slowly. That sloop abandoned the chase and took the prize you crippled. Of course it makes no difference. We were all in sight and share the prize money. But it was in a better position to come up with you than I was. Quite right, replied Merriweather, wondering how much weight it would carry with Pellew. I intend to cover the matter in my report. He made his way wearily back to Rapid and came down into the waist listening to the rhythmic thump of the pumps, to meet the carpenter coming forward. She's old twice in the starboard bow, right to the waterline, sir. I've stopped the leaks for the time, but she took on a good bit of water first, the carpenter reported, wiping the sweat from his face. No other damage to the hull, except where the deck is holed by the butt of the topmast. And your cabin is a mare's nest, Captain. Glass and splinters all over. A party was aloft in the wreckage with lanterns, dismantling the rigging and sending down the yards. The sails had been cut loose, reducing the wind pressure against the wreckage, and several additional turns of cable now secured the royal mast upright against the mainmast. Merriweather could not see the boatswain in the group, which seemed to be under the direction of Bowman, now the senior boatswain's mate, with Larkin standing by. "'Where's Mr. Tompkins?' inquired Merriweather. Wounded, sir, said Bowman, keeping his eyes fixed aloft. Handsomely! Handsomely! He shouted as the royal yard revolved in the air, and then started down with a run at the end of a whip too lightly snubbed about a cleat. The hands managed to check it at the expense of the skin of their palms just before the iron-bound end struck the deck. Merriweather was in the way here, distracting the men from their work. He moved away and called Larkin. I'm sending you into the schooner as prize master, he told the tall man. McPhee from Comet is acting bosun, and I'll give you Gunny and twenty marines. Take your crew from Comet. I can't spare the hands. Do you have any report of casualties yet? Yes, sir. Three dead, fourteen wounded, including Tompkins, who has a pistol ball through his right arm. Merriweather shook his head. The butcher's bill had been more expensive than he had bargained for, and Rapid was holed and crippled as well. Get your things together and relieve McRae. As soon as the search of the prize is completed, I propose to pull the ships apart, then anchor till daylight. Aye, aye, sir. The hands have not messed yet. Very well. You go on and I'll see what we can do. He started for the ladder to the cockpit and met the purser emerging from the hatch his shirt splattered with blood. The doctor is about finished, and I thought I would see what could be scraped up for the hands. The cooks are still busy up in with the wounded, sir, reported Davis. Would you authorise an issue of rum, sir? Merriweather hesitated. Lord knew the hands deserved the treat, but he looked back at the men hanging precariously in the rigging of the mainmast and decided that he would be doing them no favour to give them rum until the wreckage was cleared. Not now, he decided. See if you can get enough biscuit and cheese in the hands of the mess cooks to satisfy them for the time being. He forced himself to make the descent to the cockpit, finding it still oppressively hot here below decks. The scene was macabre. The operating table laid across chests, its white canvas cover now glistening with blood, 
and a nauseating odour of vomit permeating the stale air. To one side was a charcoal brazier glowing with coals, the cauterizing irons thrust into them, handles protruding. A black-haired man lay on the table, head back, breathing stentorously through his open mouth as Buttram took precise stitches to close the gaping slash that extended from his right shoulder diagonally down across his chest. Two other men were seated, propped against the bulkhead, bloody rags tied about their heads. Buttram looked up quickly, then continued his work as the cook and his mate held the man still. Almost finished, Captain, said Buttram in his cheerful manner. A few more stitches here and on those two heads over there, and I'll be through. I've used the laudanum freely, so there's not much trouble holding them steady. Who were killed? Petty, sailmaker's mate, Evans, Topman, and O'Brien, ordinary seaman. Barring infection, I don't account any other wounds to be immortal. He tied the last knot and covered the wound with a bandage over the man's shoulder and then around his chest. Sang was hit by flying glass from your skylight, fifteen stitches in his face and arms, and just missed his eye. He'll be in pain for a while, but he says he can still perform duty. Doctor, when you finish here, see if they need any help in the schooner. Merriweather climbed back up the ladder to the deck, emerging with relief into the cooler night air. The cabin had been cleaned up, but half the glass panes were missing from the skylight, and it was covered with a tarpaulin. Wolf was seated on the transom, a dark bottle of Scott's whiskey beside him and a half-filled glass in his hand. Hope you don't mind, Commodore. I broke my parole. Since you have my cellar padlocked, I prevailed on Sang to get me a bottle from yours. With all that sun today, my head is throbbing. Have a dram? Merriweather felt a sense of comradeship for the captain, quite different from his feelings even this afternoon. No thanks, I have too much to do. I will have a bit of tea. On impulse, he continued, and here is the key to your locker. Sang came in, both forearms bandaged and caught plaster obscuring his forehead and the left side of his face. I'm sorry you're hurt, Sang. Please rest if you wish. That was quite an action, Commodore, Wolf said. It really was touch and go whether you would be able to intercept that cruiser. And the whole affair was so unnecessary. If Argus had only held the weather gauge when the French first turned north, cutting off their escape... You and Comet could have run them down much sooner. That boy Dobbs did a magnificent job of working this ship to windward enough to make the interception, too. I quite enjoyed the fight on deck, and I must say, you have as well-trained a crew as that of any Royal Navy ship I have seen. Merriweather, surprised and grateful, wondered, too, if the Scots whiskey had inspired this flow of praise. Your performance was above and beyond the call of duty also, Captain. One other thing, growled Wolf. The Admiralty gave Calder a court of inquiry last year for stopping to take prizes and not following up on his interception of Villeneuve, and he had bad weather to excuse him. I shall see that the action of Argus this afternoon is brought to the attention of authority. Merriweather agreed with the statement, but said only, I must be on deck. Mr. Tompkins was on the scene, his weathered face pale and drawn under the tan and his splinted right arm in a sling. I'm sorry, Tompkins. No need for you here. Nothing serious, Captain. The ball broke both bones when it passed through, and I am a little weak in the knees, but I want to see these masts down so we can rig the mainsail. Set some staysails above it and work the ship halfway decent. The pole had been detached from the royal mast and lowered, and the hands were commencing the ticklish task of separating the royal mast from the shattered topmast. Tompkins continued, I oversaw the re-rigging of this ship two years ago, before the company bought her. New masts and spars, Norway pine from the steps up, with new ironware and cordage. This main mast is seventy-seven feet six inches. The topmast was forty-six feet nine inches. 
The royal mast is 23 feet 6 inches, and the pole they just got down is 18 feet 6 inches, making a sum of 166 feet 3 inches. He hesitated, then mopped his brow and said in a changed tone of voice, I think I will go below, Captain. That dollop of brandy the doctor gave me a while ago has fuddled me. He walked aft, a little unsteadily. McCray and Larkin appeared before him. Captain, said McCray, no sense of us rubbing off any more paint alongside. We are both going to pull away and anchor. I get a sounding of fifteen fathoms and we're on a lee shore. Very well, I will anchor too. The officers left, and in a few minutes the prize cast off going downwind a cable's length before she dropped and swung round to ride to the anchor. Comet boomed off and slid another cable's length astern before coming to anchor, while Merriweather acted as his own boatswain and moored rapid. Hamlin had the watch, the weather was clear, stars bright, and the moon just rising as he went below. The bottle was still on the transom, a quarter empty, A wolf was gone. He pulled himself together with an effort, looked with longing at the Scots whisky, then forced himself to sit at the desk, open the quartermaster's notebook, and commence the composition of his report. The action of the sloop this afternoon still rankled, but he compelled himself to be objective. Chapter 8 At daybreak, Merriweather came back on deck. The royal mast was secured, all the ironwork had been removed from the shattered topmast and it had been extracted like a bad tooth from the hole it had punched in the deck. A party was bending a sail on the main yard and the lanyards in the dead eyes of the new shrouds were being tightened. The boatswain, looking much improved, came up with the sailmaker. Captain, with the mainsail and two staysails, we think the ship can work to wind it. Another hour should see us finished, said Tompkins, lowering his gaze. It may be a mite different steering. The rig doesn't exactly balance, but I think she'll do. Hope we can find a new topmast at Penang. Thank you. Let me know when you are ready, said Merriweather, glad that he had seen fit to mention Tompkins' services in his report. The sloop and the first schooner were nowhere in sight. She must have been able to get the prize underway during the night and head for Penang. Rapid hoisted the signal to get underway, and the hands wound in the anchor. She did handle differently, he soon discovered, but adjustments were made, and with the helmsman carrying a little lee rudder she would lie almost as close to the wind as before. At mid-morning in five hundred fathoms, he hoisted the signal to heave to, and then the church flag. Wolf was on deck, but he did not volunteer to read the committal services for the three casualties, and Merriweather laboured through them. The issue of a double ration of spirits was greeted with cheers, and the squadron resumed its voyage. With the necessity of working to windward, it was mid-afternoon the next day before the three ships reached the anchorage off Penang. The pilot had reported that Argus and her prize had arrived just after daybreak, and Merriweather could see them at anchor off the dockyard, the blue ensign flying above the tricolor. I think you may give the port watch liberty, Merriweather told McCamey, and I am going ashore to Government House to make a report. Aye, aye, sir. McCamey went forward in his round-shouldered gait, whistling tunelessly to himself, and in a few minutes the gig had hooked onto the gangway. He caught Raffles coming out the door to enter his barouche. Hello, Commodore. Back again with booty, I see. Raffles shook Merriweather's hand with vigour. No use going in there. All the offices are closing early. Tonight the Governor's birthday ball. Raffles paused and made a wry face. This is the damnedest place for social events I ever saw. But Livy loves it. No, oh, she pretends it's dull. Now I must pick her up and take her home. Do jump in. I insist you come along with us. I hadn't planned, 
commenced Merriweather. No excuses. And I'll invite your officers and that fellow Wolf, too. He pulled a card from a pocket in his ornate waistcoat, reached into the barouche and took out a writing board complete with pen and bottle of ink. He scribbled a note on the back, called to a small brown man sitting on a bench, gave him rapid instructions in Malay, and the man loped off. I sent him down to your boat with the invitation. Now, off we go. The barouche moved off at a trot along the carriage road that wound up the hill west of the anchorage and soon drew up at the door of a bungalow surrounded with flowers. Raffles jumped down and after a few minutes returned. Merriweather bowed to Mrs. Raffles. Commodore, I'm delighted to see you again and to hear you've been so successful too. Thank you, madam, and I'm happy to see you and Tom again. You've been so kind. Not at all. You have been most entertaining and accommodating. And now, Tom, let's go home. I must prepare for the ball. Merriweather wondered for a moment just what she meant, then decided it was merely small talk. Raffles handed her into the barouche and they rattled off a half mile to pull in before the Raffles' residence. There was the same flow of conversation between this high-spirited pair as they rode along that Merriweather had listened to during his first visit, as Raffles detailed the events of the day, and Livy passed shrewd judgments on them. He pricked up his ears when he heard Raffles say, And just before noon, Captain Ackroyd of Argus came in with a petition for condemnation of the prizes. Chasseur, Mercure, and another taken off the Nicobar Islands. Name unknown. But, she broke in, the charter for the Court of Record has not yet arrived. Precisely, said Raffles. We have a magistrate and coroner, but no court with power to adjudicate a prize. I told Ackroyd he would have to send his petition to the High Court of Judicature at Calcutta. He insisted on seeing Governor Dundas and demanded that he convene or sit himself as a prize court of admiralty. Impossible, declared Livy. So the governor told him, said Raffles, turning to Merriweather. Wasn't that Mercure you brought in this afternoon? Yes, said Merriweather. And the ship taken off the Nicobars was Majeure on its way to Calcutta now with my prize crew aboard. I understand that Captain Ackroyd is taking the position that he shares in all prizes taken by any forces in the strait, or their approaches, under his commission. He was not in sight, said Merriweather shortly as the barouche stopped. There was no doubt, he thought, that Argus shared in the two prizes taken day before yesterday. She was in sight. But the claim to a share in Majeur taken five hundred miles northwest of here was preposterous. Inside the cool, dim sitting room he remembered, the Malay girl brought Straits coolers after Livy had excused herself. Tom Raffles and Merriweather sat companionably in silence for a bit, sipping the tart drink, while Merriweather thought of the latest events. This had been an ill-starred operation from the outset, he told himself with the distasteful scene when he returned on board to find Wolf drunk, to the present, when he found himself about to be embroiled in controversy with Captain Ackroyd. True, he had counted his mission three quarters complete, and it would be difficult to accuse him of failure. There might yet be a fourth privateer lurking out there, but three had been taken and the Indian man recaptured. He wondered if Dr. Keyes Eldridge in Webster was still alive and in control of the Duchy of Lancaster. If they were, the ship should be approaching Ceylon by now. But this latest development was disquieting, and it was not the law of prizes as he had understood it. He had heard that Admiral Calder had submitted a claim for a share in the Trafalgar prize money last year, though he was a thousand miles away from the action. Merriweather's train of thought was broken as Raffles cleared his throat and spoke. Don't worry about the matter, Commodore. The case will have to go to Calcutta, and I am sure the company's solicitors will see that the law is followed. There is little enough I can do about it, admitted Merriweather, thankful to put the matter aside for the time. 
Did I tell you? It's in these reports. We found the India man and sent her on to Ceylon. What? Oh, wonderful. Tell me the story. By the time it was told and a brief account given of the other events of the cruise, Livy had returned, wearing a plain grey dressing gown, and the girl came in to light the lamps. Since there will be supper at the ball, we will not dine formally, Commodore. There's a buffet laid in the dining room when you are ready. And if you would like to freshen up, take the last door to the left. In the lamplight, Mrs. Raffles looked ravishing, and Merriweather caught a hint of scent in the air. Merriweather went to the room and found a pitcher of water still hot, with soap and towels on the washstand. He took off his coat and stock and rolled up the sleeves of his shirt. In the mirror, he saw the dark tan of his face and hands and the almost milk-white skin below and above them. The white of the scar across his cheek stood out, and he concluded from the fine-drawn appearance of his face that he had lost weight in these past weeks. He completed his ablutions, brushed his hair, and went back to the sitting room. Livy was sipping Madeira. Tom's changing, she said. There are spirits and wine on the sideboard. Merriweather poured a glass of London gin, cut a lemon, and rejoined the woman. Tom just told me you recovered the India man. You know her officers are still here, and it might be possible for them to make their way to Ceylon and take her home. Yes, but at this point I can only hope she reaches Ceylon with an acting master's mate, a doctor, and a drunken quartermaster to manage her. He felt uncomfortable in the absence of Raffles. You remember Kate Hartley, I am sure. Merriweather was suddenly wary. I wish I could have known you'd be here tonight. She accepted an invitation to go with the Sperrys, but... Livy looked speculatively at Merriweather. Perhaps she could come back with us. Merriweather made a non-committal sound, and Mrs. Raffles continued. You were not married, I think. He shook his head. Or betrothed? No, he said, and added unaccountably, not yet. Oh, there is someone you're interested in. Merriweather began to sweat. This woman would have it out of him. I have been seeing a young lady in Calcutta, he began and wondered if, in fact, he did have an interest in Lady Caroline, or, more importantly, if she were the least bit interested in him. Livy looked away, and said absently, Of course Kate is quite well off. No children, and her husband was a general agent for the company, and had interests in three country traders as well. She plans to return to England later this year, when his affairs out here are finally settled and she was quite complimentary of you. Merriweather recognised the matchmaker, realising that Kate had confided her entire adventure to this woman, and one or the other of them had decided that she was now interested in a conventional relationship. He sought to withdraw and tiptoe around the pit he saw opening before him. A most gracious and attractive lady, he said carefully. But, you know, I am under some obligation back at Calcutta. It was an outright lie, and the telling of it made him uncomfortable. He was relieved when Raffles came in, resplendent in civilian full dress, and the conversation shifted to less hazardous subjects. They had another drink, then dined sparingly at the buffet. Raffles consulted his watch. We should be away, dear and to Merriweather. In effect, I'm the major domo for this affair, and I shall be there early. They were the first to arrive, Raffles immediately going off with a corpulent man in livery, and Livy vanishing into the ladies' retiring room. Merriweather wandered about for a few minutes in the empty expanse of floor, then went outside to catch the breeze coming in from the harbour, seeing the lights on his ships, and hoping that all was well. He worried for a moment about the possibility of finding a satisfactory spa from which a new topmast could be fashioned, and damned himself for not going to the dockyard this afternoon to look for one. Half an hour later, McCrae and his third lieutenant Cowan came up, precisely at the appointed hour, 
and Merriweather chatted with them until Dobbs, Buttram, Hamlin and Wolfe arrived. Several carriages had drawn past the entrance, and shortly the sound of instruments being tuned came from the windows. "'May as well join the party,' suggested Wolfe. He was in full dress, the new gold lace marking his rank as a captain of less than three years' seniority flashing in the light from the doorway. He appeared to be in high spirits, and Merriweather wondered if he had used the key to his cellar before leaving the ship. The group of officers went in, blinking in the bright light. A functionary took the names, beginning his announcement. Commodore Percival Merriweather, Captain James Wolfe, on through Midshipman Hamlin. Before he was half finished, Raffles had popped out and Merriweather made the presentations. The governor has not yet arrived, gentlemen. He wishes all of you to be presented to him in recognition of your recent services. In the meantime, there are punch bowls in those alcoves, and the young ladies will soon be arriving for the dancing. The group drifted toward the punch, feeling self-conscious in the sparsely occupied room. Mrs. Raffles intercepted them halfway across the room, and Raffles recited the names faultlessly. She managed to put McCrae on one arm and Hamlin on the other, leading them merrily to the punch bowl. Damned attractive woman, said Wolf, sotto voce. How do you manage to know one in every port, Merriweather? I am irresistibly handsome and possess a fatal charm. Merriweather was entering into the spirit of high good humour. Livy saw the officers served, then dimpled and curtsied as with one accord they drank her health. She enjoined them to wait and went into the retiring room to emerge with five young ladies. The dancing will commence as soon as the governor arrives and his reception is over, she told them, and pirouetted in a step or two with a flash of ankles. Even quiet little McCrae and stolid Dobbs were soon chattering with the young ladies, and Wolfe had instantly claimed a tall girl with dark hair and sparkling blue eyes. They were interrupted by the announcement of the governor's arrival, signalled by the playing of a sprightly march by the musicians. The reception was quickly in progress. Governor and Lady Dundas, the company resident and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Raffles, and several lesser dignitaries making up the receiving line. The girls scattered to join their families for the formalities and Merriweather herded his group together to take their place in the line. The affair moved more rapidly than many such, and Merriweather soon found himself being presented by Raffles to the governor and his lady, and, in turn, presenting his officers and Wolf. Yes, Commodore, I am delighted to make your acquaintance. George Barlow wrote me to give you all assistance if you called here. I should like to discuss the situation at greater length tomorrow if you are at liberty. Certainly, Your Excellency, said Merriweather, hoping for a new topmast, and moved on. Back at the end of the slowly moving line, he saw the flash of gold lace and recognized Captain Ackroyd, accompanied by three lieutenants and two midshipmen of the Royal Navy. He went back to the punch bowl and took another cup sipping slowly while he watched the crowd from the entrance to the alcove. The music struck up as the receiving line disintegrated and the alcove filled with thirsty guests. Merriweather stepped out of the way and put his empty cup on the tray. He felt it his duty to find Mrs. Raffles and lead her into the dance since her husband was so caught up in the management of the affair. As he crossed the floor, he saw Mrs. Hartley being led out to the dance by a man of middle years, whom he recognised as the first officer of the Duchy of Lancaster. He bowed to her, and she responded with a distant nod. He found Livy, and they danced the first set. Oh, Commodore, I don't think Mrs. Hartley will be coming home with us tonight. She met this widowed officer of the company's service yesterday, and she says he's most insistent on taking her home tonight. Livy paused, then continued, He thinks his party may take passage for Ceylon next week in a country ship. 
and he has already mentioned marriage to her. Quite all right, said Merriweather with relief, and then illogically felt a twinge of jealousy. She had chosen him to satisfy her needs, but with marriage in sight, he became an embarrassment to her. The gaiety engendered by Mrs. Raffles carried on, fueled by the punch bowl, and each of the officers had his turn at treading a measure with her during the evening as well as with the small number of daughters of company functionaries present. The release from the strain of the past weeks at sea was something to be savoured to the utmost. Merriweather, close to midnight, escorted Mrs. Raffles to the entrance of the retiring room and strolled toward the alcove. Supper would be announced soon, but he was thirsty again after the dance. Just inside, he saw Ackroyd and one of his lieutenants. Here, you, called Ackroyd, starting across the room. You, Merriweather, just a moment. Merriweather, startled, turned to face him as Ackroyd approached, followed at an interval by his lieutenant. Good evening, Captain, said Merriweather pleasantly. Merriweather? I resent the statements you have made reflecting upon my courage and performance of duty. Merriweather tried to think of any statements he had made, other than the bald recitation of fact concerning the action of Diamond Point contained in his report. Don't deny it. I hate a liar, shouted Ackroyd, red in the face and trembling. I demand... Someone brushed by his shoulder and Ackroyd shifted his gaze. Merriweather glanced sidewise and found Wolf beside him. I am the person who made the statements, Ackroyd, but I repeat the charges to your face. You abandoned the pursuit of a French cruiser to seize a prize already crippled by the Bombay Marine. Do you desire further specifications? Now, gentlemen, cried Merriweather, attempting to intervene. Captain Ackroyd was addressing his remarks to me. He had never been involved in an affair of honour, but this was the unmistakable prelude to one, and Wolfe had shifted the provocation to himself. Merriweather felt that he was without fault in the matter, but if Ackroyd believed otherwise, he felt enough resentment for his recent actions to give him satisfaction. The scene was distasteful, and it had already drawn a large audience. Through a gap in the crowd he saw Raffles hurrying across the floor toward the alcove, and the governor hovering discreetly in the background. Wolf disregarded Merriweather's protest. Do you challenge me? demanded Wolf. Ackroyd had gone quite pale and hesitated a moment. No? Then I name you a poltroon and I challenge you. A shade of colour returned to Ackroyd's face, and he said steadily enough, my seconds will wait upon yours before noon tomorrow. Whom do you choose? What about me? demanded Merriweather. I thought you had addressed your complaints to me. No offence, Commodore, I have found the guilty party, said Ackroyd. And I shall give him satisfaction soon enough. He looked back at Wolf. And who are your seconds? Commodore Merriweather and Dr. Bartram, both in rapid. Raffles pushed through the crowd just in time to hear Wolf's statement. Now, gentlemen, he commenced smoothly, no need for an affair of honour. Indeed, the governor disapproves of the practice. Can't this matter be composed? I feel sure there must be some misunderstanding. None whatever, said Ackroyd. I have been publicly insulted, humiliated and challenged. However, if Captain Wolf desires to confess to these persons present that he lied, withdraw his remark and apologize, I may accept that as satisfaction. Merriweather looked at Wolf. He was entirely composed, cold and deadly in manner. Except for Ackroyd's disavowal, he could well be a principal in the affair, and he wondered if he could have maintained the poise Wolf displayed. No chance, grated Wolf. And damn your impudence for intruding as well, he told Raffles. Very well, said Raffles cheerfully, taking no offence. I shall inform the governor of your decision. He walked rapidly back across the floor. 
My seconds will be Lieutenant Shropshire and Wyatt, said Ackroyd, then turned and strode away, followed by the two lieutenants. The bystanders broke into a buzz of comment and drifted away as Buttram came up. Did I hear correctly? You were to fight a duel and I am to be a second? Yes, said Wolf a little ruefully. I'm afraid I've made a fool of myself. I wasn't thinking straight. A moment more and he would have challenged me. I could cut his ears off with the sword, but since he knows my skills, pistols will make the matter more even, and he gets the choice of weapons. He rubbed the back of his head and closed his eyes a moment. The die was cast. Wolf and Ackroyd would fight a duel, and he would be Wolf's second. Merriweather had never issued a challenge, nor had he ever been challenged, though that certainly had been Ackroyd's intention tonight. He was illogically regretful for a moment that the diversion had occurred and that he was not a principal in the affair. He heard supper announced and went to find the raffles pair. The impending duel was the subject of a constant buzz of conversation at the governor's table where Merriweather found himself seated with Livy and Tom. Apparently, Livy was already fully informed of the facts, for she made no further comment. As soon as he decently could, he made his excuses and went back to the ship, passing close aboard Mercure and hailing the watch to make sure all was well in her. He had no trouble falling asleep. Just after eight bells in the morning, the messenger reported that the gig from Argus was approaching. At least Ackroyd's seconds were prompt and he would not have to wait out the morning for them. He sent for Buttram and they held a brief conference with Wolf, just awakened, bleary-eyed and yawning in his dressing gown. Any time, any weapons, he told them his words slurred and indistinct. I have a fine pair of pistols, but I'll use any you agree on, provided the gunner inspects and passes them. He reached over, pulled a drawer open in his chest and produced a rosewood case. Show them these if pistols are Ackroyd's choice. At least, I have confidence in them. Very well, Merriweather told him. I think the seconds are coming on board now. He and Buttram went back to the cabin, where the skylight had been removed for repair, and in a few moments Hamlin escorted the two lieutenants in. Good morning, said Merriweather, rising. Pray be seated, gentlemen. There followed a moment of silence punctuated by the clearing of throats while the officers looked about curiously. "'Your quarters suffered a bit, sir,' offered the elder of the two, a tall, light-haired man named Shropshire who had been with Ackroyd last night. The other officer, Wyatt, was his name, Merriweather remembered, was slight and dark. "'Yes, the carpenter has removed the skylight.' He hopes he can find glass enough to make twenty-one panes over in Georgetown. If not, we shall have to board it over and I will miss the light. You seem to have been hulled twice as well as losing your main topmast, said Wyatt. Things were rather hot for a few minutes, but we are making repairs, and if I can find a suitable spa for the topmast, we shall be able to return to sea shortly. He wondered when they would get around to the business in hand. The two officers looked at one another. Evidently, they were as inexperienced at this game as Merriweather and Buttram. Then Shropshire cleared his throat. Sir, you know our mission, and Captain Ackroyd says there is no chance of composing this quarrel except by a complete retraction and apology from Captain Wolfe. That is out of the question, of course. Of course, sir, but it is my duty to propose it, he hesitated. There is a level bit of green sward just behind the dockyard. No residence is close, and it has been used for this purpose in the past, I am told. Quite satisfactory. And your choice of weapons? Pistols, sir, ten paces, and no second shots. Merriweather opened the case to display the gleaming blue steel and polished walnut of Wolf's Pear complete with powder flask, perfectly cast balls, steel ramrod and silver charge cup. How do these strike you? 
Roberts looked briefly at the pistols. They appear quite adequate, but we'll want them inspected by our gunner. Fair enough. Send him over. And now, the time? It should be daylight by four bells in the morning watch. Shall we fix that time tomorrow morning? Agreed, said Merriweather. Doctor, do you have anything to add? No, sir. Shropshire and Wyatt rose and bowed. Good day, gentlemen, said Merriweather, also rising to see them out the door. Well, said Buttram, that was quick and pleasant enough. And now I must see my patients. I have two incipient infections I'm trying to head off. And I am going to see the governor and try to find a topmast. Merriweather ordered the gig called away and went around to Wolf's room. Wolf was shaving, now fully awake. Pistols? he guessed. Yes, at six o'clock tomorrow morning. One shot each at ten paces with your pistols. Confident, isn't he? said Wolf calmly. He is a crack shot. You know, I served with Ackroyd three years ago in the Mediterranean when he was first by two numbers in the Navy list and I was second in Aphrodite, thirty-six. We had a dust up then, and I challenged him. But Captain Rogers would not hear of it. I had a chance to come out here as first in Apollo, and I took it. Then the bastard showed up here, as impossible as ever. He washed lather flecked with blood off his face, toweled it, and sat heavily back in the chair. I realize, Commodore, I haven't been the best passenger you could hope for this cruise. I've done some things I'm ashamed of, and I apologize for any grief I've brought you. The man was in dead earnest, Merriweather saw, aware of the possibility of death within the next twenty-four hours. The second personality that Buttram had visualized in him was completely subordinated now. For how long, Merriweather could not guess. Wolf continued speaking very slowly. But you have been a gentleman when you had the provocation not to be. But I must say, you have demonstrated in two classic examples the art of winning naval engagements by superior seamanship, gunnery, and plain good training, so that your officers and men do the right thing in the heat of battle without being told. Wolf reached over to his desk and picked up a packet, folded and sealed. Merriweather caught a glimpse of the superscription addressed to Pellew. I had written most of this report earlier, and then added the account of the engagement off Diamond Point night before last, while the facts were fresh in my mind. Last night, after my return aboard, I composed my critique of the operation and of your tactics. Wolf handed over the packet. There are copies for your Commodore and the Governor-General. He paused and rubbed his hand across his forehead, eyes closed, then continued, And here is the letter for Kinney's parents. Merriweather felt embarrassment. It was almost as though he were listening to the deathbed words of the man. He took the packet. Thank you, Wolf, he said. I shall place them in my strong box for safekeeping until you call for them. And now the governor has asked to see me, and I must try to find a new topmast. Wolf opened his eyes and said a little thickly, Lord knows I had little enough to drink last night, but my head is splitting. I think I shall rest a while. Chapter 9 Raffles buttoned his waistcoat and slipped into his coat, then adjusted his neck piece and watch chain, and led the way in to Governor Philip Dundas. He was formal in his way, but by no means in the manner of Sir George Barlow. He indicated chairs for Merriweather and Raffles, and looked undecided for a moment. His colour was bad jaundiced, and his hand shook. Prince of Wales Island had a climate that was not conducive to long life among the European inhabitants of the large government establishment here at Georgetown in this young presidency, and health was a serious concern in spite of the succession of balls, routes, and picnics all duly reported in the Prince of Wales Gazette. 
A sad thing, Commodore, that two young men seek to kill one another, and both promising officers of the Navy, he began. Yes, Your Excellency, I was almost involved myself. Ackroyd thought I had made the statements that Wolfe acknowledged. A sad thing, said Dundas again. I am informed there is no chance of composing the matter. None whatever, as of an hour ago. They meet tomorrow morning with pistols. I tried, Your Excellency, interposed Raffles. I know, and I am not going to interfere, said Dundas tiredly. Now, Commodore, I am acquainted with the terms of your commission, and I know that three of these supposed four French cruisers have been taken. Your ship is damaged and requires a new topmast. We have a dockyard, and it was thought when this presidency was established that we would build or repair many ships here. Unfortunately, there is no suitable timber for the purpose this side of Rangoon. When Argus required new masts, we were four months finding and bringing them in. Merriweather's heart sank. The governor was telling him that there was no material here for essential repairs, impossible as that appeared. He commenced, But, sir, your excellency, I require only a spar of sufficient size. I can fit it, and I have all the ironware. Dundas shook his head. I have had MacDonald, the superintendent of the dockyard, in already this morning. Mr. Raffles has told me of your requirements. He says he has teak planks and a few oak beams, but no timber of the variety in dimensions you require. I sympathize with you, Commodore. Is it possible for you to continue under, I think the term is, jury rig? Possible, sir but the strain may spring the fore and mizzen mists if long continued, and the ship is unbalanced as well. I would be derelict in my duty if I took her into action in this condition. Yes, I suspected something of the sort, said Dunder slowly. I regret our lack. And now, the surgeon insists that I return home at this hour to rest. I have been unwell, Commodore but I leave the matter in the hands of Mr. Raffles with authority to give you all assistance. I am sorry, Your Excellency, but I wish you a speedy recovery, said Merriweather, rising and bowing. The hand of death was on the man, he surmised, and wondered if Raffles anticipated it as he did that of the First Secretary. Back in his chamber, Raffles divested himself of his coat and unbuttoned the waistcoat. He pulled out his watch, attached to the chain with its jingling seals, and said, Another hour and I should take you home to lunch with me. It is too much, demurred Merriweather. Then a thought struck him. But could we go to the dockyard meanwhile and let me see for myself? Certainly. In a few moments the brooch was at the door, and they rolled down to the harbour. They passed a low, spreading building on the principal street of Georgetown. Our best public house, said Raffles with a wave. A Londoner by the name of Moulton established it last year. He has the finest selection of wines and spirits in the presidency. A roast beef every night. You should arrange to dine there before you depart. At the rate I am going, I may dine there every night for the next year, said Merriweather bitterly. Raffles laughed and said, You take matters too seriously, Commodore. Carpe diem, live for the day. Enjoy things while you may. You're a long time dead. Of course, I would not deliberately pick this presidency as the place to spend it. Even the Admiralty, which insisted on making it the headquarters base for the eastern half of the fleet, now recognizes the mistake. So we have one twenty-two gun sloop here. They drew up at the dockyard. MacDonald was a thick-set, bald man of about his own age, surly in manner, who spoke with the accent of the Highlands. No, Commodore, I told the Governor not an hour ago there's not a stick of pine or anything else that would make a topmast this side of Rangoon. The trees that grow here, or over on the mainland, are all too hard or too soft, too heavy or too light for mass and spars. 
four months it were to find the timber for two masts in Argus out there, and that bastard Ackroyd gigging me three times a day, and then complaining to the governor because my artisans take a siesta. Merriweather looked out the window of the office. It was situated in the corner of a fair-sized sail loft with fly-specked schematic drawings of vessels tacked on the walls. Along the waterfront were moored a number of small craft, a pilot lugger, scows, barges, lighters and workboats. On the ways a hundred feet distant was the keel, with stem, stern post and half a dozen rib frames erected and temporarily braced, of what promised to be a considerable vessel. The timbers had weathered almost grey, and weeds grew thick about them. That was commenced as an Indiaman two years ago, explained MacDonald. Joseph Parker and Sons commissioned her, but what were the frogs cruising about out there? We ran out of timber, and there she sets. Anchored a little way offshore with two barges Merriweather had seen alongside Argus during his first call at Penang. Each carried a pair of sheer legs joined at the top and spreading like the letter A, braced and guyed with tackles running through a block at the apex and leading down to a windlass. One was not much more than thirty feet high, but the other must be fifty. Merriweather estimated. These were the implements by which the damaged masts had been lifted out of Argus and the new ones stepped. Why'd I borrow your glass a moment? asked Merriweather took the telescope and stepped outside. The two spars forming the longer of the sheer legs were undoubtedly pine, probably salvaged from some wreck. While weathered, they appeared sound through the glass, no obvious cracks or checks, though one was studded with iron spikes to serve as a ladder, but he judged them to be at least fifty feet in length. In front of the building was a flagstaff with a signal yard arm and halyards. The flag bag was inside the sail loft, and it took only a moment to pull out the necessary bunting. Raffles came out, followed by MacDonald. What in the world, Commodore? Signalling my ship, replied Merriweather, then whispered, Now you stand by me, Tom. He bent on Rapid's number and two blocked it, then lowered and two blocked it again half a dozen times to attract attention. He was rewarded finally when a bit of colour blossomed on the mizzen halyards, acknowledging her readiness to receive the message. Boson and Carpenter come on shore. Rapid repeated the signal, then two blocked understood, and Merriweather hauled down the hoist, signalling execution of the order. He detached the flags and restored them to their bag, then came back to the mystified Raffles and MacDonald. Oh, Mr. MacDonald, I have to be in attendance on an affair of honour tomorrow morning. Could you show me the green use for this? They walked through the empty echoing loft and emerged on an open lawn sickled smooth. The sun will be rising right behind that tree over there, said MacDonald with relish. So generally they face off at right angles to the sun's bearing so there'll be no advantage. How often do you have such affairs? inquired Merriweather. This will be the third in three years. Last one, Mr. West of the company, wounded an ensign from the garrison for the attentions he paid to his wife. Then West died within the month of fever, and his widow married the ensign, though how much comfort he is to her I don't know, seeing as where he was wounded. He laughed uproariously and they went back to the office with Raffles impatiently consulting his watch. The launch was pulling for the jetty in front of the office, as MacDonald said, I am due for a siesta. Never dreamed of such a thing back in Clyde Bank, but it comes in handy out here in the heat of the day. Back up four. Go ahead, Merriweather told him. I must wait a moment to give orders to my boatswain. MacDonald put on a wide straw hat, and departed toward Georgetown. The launch hooked onto the jetty, and the boatswain swung nimbly ashore in spite of his broken arm, followed by the carpenter. Mr. Tompkins, you see those sheer legs out there on the barge? I think one of them might serve as a topmast. 
Will you and Mr. Svensson take a look at it, and, if sound, dismantle it and take it back to the ship? Aye, aye, sir. Good God, Merriweather, exploded Raffles. You can't commandeer the dockyard's equipment. Why, MacDonald, the governor said, give me all assistance. To be honest, Raffles, I interpret that to mean you stand between me and MacDonald when he finds his sheer leg missing. Well, and now I accept your kind invitation and look forward to seeing your charming wife again. By the time they reached the Raffles' residence, the high-handed confiscation of a vital part of the company's equipment had become a joke. Raffles hastened to tell Livy the gleeful story over Strait's coolers. But of course, my dear, once MacDonald sees what has happened and comes to me, he may be of a mind to call me out, he concluded. Livy laughed again at the absurdity, and they went out to the veranda to dine. Commodore, said Raffles, settling back in his chair after lunch, I think I shall emulate Mr. MacDonald this afternoon. What with the ball and the late hour, I feel the necessity of a siesta. Merriweather saw Livy look quickly at Tom, a sparkle of pleasure flashing across her face. Evidently she anticipated more from the afternoon than a simple nap. For a moment he envied Raffles and coveted Livy, then heard him continue, Of course, you're welcome to stay for a siesta too. No, he said, wondering for a moment how Kate Hartley might be employing the afternoon. No, I should be on board when that spar arrives, closely followed by MacDonald. If you will have your man take me to the landing, I'll be most appreciative. He came on board in the blinding heat of the day, seeing in passing that the sheer legs off the dockyard had now assumed a lopsided aspect, and the launch was pulling toward the ship with the new topmast towing astern. The sun was almost touching the tops of the hills to the southwest when MacDonald made his appearance. Mr. McCamey let him come on board without hindrance, where the first sight that met his eyes was his sheer leg, now trimmed off at either end and wedged on sawhorses along the port side. The carpenter and his mates were fitting the ironware to one end, while the carpenter from Comet was at work on the other end. A selection of chisels, saws, and augers spread on deck around them. Two carpenters' mates were trimming and truing the spar with draw knives and planes, while curls of shavings blew unheeded across the deck. Mr. Tompkins stood by in a bit of shade, contentedly smoking his pipe, as he watched the topmast take shape. Here now! shouted MacDonald, whipping his straw hat off and throwing it to the deck. I've found the thieves! He was in a towering rage. The boatswain looked around at him. Have you lost something, sir? Merriweather, at word from the messenger of the approach of the visitor, had come to stand on the ladder, just looking over the combing of the after companion. At the response, MacDonald became inarticulate, bouncing up and down and appearing on the verge of assaulting the boatswain, broken arm and all. Bowman, the leading boatswain's mate lounged up beside Tompkins and stood there hands on hips. He was a man over six feet tall with a protruding jaw and broken teeth, who weighed an easy fifteen stone. MacDonald calmed a little and began, My sheer legs! Here you are, sir, said Davis, the purser, bustling up and handing over a folded paper. Your bill of exchange drawn on Bombay. Nine pounds, seven shillings and threepence appraised value, one unfitted pines bar. MacDonald took the paper and unfolded it, his mouth working open and shut as he looked at it. Then he crumpled it savagely and threw it into the scuppers. I'll... He commenced and saw Bowman move toward him. He retreated across the deck, paused when he saw there was no pursuit, and shouted, I'll see the governor. You'll hear from this. He went to the gangway, and as he started down the ladder, a seaman handed him his hat and pressed the crumpled bill of exchange into his hand. MacDonald looked at it, then thrust it into his pocket, clapped on the hat, and climbed down into his boat. From a hundred feet away, he turned once more to shout, Damned Bombay Buccaneers! 
and headed for the Georgetown boat landing. Raffles was in for an uncomfortable quarter hour, Merriweather could predict. The appropriation was justified, Merriweather told himself. There might be some repercussions from Bombay, but taking a pine spa from another agency of the company in time of need was certainly not a hanging or even a court of inquiry offence, particularly when liberal payment was offered. The barge saw only limited use, and for such a purpose surely one of the local trees would provide an adequate leg. And at the rate the boatswain and carpenter were going, assisted by the carpenter and his mates from Comet, the mainmast should be completely set up and re-rigged by day after tomorrow. The thought of the morrow depressed him, and he thought of the inn that Raffles had pointed out in Georgetown this morning. A drink and a meal ashore in a public house would be a novelty after these weeks at sea. He called Sang. Would you ask Captain Wolfe, Dr. Buttram, Mr. Dobbs and Mr. Hamlin if they will consent to be my guests at dinner ashore this evening? And tell the messenger to come down. In a moment the messenger knocked as Merriweather finished scribbling his invitation. Send this to Mr. Larkin in Mercure and Captain McCray in Comet. Private. Larkin needed a run ashore, away from the strain of watching over a ship full of sullen, dangerous prisoners, undoubtedly plotting to retake the prize at the first opportunity. Dobbs, in his steady, quiet way, had proved himself during the past nine months since he had come aboard as a past midshipman. Hamlin was gaining confidence and knowledge, and promised to become a competent officer. Merriweather recalled that it was more than a year ago in London, just before Rapid sailed on that desperate mission to meet Abercrombie, that he at last invited his officers in a group for a celebration ashore. And only three of that group were here now. Then, too, he wanted to cheer Wolf up and take his mind off the affair of tomorrow morning. Sir, I cannot awaken the captain. What? He breathes but does not awaken. Damnation! Had Wolf drunk himself into insensibility on the eve of his duel? Merriweather stepped around to Wolf's room. There was no bottle or glass visible, and when he bent over him he detected no odour of spirits. Call Dr. Buttram. The man was lying across the bed, still in the dressing gown he had worn when Merriweather left him this morning, his eyes half open. When Buttram arrived, he sent Sang to get a spill and light the lamp, taking Wolf's pulse while he waited in the twilight. The lamp lit up the room and showed Wolf's half-open eyes. Buttram pushed back the lids and muttered something, then felt the forehead and explored areas of the knees and elbows. He stood back, one hand holding his chin and looked steadily at the chest of the recumbent figure with its measured rise and fall. No reactions. Pupils irregularly dilated and in a deep coma if ever I saw one, said Buttram, as though he were talking to himself. And the slight clumsiness of the left hand and leg, speech a little slurred of late. I confess I thought he had been tippling again since you gave him back the key to his cellar, added to his erratic actions these past few weeks. His voice trailed off. Well, what is the trouble? Of course it could be a stroke, but not likely at his age. My guess? No, I cannot even guess at this point. What can you do for him? Nothing that I know of, except a little bloodletting should not harm him and could be beneficial. He instructed Sang to bring him his medical kit. I am no great believer in bleeding as a rule, but... Sometimes it will relieve humours or restore consciousness after a stroke. He hummed tunelessly as they waited. Sang came back into the cabin and Buttram took out the instruments and a graduated vessel. Six ounces should be enough, he said briskly, gripping Wolf's arm just above the elbow and causing the veins in his forearm to distend. A stroke of the knife and the flood flowed smoothly into the cup dark red, almost black in this light. That's enough. 
he closed the incision and pressed a bit of lint wet with brandy over it. No visible effect, he said after a bit. But we shall wait and see. What do we do about tomorrow morning's affair? asked Merriweather, knowing the answer before he had completed the question. It's obvious. The man is incapable. We so inform Ackroyd, or more correctly, his seconds. Well, I have already invited you and a party ashore to dine at the public house, but I will not disappoint. You say there is nothing more you can do, so make him comfortable, and we will stop by Argus on the way to the landing. Buttram and Sang straightened Wolf on the bed, pulling his limp arms and legs straight, and then laying a damp rag across his eyes to protect them from gnats or flies. I can't give him water, said Buttram abstractedly. I fear he would not swallow and would strangle. He cannot live long in this condition, but I'll have Dyer stand by. It was a subdued group that left Rapid, picked up Larkin from Mercure and then Macrae from Comet. The word of Wolf's mortal affliction had quickly spread. Pull for Argus, Merriweather told the coxswain. The absentee pennant was flying, but he needed information as to where Ackroyd might be found. They were hailed fifty yards off her gangway. Rapid! shouted back the coxswain as they came alongside. Can you tell me where I might find Captain Ackroyd? Merriweather called up to the master's mate at the gangway. Sir, I think he and Lieutenant Shropshire and Wyatt are dining at the public house in Georgetown. Thank you. Give way, he told the coxswain. The public landing. At least it was convenient to find Ackroyd and his seconds at their own destination. Inside the public house was a bit of old England transplanted to the tropics. True, there were punkers never seen in Britain, waving slowly back and forth overhead, propelled by cords that led outside to Malay boys to keep the air in motion. But one look at the host with his red John Bull face, and the roast of beef already carved half its depth, suspended on a spit over a drip pan beside a bed of coals, carried Merriweather right back to London. The place was half full of warrant officers of the Royal Navy and from Comet and Rapid, with a considerable contingent of army personnel from the garrison, led by a haughty sergeant major. The host bustled forward. Good evening, gentlemen, and you'll be Commodore Merriweather. The Cockney accent was familiar and comforting, reviving memories of his boyhood. Yes, Mr. Moulton, and could you accommodate the six of us for dinner? Certainly, sir. Roast beef is the main dish, but I have puddings, relishes and kickshaws too, and spirits, wine and ale. Excellent. I am sure we will do them justice and see what these gentlemen will have to drink. Right this way, gentlemen. Moulton led them to an alcove opening off the public room, furnished with a long table, chairs and sideboard. As they passed another such alcove, Merriweather caught a flash of blue and gold. Ackroyd and his two lieutenants were in a group that comprised five women and two men in civilian dress. They were in high spirits, he gathered, as the last words of a song floated out. Ackroyd was conveniently located and appeared settled there for a bit. His party passed the entrance without notice or remark. Well, gentlemen, your preferences? The innkeeper took their orders, and a Malay boy soon slipped in, balancing a tray of bottles and glasses to set the sideboard. Toasts were proposed and drunk, and Wolf was forgotten for the time. The officers relaxed from the strain of the past weeks. Merriweather kept an eye out, however, and when he saw empty dessert dishes carried by from the adjoining alcove, he caught Buttram's eye, and they went unobtrusively outside. Wyatt was just coming out. Could we see you and Mr. Shropshire a moment? Wyatt nodded, and in a moment he and Shropshire emerged. Merriweather looked about, other than the two private rooms, there was no privacy. But no one was paying any attention, and this was as good a place as any to give the news. Gentlemen, 
I fear there will be no meeting of our principals in the morning, said Merriweather carefully. Captain Wolfe is physically incapable, as Dr. Buttram will explain. Both officers looked startled and doubtful as they looked at Buttram. Gentlemen, Captain Wolfe lapsed into a deep coma some time earlier today. Recovery is most unlikely. Death inevitable, in my opinion. He paused and looked at Merriweather. Therefore, gentlemen, will you inform Captain Ackroyd of the circumstances, and we will wait a moment for your reply. It was only a moment before they returned, accompanied by Ackroyd. What is this all about, Merriweather? he demanded. He was a little loud, but perfectly steady on his feet. Several heads turned among the patrons in the public room. Merriweather felt irritation at the tone of voice, but replied civilly, Why, I thought the doctor had made it perfectly plain. The man is unconscious and on his deathbed. In less than twenty-four hours? A likely story. I beg your pardon? And how am I to interpret that remark? I said a likely story, said Ackroyd in a loud, insulting voice, ringing across the suddenly quiet room, and you can interpret it any way you please. Merriweather was aware that his own officers had come to the entrance of their alcove, the women and civilians staring from the other, and that every eye in the big room was on him. He realised with a perverse pleasure that the man was intent on making a scene, and that it was impossible to withdraw with dignity. He had, in effect, been named a liar before fifty of witnesses, and Wolf branded a coward as well. Distasteful as the prospect was, he must accept the challenge or walk under a cloud the rest of his life. Anger and animosity toward this arrogant man who had abandoned the chase to take a crippled prize from him three days ago steeled him. He spoke from a full heart and was surprised by his own vehemence and stilted language. Why then? I think you have called me a liar and I demand a retraction and an apology for that and your false reflection upon the courage of a mortally ill man, he said in a clear, ringing voice that carried across the room. Ackroyd flushed, beat red. Why, you damned John Company pirate! I'd rather kill Wolf for the sake of old scores, but you'll do as well. Do you challenge me, then? Merriweather demanded. You failed to make yourself clear. The reckless perversity of spirit and deep anger that had possessed him from Ackroyd's first sneering statement carried him along. Very well, I accept your challenge, and in view of Captain Wolfe's disability, I shall suggest to my seconds that we meet at the time and place appointed for his meeting with you, and with the same weapons. Ackroyd appeared a little taken aback at the quick response. He looked to Shropshire, and then to Wyatt, and said in a lower tone, My seconds remain the same. I request Dr. Buttram and Lieutenant Larkin to act for me. Merriweather went back into the alcove, hoping that McCrae would not be hurt by his unhesitating choice of Larkin, hearing the excited buzz of conversation rise in the public room and poured a drink. He was unaccountably exhilarated and yet there was a tremor in his hands as he lifted the glass. Larkin and Buttram soon came back. It's settled. Same time, place and weapons, said Buttram, shaking his head with a humorous expression of resignation. All this time, all unknowing, we have nurtured a tiger in Rapid's cabin, gentlemen. Merriweather laughed with the rest feeling the comforting influence of the gin spread through his body, engendering a sense of bravado. He might be dead tomorrow, but he was damned if he would let the prospect spoil his evening. Chapter 10 Merriweather awoke when the morning watch was called. There was a minor throbbing in the back of his head. He had drunk one gin too many last night, he decided but his hands were steady. 
It was still black outside, and through the remnants of the skylight he could see stars, promising a fair day. He rang for Sang, had the lamp lit and asked for tea and hot water. He began to shave himself. The brown face and neck contrasted with the white of his shoulders in the mirrored lamplight, and he discovered that the scar on his face had broken open again, the result of frequent shaving, sun and sweat the past few days. He skirted the raw area with the blade, leaving a little patch of stubble so as not to irritate the wound further. He wondered if he would go to his grave with the patch of bristles still growing about the raw edge of the old scar. He forced himself to think about the new topmast, now fully equipped with its fittings, and then inevitably wondered if he would live to see it hoisted into place. Hell, he had been sanguine enough last night, light-heartedly brushing aside the possibility of death or injury. But matters appeared differently in the hours before dawn. He washed off the lather and dressed, selecting a blue stock to match his coat. No use giving Ackroyd a better point of aim by wearing white. He wondered for a moment at his unhesitating choice of pistols when he had killed a man last summer with a sword in single combat. He knew in his heart, though, that it had been a fluke, and he had escaped with his life only by the merest luck. He thought fleetingly of Lady Caroline far to the north, and wondered what cavaliers might be courting her in his absence. He could not keep his mind upon her. His thoughts feared right back to the lonely meeting an hour or so hence. He had known officers in the Marine in years past who had been involved in such affairs, but not so many of late. Commodore Waldron frowned on the practice, and he had often noted a personality change in them after a successful meeting. It was as though a man having once tasted blood must drink it again and again, defying fate until he met the inevitable opponent who was as reckless, quicker, and more accurate than he. He still was not sure of his motives in taking offence and reacting so quickly to Ackroyd's unconsidered comment. Part of it, true, was honest resentment of Ackroyd's conduct, carried forward from the day of the action. And another part was his suspicion that he had too willingly stepped aside and let Wolf make the quarrel his own night before last. But possibly the most compelling factor to Merriweather was the sneering slur upon the courage of Wolf, even then lying mortally stricken. He had not liked the man, but Wolf's courage could not be faulted, and the slander was inexcusable. The thought of Wolf reminded him, and he stepped around to his room. Dyer, his servant snored in the chair. There was an acrid odour of urine in the air, and Wolf lay as he had last night, chest slowly rising and falling. There was a rasp in his breathing that indicated dryness of throat and nasal passages, but Buttram had said that he could not give him water for fear of strangulation. He shook Dyer awake and directed him to bring fresh bedding. Then he removed the rag, now bone-dry, from Wolf's eyes. They were dull and sunken, and he wet the rag in the pitcher and laid it back across them. As he left, he met Buttram coming down the passage. He's still alive, Doctor, Merriweather told him, and wondered if he might be able to say the same for himself two hours from now. Back in his cabin, Merriweather drank another cup of tea freshly brewed in his absence, and put on his coat. Time to embark, he decided, since the gig must call by Mercure for Larkin on its way to the dockyard. Buttram came in and said, The gig is at the gangway, Captain. Buttram was in undress uniform, and at the ladder was Davis carrying the medical kit and a landing force packet of bandages, splints, tourniquets, and lint compresses. These grim implements and accessories for the care of the wounded were disquieting, but Merriweather followed Buttram into the boat without comment. Larkin came aboard carrying Wolf's pistol case wrapped in oilskin under his arm and a powder horn slung over his shoulder. He spoke briefly, and the gig pulled for the landing. 
To the east the sky was lighter, and the stars had almost faded. By the time they came ashore it was light enough to see their way around the sail loft, past the rope walk to the grassy plot. They were the first to arrive, and stood silently in a cluster. Merriweather remembered with a shudder the mirth of MacDonald yesterday morning at his mention of the unfortunate wound to the ensign. There were always men, sadistic and expert enough, who would seek to punish an opponent by shooting to wound him in the genitals or in the kneecap, leaving him alive and crippled. Merriweather had no opinion as to Ackroyd, but the possibility was there, and Wolf had said he was a crack shot. He heard the sound of voices, and Ackroyd's party came around the building. Larkin and Buttram, with Shropshire and Wyatt, went over to the centre of the green, while Ackroyd and a beefy man in the uniform of an assistant surgeon of the Royal Navy stood, backs turned, staring out over the harbour. Merriweather saw Shropshire pointing and gesturing, and Larkin evidently objecting. Finally, the two laid a kerchief on the turf and stepped off together ten paces, then laid down another. He noted absently that the markers lay almost east and west, and remembered MacDonald's comment yesterday about the sun rising above that tree. Oh well, the thing would be over by the time the sun rose over those hills enough to matter. The four seconds came back. Gentlemen, said Larkin, I am going to load these pistols. If anyone has any objection to them, speak now, or forever hold his peace. He uncased the first pistol, blew through the muzzle to make sure the touch hole was clear, then poured the silver measure full of powder, levelled it with his thumb, and dumped it down the barrel. Wad, ball, and wad followed, and he handed it to Wyatt to hold while he loaded the second. He pushed the frizzen forward, poured a pinch of powder in the pan, and snapped it back, following suit with the other pistol. Loaded, primed, and at half cock, he announced. Gentlemen, are you ready? Merriweather came forward. The scene was unreal, and his skin crawled at the thought that in a moment or two Ackroyd and he would be firing at one another in cold blood. Now, gentlemen, our Shropshire formally, is there any chance of composing this quarrel? None said Ackroyd and Merriweather almost in unison. Very well. You will each take position at the markers, facing one another. The pistols will be held, pointing down, uncocked. I will give the word to cock, and then Lieutenant Larkin will count 101, 102, 103. After the word three, you may fire at will. Commodore, Call this coin for the choice of positions. He spun a gold piece in the air, catching and covering it with his hand. King, said Merriweather. It was exposed, showing the spade. I'll take that one, said Ackroyd, pointing to the eastward marker. Gentlemen, take your positions. Merriweather clumped over stiffly to the westward marker, facing Ackroyd and Larkin put the pistol in his hand. I wanted the thing north and south, Larkin whispered, but I think it is not important. Merriweather could feel the sharp, cut, checkered walnut of the grip filling his hand, and his thumb automatically sought the hammer. The sky over the tree at the edge of the green was bright red now, promising the momentary appearance of the sun. The seconds had withdrawn well out of the line of fire, leaving the two men facing one another. Cock your weapons! Merriweather drew back the hammer and felt the sear engage with a well-oiled click. Are you ready? He heard Larkin begin to count. One hundred and one! Ackroyd's figure was hazy, and he blinked his eyes to clear them. One hundred and two. The sky behind Ackroyd was much brighter now, and he tensed himself to swing the pistol up and aim it. One hundred and three. 
a dazzling ray of sunlight burst through a gap in the leaves of the tree, blindingly right in his eyes. Merriweather snapped his head instinctively sidewise to the left, eyelids almost closed to escape the brilliance. He felt the hot breath of the ball as it passed his right temple before he heard the sound of the shot and saw the smoke. Ackroyd had aimed at his head with the full and explicit intention of killing him, I would have succeeded except for the involuntary movement of his head to escape the dazzle of the sun in his eyes. The pistol was still at Merriweather's side. He had only begun to raise it. Ackroyd stood in place, mouth open, looking incredulously from Merriweather down to the pistol in his hands, still smoking. For an instant, Merriweather considered firing in the air. Ackroyd would almost certainly be punished when Wolf's report was delivered to Pellew. But the thought of Wolf, dying out there in rapid, and the shot at his head hardened his heart. He brought the pistol up smoothly, head still tilted to the left, eyes narrowed to slits against the sun, seeing the gilt buttons on the blue coat through the sights. Ackroyd took an involuntary step back, then froze, his face a pale mask of horror. The trigger pull was light and crisp. It let off before he expected it to, and the gun jumped in his hand, smoke jetting from the pan and muzzle. For a moment Ackroyd was obscured by smoke and the sunlight still in Merriweather's eyes. Then he saw his gun fall to the turf, and the man clutched his left arm above the elbow, blood blossoming red through his fingers. He had missed the heart shot for which he aimed, the muzzle diverted to the right by the unexpected lightness of the trigger pull, but evidently he had inflicted a substantial wound. He was suddenly and irrationally glad he had not killed Ackroyd, and a tremendous sense of relief flooded through him that the affair was over and he was alive. The naval surgeon and Buttram were hurrying toward Ackroyd, and Larkin came over to Merriweather, taking the pistol from his hand. God, Captain, I thought you were gone. That sun struck right in your eyes at the count of three. I had argued the point, but there were children back there on the hill who might otherwise have been in the line of fire, and we thought the affair would be over before sunrise. It saved my life, said Merriweather in wonder. I moved my head to escape the sun, and the ball just missed. He walked over to where he had left his hat. Larkin diverged to pick up the other pistol. Wyatt stood by as Larkin cased the pistols and secured the lid. We shall wait a moment for Buttram, Merriweather reminded him. The naval surgeon had cut off the sleeves of Ackroyd's coat and shirt, and Buttram was holding a tourniquet on the upper arm as the surgeon probed in the wound. In a few minutes, Buttram rejoined them. A painful wound, but not serious, he told them. The humerus is broken, but the ball is out. He may have a stiff elbow, though. He picked up his medical kit and the landing force packet. Just as they came around to the front of the sail loft, they saw the barouche coming from Georgetown. Raffles was driving it himself at a gallop, and he reined the horses to a halt in a flurry of dust. Am I too late? All over and done, volunteered Larkin. The surgeon is patching up Ackroyd out back. Really? Splendid! You stand vindicated, Commodore. Merriweather wondered for a moment what Raffles' reaction might have been had the matter gone otherwise, then decided it did not matter. He liked the fellow in spite of his equivocations. I should step around and say a word. You know what, with one thing and another, I did not return to my office yesterday, and only learned of Wolf's illness and this affair an hour ago. I had hoped to arrive in time to mediate the matter. And now, if you gentlemen have no better plans, wait a moment, and then we shall breakfast at the public house. He trotted off around the loft. Merriweather felt a little faint, weak in the knees, as reaction set in. He would welcome breakfast with a bit of brandy and a cup of tea first. 
but he could not help speculating even at this moment as to the cause that had detained Tom yesterday afternoon. Mrs. Raffles unquestionably. And then for a moment he again envied Raffles and coveted Livy. The breakfast in the tavern was pleasant, and the brandy calmed his nerves. Raffles charmed Buttram and Larkin with his flow of wit and comment. Ready to depart, Raffles asked, You have at least another several days before you are ready for sea, I suppose? No, I don't think so. The boatswain expected to have the topmast in place this afternoon and all the rigging set up by tomorrow. I would expect a sortie early the next day. Most regrettable. You will miss our Ides of March route just a fortnight off. Everyone dressed as a character from Julius Caesar. Oh, it will be a gay occasion, continued Raffles. But there is a minor entertainment tomorrow night, sponsored by the garrison, and I am commissioned by the commandant to invite the officers of the ships in port. It was an hour into the forenoon watch when they came back on board. Buttram handed over the cased pistols to Totten for cleaning and went below to see Wolfe. Merriweather stopped to look at the topmast, now with lines laid out to be hooked on. We're setting up the tackles to lift her into place now, volunteered Lyle, the junior boatswain's mate. There were men in the fore and mizzen rigging spinning an intricate web of blocks and lines. Dobbs and Hamlin, followed by McCamey, approached him with inarticulate congratulations on his successful encounter. Merriweather went below to find the carpenter's mates, freed from work on the mast, replacing his skylight, a box of glass panes set carefully to the side. He found the cabin untenable, however, and went back on deck. Hell, there was no place to rest. Even the wardroom furniture was being polished. His restless mood persisted, but he decided to go back ashore and walk about, exploring the town and island. While he waited for the gig to be brought around, he saw one of the dockyard workboats being sculled toward the gangway. The workman only handed up a folded paper to the watch and sculled back toward the landing. He wondered if it were a writ procured by MacDonald from the magistrate as the messenger brought it over to him. After MacDonald's wrath yesterday afternoon, anything was possible. He broke the seal and read the message written in a large hand. Honoured sir, I see you fight that Royal Navy swell a bit ago and you done well, what with the sun in your eyes. I think you pay two pounds four shillings more than used spar is worth and I credit your E.E. E. by this amount. Captain MacDonald, Superintendent. Chapter 11 There was a substantial bazaar in Georgetown, and Merriweather was soon strolling through the crowds it attracted in this island of almost 15,000 persons of varied races. He saw wares from Siam, Burma, Java, India, and a few from China displayed along the narrow way. Some of the hopeful merchants had regular stalls with racks and tables, while others squatted in the dust, their stock in trade heaped about them within arm's reach. It suddenly occurred to him that he owed the Raffles pair a gift for the hospitality they had extended, and he began to look with more purpose. He hesitated over a display of jade and filigreed gold, then decided such items were not appropriate. Toward the end of the way he came to a decrepit bungalow almost overgrown with flowering vines. Half obscured over its veranda was a weathered sign, Prize Agent. Beyond was open country rising to the hills with scattered dwellings. This place did not look as though it had much custom, here at the end of the marketplace. A woman came out of a byway ahead, European by colour but grossly fat, with a skirt that exposed legs in white cotton, swollen like sausages. Ave, ducks, she said, exposing blackened, broken teeth in a smile. How about it? 
Only ten shillings and change your luck. No, said Merriweather, stepping to the side for her to pass. She pressed on toward him, exuding a powerful odour of gin and stale sweat, saying, Now don't you be bashful, and if it's a bit short you are, why five will do. Merriweather turned to escape the woman and went up on the veranda of the prize agent, leaving her muttering curses before she rolled on down through the bazaar. Ah, said a disembodied voice. Oh, Dolly's early today. Must be out of gin. Merriweather paused to let his eyes adjust to the shade after the blinding glare of the sun outside. There was an old man sitting in an armchair propped against the wall at the end of the veranda. You would not have passed her by ten years ago when she first came here. A raving beauty she were, and I used to stop around to see her too in those days. But gin and the syphilis and the climate has done her in. And what can I do for you, Captain? Well, he commenced. I'm not sure. I was looking for something as a gift. Don't have much any more, interposed the man. Merriweather could now see that he wore a patch over his left eye and that close-cropped white whiskers covered his cheeks and chin. Since the company made this place a presidency, there's no prize business any more. I come down here with Captain Francis Light from Co Fouquet in 86 and built this house. There was nothing here but jungle and a Malay village over there. Captain Light, he was commissioned in your Bombay Marine too. Called the head man of the village on board and tried to hire them to clear the land for this settlement. Work? Why, those chiefs laughed at him even when he showed them a sack of silver coin. More than one way to skin a cat, says Captain Light and sends a party ashore to set up a flagstaff on the beach. Have to fire a salute to the flag now, he says. Seven guns. Well, the gunner loads the nine-pounder battery, and Captain Light pours out full of coin down each muzzle. Now fire the salute, he tells the gunner, and seven charges of silver pieces goes flying over into the bush. The old man chortled at the recollection. They dove right over the side and swam ashore. He stopped to laugh again. And in three weeks, them natives had skinned this place off to bare ground looking for the coins. Captain Light laid out his gridiron of streets for Georgetown, just like they are now. And the bag of dollars not half empty. I used to do a monstrous trade. I was second only to James Scott in the trade here. Of course, they was mostly pirates, but they're good sold as well as any and came cheap. I made my pile, and now I mostly just sit here and watch to see what the fools in government else will do next. The man spat over the railing of the veranda. They call this a presidency like it was Bombay or Madras. He snorted in contempt. We got a sick governor, too. And that young dandy raffles with his fancy waistcoat and gold chain smiling like a mule eating briars and going behind your back ruling the place. Bah! And they say he married that woman in exchange for his appointment. He snorted again and Merriweather wondered if he had escaped the attentions of the prostitute only to fall into the clutches of this garrulous old man. Well, I still got a few things to sell. Look about, Captain. Merriweather hesitated to enter the dim interior, then decided he had nothing better to do and went in. There was a mishmash of goods, furniture, china, bolts of silk, muskets, fowling pieces, pistols and swords of every description, even a spinning wheel in the corner, all jumbled together without pretense of order. At first glance he saw nothing that remotely resembled a gift to a couple in appreciation of courtesy, hospitality and assistance, and turned to leave. "'Don't see anything, eh, Captain?' 
said the old man, unexpectedly standing in the doorway. And about what did you have in mind to spend? Why, said Merriweather, a little disconcerted, I might go as much as five pounds. I have just the thing. The man stepped over to a corner of the room and moved several rolls of matting to expose a Chinese desk, lacquered black and inlaid with mother-of-pearl and graceful silver designs, almost the duplicate of one he had seen last year in the company's hong outside Canton. Had it a long time, grumbled the old man. Dusty, but sound. He shouted in Malay and two men came in to carry it to the veranda and wipe it clean. It was sound, and a beautiful piece, Merriweather decided, and would make a useful addition to the raffle sitting room. I'll take it, he said, fishing for his money. And can you find me a dray? Ahem! I was going to knock a pound off for the price of your shoot in that iron mighty Ackroyd, said the old man. But since you're going to give the desk to that fellow Raffles, I'll have to penalise you a pound. So, that makes five pounds net. Merriweather was startled. The man apparently could read minds, but he paid without comment. And the dray? My men will take it in the car. Will you go along? They stopped by Government House and he intercepted Raffles dashing down the hall. I've a meeting of the council, and then I must verify the books of account with the resident. I am delighted with the gift, but take it on. Livy may even give you lunch. At the bungalow, the two Malays set the desk on the veranda as Merriweather knocked. The girl admitted him. It was a few minutes before Mrs. Raffles appeared, wearing a yellow silk dressing gown, her hair tucked under a white scarf. Why, Commodore, this is an unexpected pleasure. I slept late and just finished bathing. Tom was called out before daybreak about that duel this morning. But who won it? Wolf or Ackroyd? Merriweather became aware as she moved across the light of the shaded window that the yellow silk gown was all Livy wore. Wolf, by proxy, he managed, feeling a wave of heat and shifting his gaze. And what I came for was to give you and Tom a token of my appreciation for your hospitality. He told me to bring it on since he is otherwise engaged. May I have it brought in? He opened the door, and the two men carried in the desk. Merriweather handed each a shilling, and they left. Why, it's beautiful! Simply beautiful! Livy was obviously pleased and came over to run her fingers across the inlays. Thank you! He caught a whiff of her scent as she turned, threw her arms about his neck, and kissed him hard upon the lips. Passion flamed. He had coveted this woman and envied Raffles ever since he had met her. He kissed her back with ardour, feeling the firm body under the yellow silk press against him and was suddenly aware that he could have Livy this instant if he only pressed his attentions. Merriweather had no idea of her past before she married Tom, but she was older in years and experience than either Raffles or he. Then he knew that however compliant she might be, he could not face himself if he cuckolded that likable young man in his own house. He did not want such a matter between them, he disengaged and stepped back. That was quite the nicest thanks I ever received, he told her lightly. And now I must be back on the ship. We raised that new topmast this afternoon and I shall be there. He courteously brushed aside her protests. He had survived temptation and he did not dare expose himself further. At the public house on the way to the landing, he had two gins and lemon already a little remorseful that he had not pressed his advantage, then went on to the ship. The cabin was redolent of paint and putty, but the skylight was whole again, and the windsail was diverting a pleasant portion of the breeze inside. 
He slept the afternoon away, unmindful of the thumps, shouts, and footfalls on deck as the topmast rose into place. Wolf died an hour into the midwatch the next morning. Buttram awoke him and he went around to see the waxen yellow face, already shrunken so that the bones stood out. He'll have to be buried ashore, Buttram reminded him, and it should be by noon today in this climate. And now, Captain, I feel compelled to do a post-mortem dissection to see if I can find the cause of his death. Will you give permission? Certainly, if I have the authority. In the absence of an ex of kin and as the commander of the force to which he was attached, I feel certain you have the power. Very well, I'll enter the matter in the log. And Dyer, will you call the carpenter? When the carpenter came, Merriweather told him, No rest for the weary, Mr. Svensson. Can you put together a coffin tonight? The carpenter went off muttering to rouse his mates and the sound of hammering and sawing lasted until after daybreak. McCamey took a party armed with picks and shovels over to the fort to open the grave in the military cemetery to the north, while Merriweather went back to Georgetown to find the vicar of the Church of England. He sent word to Raffles of the time and place of the services, and then induced the commandant of the garrison to furnish a caisson to transport the coffin from the landing to the place of sepulture. He had to obtain the Marine Guard of Honour from Comet. His own detachment was occupied with the prize. The services were held just before noon, a surprising turnout appearing from the European community, the ladies sheltering under parasols. Twenty men each from Rapid and Comet marched in the procession, and there was even a contingent from Argus led by Lieutenant Wyatt and two midshipmen. He saw Livy and Tom in the group, as the vicar, a tall, raw-boned man in flapping vestments, read the service. Merriweather head bowed, wondered at the vagaries of fate that had brought Wolf to lie for eternity here in this island in the tropics halfway around the world from England. The crash of the volleys, muffled in this green amphitheatre, made him jump and he was glad to go with the officers from Comet, Rapid and Argus to the public house for a quick drink afterward. He had just finished a gin and lemon when Buttram caught his eye. Let me see you a moment, Captain. They stepped around to the alcove where the party had dined three nights ago. Sir, I have, in effect, an apology to make to Wolf. Fortunately, I listened to you last week and did not take the drastic action of certifying him as insane. Buttram was dead in earnest, face shining with sweat in the midday heat. And since he is gone, I can only make it to you, so that your report may be written to reflect the true state of affairs. Yes, said Merriweather, wondering what the doctor was getting at. I was wrong, dead wrong, when I said the man was insane, Captain. I should have recognized the symptoms since I have observed such a case twice before. The headaches, dizzy spells and clumsiness, instead of trying to be clever and making a diagnosis from his actions by applying the theories of Mesmer and Pinel. Buttram wiped his brow and turned to look out the window. I comfort myself, Captain, he continued slowly by the thought that even if I had made an accurate and early diagnosis, there is no cure for the malady. Have you confirmed the disorder? Yes, I did the dissection this morning. First off, I opened the skull. I had to go no further. There it was, a horrible crab-shaped growth, a tumour. It had displaced one lobe of the brain and finally choked off the flow of blood causing unconsciousness and coma. Buttram turned back to Merriweather. Of course he died quickly after that. No possibility of getting liquids into him and in this climate. Merriweather turned the matter over in his mind. He had attributed Wolf's erratic behaviour these past weeks to insanity, drink or some innate defect of character. But during the past few days, 
the man had exhibited still another personality change, and he had come almost to like him. He wondered for a moment what Wolf might have been had he not suffered from that horrible disorder that had warped his mind and changed his personality. He had certainly been more likable in the terminal stages, and may well have come full circle in the progress of the disease. No need to blame yourself, Doctor. You say yourself there is no treatment for the malady. There is nothing in my report so far that reflects upon Wolf, and there will not be. Thank you. And have another drink. He had almost decided not to go to the entertainment at the garrison, knowing that Raffles and Livy would be there. His conscience was clear. He had stopped short. But he would never be at ease in their presence again. Still Major Anderson, the Commandant, had made a special point of reiterating the invitation to the affair, and as a matter of courtesy and inter-service relations he had felt compelled to accept. By the end of the first dog-watch, McCamey and Tompkins came to the cabin. Sir, said McCamey, the mainmast is complete, set up, yards crossed, sails bent on and brailed up. We'll have to take up some on the shrouds and stays once we've been in a seaway a bit, chimed in the bosun. The new cordage will stretch, of course. Of course, said Merriweather. You have been magnificent, both of you, and I intend to get under way north at daybreak. He looked at the splinted arm suspended in its sling. Your wound is healing, Tompkins? Yes, sir. Doctor says there's no sign of infection. Very well. Mr. McCamey, please pass the word to make all preparations for getting under way tomorrow morning. Merriweather sat back to consider the next phase of the operation. The French captain had insisted on the truth of his statement made to Wolfe as to the rendezvous off Co Fouquet, but the time he had given was long past. Still, two of the privateers had been found here in the Strait of Malacca and the interrogation of their officers had failed to reveal any such plan or any lead as to the possible whereabouts of the fourth cruiser. The likeliest area would be northward, along the shipping routes to Rangoon and Calcutta, what with Argus now backing commission and patrolling the strait area. All the officers of the prizes had been transferred to a prisoner-of-war camp maintained by the garrison but it lacked facilities for the large crew of Mercure, and Larkin would have to take it in the prize to Calcutta. He could escort him part of the way, but it would be up to Larkin and Gunny to keep control of the French crew, and he did not envy them their assignment. His thoughts jumped from the impending operation to Livy. The remarks of the retired prize agent intrigued him. He wondered if the rumour that Raffles had exchanged his marriage to her for the appointment as secretary here at Penang had any basis in fact. He was capable of such a bargain, but the young man appeared devoted to her, and Livy was a charmer. He regretted for a moment again that he had not pressed his advantage yesterday, and then immediately concluded that his instinct had been correct. He wondered a moment more about Kate Hartley, whether she had decided to marry Pickens, the first officer of the Duchy of Lancaster, accompanying him to Ceylon, and thence back to England. Obviously, she did not care to be reminded of that casual liaison that Livy had procured now that a suitor with the intention of marriage had appeared. He came full circle to Lady Caroline, the vision of her face and hair now distinct in his mind. On short acquaintance, she was a difficult person to understand. He speculated that she had plunged into her almost mystical preoccupation with poetry and literature in an unconscious effort to forget her dead husband and absent child. Perhaps, if she was still about when he returned to Calcutta, he would try to jar her out of the mood. In the meantime, he was reading the plays of Shakespeare and a collection of the poetry of Walter Scott in Buttram's small library, in an effort to discover for himself their fascination for her. The party in the armory was much as he had anticipated. 
Merriweather decided after listening to an Irish sergeant sing saccharine ballads of home, mother and faithless love in a high tenor voice, followed by a young lady who gave a medley of romantic lyrics, most of them impossible to follow, while fiddles and flutes accompanied her. He sat in a group composed of Major Anderson and his wife, the Raffles, Mr. Winningham and his wife, Kate Hartley and Mr. Pickens, and several junior officers of the garrison. The musical renditions came to an end, and the audience drifted to the other end of the armory where a buffet and punch bowls had been established, served by Malays under the direction of the same Irish vocalist who had just performed. One of the captains came up and touched his arm. Commodore, you'll not want any of that swill. Come with me. He led Merriweather back to a small room, already full of officers, where two corporals were serving spirits neat. He took a glass of gin and a quarter of lemon, and eased back out of the room, finding a place in the corner of the armory to sip his drink, standing there watching groups gather, mingle, and melt into others. He would stay, he decided, only long enough to satisfy the requirements of courtesy. He was sick of this island of Penang, he thought. It brought death, unpleasantness, an affair of honour, and temptation to him. And he hoped that he would never call here again. He finished the gin and went over to place the empty glass on a tray. As he turned, he found Kate Hartley in his way, and bowed, looking past her for Mr. Pickens. Ah, Commodore, she said in a low voice. And are you enjoying the occasion? He was startled at the warmth in her voice after the deliberate snub at the governor's ball. Why, yes, I suppose so, he replied. Kate drew him back into the corner, and he followed reluctantly. Now, she said, Mr. Pickens has asked me to marry him, but I've not yet given him an answer. She looked up at him with luminous, expectant eyes. Merriweather was astounded. The woman was quite evidently inviting a proposal of marriage from him. Livy had sounded him out on the subject some days ago, and he thought he had diverted her with his lie. Then the matter had appeared to become academic with the intervention of Pickens. Yet here was Kate, tremulous as a girl, telling him she was uncommitted, with the evident expectation that he would seek her hand. The woman was attractive, but since that heartbreak last Christmas when he found that Flora Dean had married Lord Laddie in his absence, he had entertained no thoughts of marriage. The matter was delicate. He had no desire to offend. But he had no desire to be caught up in a marriage to a widow in Georgetown either. He elected to misunderstand her. I am delighted, Mrs. Hartley, he said, and I wish you all good fortune in your new life with Mr. Pickens. An expression of disappointment crossed Kate's face, followed by a flush of anger. You, she commenced, then paused. You are obviously not a gentleman of perception and breeding, she blurted illogically, then turned and marched away. Merriweather escaped to the temporary sanctuary of the spirits bar, and mopped his brow in relief as he considered for a moment the unfathomable nature of woman. It was only a few minutes. His glass was barely half empty when Pickens sought him out. With the commencement of the dancing, the little room had emptied of all save Macrae, nursing his glass of Scots whisky and making desultory conversation with one of the corporals, who spoke with the accent of Inverness, and two of the garrison officers. Merriweather! Pickens was a man taller and broader than he, with a blunt, weathered face, and obviously nervous. Yes, said Merriweather a little sharply, nettled at the tone. Pickens hesitated, unsure of himself, and then commenced lamely. Kate, Mrs. Hartley, that is, is much upset by your boorish conduct toward her. The accusation came out almost as though by rote. 
Evidently, this officer was no more experienced in affairs of honour than Merriweather had been a few days ago. Merriweather felt indignation rise in him. He had certainly not been boorish toward the woman, though she might feel herself scorned, and he was sure he could take the measure of this company maritime service officer, either with pistols or swords. He opened his mouth to issue the challenge, but checked himself. A fortuitous involuntary movement of his head yesterday morning had saved his life. The subsequent wounding of Ackroyd had given him a taste of blood, and was making him a ruffler and a bully here, already anticipating the duel with this plain, honest, uneasy man. Hell! He was like the others, a successful encounter, and he was ready to take any offence to the field of honour. Kate Hartley certainly was not worth it to him nor to her anxious champion standing here before him. He had no idea of what face she had put on the thing in making her complaint to Pickens, but it did not matter. He was suddenly sick of the entire affair, and despised himself most of all for even considering fighting a duel on such flimsy grounds. Why, Mr. Pickens, I had no idea that I had offended Mrs. Hartley in any particular. She informed me of the approaching event, matrimony with you, and I offered my felicitations to her, as I now extend my heartiest congratulations to you. If I was clumsy in expressing myself, I offer my abject apologies and beg her forgiveness. He bowed, as Macrae, the garrison officers, and the two corporals looked on in amazement. And now I must return to my ship, since we weigh anchor at dawn. He bowed again and went out to find Anderson, Raffles and Livy and to take his leave. Pickens did not follow him. Part 2 Ile de France Chapter 12 The hounds were in full cry northwestwardly up the Bay of Bengal. Rapid, her gun crew standing easy was positioned a mile and a half off the starboard quarter of the big French schooner, while Comet was to leeward just above her beam. With the wind steady out of the northeast, the two could instantly counter any move the Frenchman might make to escape, and she would soon run out of sea room against the Sunderbund's coast and the shifting sands off the Ganges Delta. With only an hour of the forenoon watch gone, the hounds were in no haste to close in for the kill. They could take this fox at their leisure. Set the flying jib, the captain called to Lieutenant Dobbs. Come a point to port, he told the quartermaster. He saw the manoeuvre accomplished and drifted toward the lee rail. Rapid was desperately short-handed after furnishing her share of the prize crews for three French privateers. Every idler in the ship was now distributed among the gun crews. The captain's eye ran over them, stolid and competent at their stations, and reflected that most of them were well into the second year of their enlistments. Somehow he would have to convince them to re-enlist within the next few months or else find and train a new crew. Forward, he saw the round-shouldered figure of Mr. McCamey, the second lieutenant, beside the long nine-pounder pivot gun. Larkin, his first lieutenant, together with the entire Sepoy Marine detachment, had been sent into the last prize taken two weeks ago. That ship had been so crammed with men that it was essential she be under resolute command, even with the precaution of distributing her officers and leading seamen among the ships of his squadron. McCamey had no flair for gunnery, but Totten, the gunner's mate, would set the sights and lay the gun. The schooner still showed no colours, but her identity was plain. The alteration of course and additional sail area had almost exactly balanced one another. Rapid was closing on her prey, but the relative bearing remained unchanged. In another quarter hour, he might try a ranging shot with the bow chaser. He hoped Tiger, the big top-heavy brig with her fourteen twenty-four-pounder carronades, was on station off the Delta. An overwhelming show of force might persuade that French captain to surrender without a serious engagement. 
Captain Percival Merriweather of the Honourable East India Company's Bombay Marine braced himself against the bulwarks, his eye automatically measuring the steady gain on the privateer. It had been an interminable three months at sea, patrolling the eastern approaches to the Hooghly River in the Bay of Bengal, a period of unremitting vigilance and tedious boredom, with the additional weight of responsibility for the Bengal squadron upon his shoulders. Even the courtesy title of Commodore given him as the officer in tactical command had failed to cheer Merriweather's spirits. Fortunately, he thought this day might conclude the cruise. Intelligence had reported only four commerce raiders from Mauritius, though in the past six months they had taken shipping of the value of more than three hundred thousand pounds, and three of them had been captured since the new year. It was amazing, Merriweather thought cynically, how a few thousand pounds now safely invested in the company could change a man's outlook. Last year, a pauper dependent upon his pay as a captain in the marine, he had been eager for continued employment at sea. Now, after a little luck in the way of prize money, he resented this confinement in a ship at sea. He was approaching middle age, he considered. He had turned twenty-nine last New Year's Day. He had neither wife nor family, and by his own cross-grained stupidity last year had lost to another man the woman he loved. Inevitably the thought brought to mind Lady Caroline Austen, niece by marriage of Sir George Barlow, the acting governor of India. She was a beautiful woman, with her red-gold hair and stately carriage, younger than he by five years, but widowed since Trafalgar and the mother of a five-year-old son in England. Sir George and Lady Barlow had almost transparently thrown her in his way, had made him her dinner partner at several of the entertainments during the holiday season while his squadron outfitted for this operation. Lady Barlow had confided that Caroline had been deeply grieved by the loss of her husband, that her family had sent her on this visit to give her a change of scene. Well, in that respect, she was in no different category than the other hundreds of young ladies who came out each year to Calcutta, Bombay, or Madras for extended visits, in the hope of finding a husband, or escaping an undesirable suitor in England. Still, Lady Caroline was a different sort of woman, Merriweather decided, different from most of the women he had known. She had no fund of small talk to bridge the intervals at dinner, and appeared to have only the politest interest in the foibles and scandals of Calcutta society. The second time he had been paired with her at dinner, the man to her right had made some mention of a poet named Walter Scott. It was as though a spillway had opened. She poured forth a torrent of quotation and comment, leaving Merriweather silent and forgotten beside her. The next day, he had found some of the work she had mentioned in the canteen at Fort William, and had undertaken to improve his education. It was difficult. He had no ear for poetry, but found Shakespeare a bit more palatable since he could follow the storyline. Armed with this knowledge, he was able to lead her on and at least carry on a conversation. During the past three months, he had read more widely through the monotonous days between actions, and had even exhausted the small library that Dr. Buttram owned, a souvenir of his days at Cambridge. Probably it was wasted time. He had no idea whether Lady Caroline considered him to be a suitor, or, for that matter, whether he desired to be so considered. Merriweather drifted toward the starboard side, checking the compass as he passed. Almost within range, he decided, measuring the distance with his eyes. He saw Dobbs's expectant gaze and turned aside, ignoring him. Against the weather bulwark, his view of the quarry was obstructed, and he soon moved back to leeward. The thought of Lady Caroline's widowhood was uncomfortable, as was the recollection of her unknown child in England with his grandparents. The title she bore was by courtesy of her late husband, he knew. She had none of her own. If she married him, she would automatically become plain Mrs. Merriweather. This thought was even more uncomfortable. 
It served to resurrect demons he had painfully exercised last year when he hoped to marry Flora Dean. There was, he assured himself, no record in the company or the marine to prove his illegitimacy. His grandfather, the old groom on Lord Spencer's estate in Surrey, had simply signed the articles as guardian of an orphaned twelve-year-old boy, apprenticing him to the ship's husband of the Indiaman Dunvegan Castle. Yet in marriage there must be some inquiry as to his antecedents. If he had children, they might demand to know their pedigree, even if the wife was discreet enough not to press the point. He thought of his mother, worn out by the struggle to rear her bastard son, dead at twenty-nine, and wished savagely for a moment that he might find and take revenge upon the man who had wronged her by fathering him. Hellfire! This was almost as absurd as some of the Greek tragedies he had read in translation last month. With an effort, he focused his attention on the privateer. She was within range. Sail ho! came the hail from the masthead. Two points on the starboard bow! There was a brief pause, then... Looks like tiger, sir. Signals, called Merriweather. To Comet and Tiger. Engage the enemy. He shouted forward to McCamey. You may fire when ready. The trap had been sprung. Tiger was in a fortunate position to run down before the wind and intercept the Frenchman. With nowhere to go, it would be hopeless for the French captain to fight against these odds. The spitefully splitting report of the pivot gun cracked out. Merriweather caught the splash in the field of his glass just to starboard of the schooner, before the powder smoke momentarily obscured his view. Even while the gun crew was sponging out, the Frenchman altered course and came up into the wind. She ran up colours, then hauled them down and hoisted a white flag. While Rapid ran down to starboard, Merriweather watched Comet round to and station herself a cable's length off the port quarter of the prize, ready for any trick that might be attempted. McRae in Comet was an excellent officer, entirely deserving of the promotion he had gained last year at Bombay. Rapid rounded two, and the port battery was run out, a grim deterrent to any treachery in the mind of the French captain. You may take a boarding party, but Tiger will furnish the prize crew, Merriweather told the hovering Dobbs. Tiger had not contributed to a prize crew, and still had her full complement of officers. He looked forward, and found her almost hull up. Flag to Tiger, he told the quartermaster. Man the prize. Evans is master. The boats from Comet and Rapid reached the schooner almost simultaneously, just as the prize unaccountably sagged off to leeward, seemingly out of control. Merriweather snatched the glass from the rack. The rudder was jammed hard over to port. Some die-hard had cut the tiller ropes. He saw Dobbs lead a rush aft, lining the Frenchman on the poop up against the rail, while another party disappeared below. It was only a matter of minutes until he saw the rudder move midships, then to starboard, while seamen tailed onto the sheets and the ship came back under control, hove to again. Evidently only the lines to the wheel had been cut, while the relieving tackles below remained intact. Still there would be a delay while the boatswain's mates rove new lines to the helm. Tiger came lumbering down and hove to hoisting out her launch almost immediately and filling it with the prize crew. Morrison was a good officer in a clumsy, unhandy ship that had been designed to carry the maximum number of guns with a minimum of draught. He heard seven bells strike and decided it would be more than an hour before the schooner was ready to get under way. Private! Official! Merriweather called to the signal quartermaster. Captains, come on board! With time to waste, it might as well be improved with a brief social gathering over lunch. The sea was calm, and even a conscientious commander could leave his ship for this brief period. Sang, he called down the companionway. The little Hindu steward emerged. 
Dinner for three. No, four, he said, catching sight of Dr. Buttram emerging from his cockpit below. And set out the spirits as well. He regretted he could not yet authorize the issue of a ration of grog to the crew. With the boarding party away, there would be endless confusion. Better to wait an hour for its return. Little Macrae was first aboard, a smile creasing his saturnine face as the pipes twittered. Captain Morrison, thin and intense, was close behind. In the cabin, Merriweather proposed a quick toast. To his majesty, God bless him, and may this commission soon be ended. The amens echoed about the table. Even Dr. Buttram had taken brandy instead of claret. Now, gentlemen, continued Merriweather, I am of the opinion that our immediate mission is complete. Sir George and Admiral Pellew had information of four privateers. Thanks to your efforts, they are now ours. Is there a contrary opinion? He paused, conscious of the fact that both these officers were older than he in years, if not in experience at sea. He was ready to listen to any recommendation. That actually was all they could offer, but it would have to be exceedingly persuasive to change his mind at this point. He realized again how tired he was, feeling the compelling necessity to escape the prison of command in this ship and of the squadron if only for a fortnight. I don't disagree, sir, spoke up Macrae. I'm down to the last pannikin of lime juice, and I reduced the water ration by a third three days ago. Nor I, rumbled Morrison in this startling bass voice coming from so spare a figure. I have enough supplies yet. Took on some from a storeship off the Sandheads last month. But the men are restive. A run ashore would be most welcome, sir. Clear the air. Agree, gentlemen. As soon as the Frenchman is ready, we sail for the Hooghly and Calcutta. If the wind holds, we shall be off the Sandheads by midnight. Now, another drink before we dine. Only Buttram declined. Sang was clearing the table, and the two captains were shuffling their feet in the restive fashion that indicated they would prefer to be dismissed when the messenger knocked. Come, invited Merriweather. Sir, Mr. Dobbs and the launch are alongside, and he says, Please, sir, can Dr. Buttram come on deck? Certainly, said Merriweather, looking at Buttram. You may be excused, Doctor. And, gentlemen, delightful as this occasion has been, we must be about our duties. Give the gigs a hail, he told the messenger, and call away the boatswain's mate and side boys. On deck, waiting for Macrae's gig to hook on the ladder. Merriweather was conscious of other activity at the port gangway. Buttram was standing by while a boatswain's mate rigged a whip through a block at the end of the boom. The pipes squealed. He shook Macrae's hand and saw him over the side. Curiosity compelled him to move across the deck as the seaman walked away with the line. Handsomely, shouted the boatswain's mate. Vast even! Now lower away, handsomely, damn you! The object dangling in the cat's cradle at the end of the line was a litter, improvised from planks and canvas and steadied by hand lines at either end. It touched the deck with a barely perceptible thump, bringing forth another stream of maledictions from the boatswain's mate. Lying on the litter was a shadow of a man, every bone outlined under the blackened skin. Only the eyes, unnaturally large in the hollow sockets of the skull, appeared to be alive. The eyes moved searchingly back and forth. Apparently the man was too weak to move his head, seeking something. Buttram knelt beside him, felt his pulse, his forehead, pulled his lower lip down to expose the gum, then prodded two fingers gently against the abdomen just below the breastbone. The wince was barely noticeable, but then the roving eyes caught sight of Merriweather standing behind Buttram. Sir! The croak startled Merriweather as though it had come from a corpse. I am Logi. Havildar in the 3rd Company, 1st Bombay Marine Battalion. I have escaped from Mauritius. Merriweather had heard of no marine prisoners on Mauritius 
that the identity of this man and his bona fides would be simple to confirm once Gunny, commander of Rapid's marine force, was back on board. Very well, Logie. You are safe in the Bombay Marine Cruiser Rapid. Now, Doctor, see what you can do for the Havildar. The staring eyes rested their gaze a moment on Merriweather's scarred face, then closed wearily as Buttram directed the removal of the litter to his sick bay forehead. Mr. Dobbs, may I see you in my cabin once we are underway? Merriweather began. Then he told McKamey to make sail. He could see the gigs being hoisted in on Tiger and Comet, and the preparatory flag was now too blocked at the masthead of the prize. He remained on deck until the squadron was underway with the Frenchman carefully shepherded along between the ships. Dobbs knocked and entered half an hour later. Yes, sir. Have a chair, Mr. Dobbs. Tell me what you know about that apparition you brought aboard. Dobbs settled his thick frame back into the chair, and his pale eyes sought the lamp swinging overhead. He was not the most articulate man aboard, thought Merriweather, but he had proved to be a dependable if unimaginative officer since he had come aboard nine months ago. Sir, we made a search of the Frenchy as always. There was a Lazare aft below a boatswain's locker. The hatch was padlocked. Naturally, I broke it open and found the man inside. I thought he was dead, but then he moved and cried out. The French steward could speak a little English. He said the man was a prisoner, had escaped from Mauritius and stowed away. When he began to starve, he came out and was caught. The captain put him back there, a gill of water and a biscuit a day to teach the marine dog a lesson. It was quite the longest speech Merriweather had ever heard from Dobbs. And yet, there was a story. Bartram would do his best to save the man's life in the meantime. Thank you, Dobbs. May I say that I've been most pleased with your performance of duty this cruise, and shall say so in my report to Bombay Castle. Dobbs's blunt face was red as he rose, stammered his thanks, and escaped. Two hours later, Buttram knocked and entered. Never saw a man in worse condition from scurvy and plain starvation and still alive he said cheerfully. He's a challenge to all the medical science old Dr. Gray tried to teach me. He can't retain water, lime juice, spirits. It all comes right up. So I've had some sugar teats made. Sugar teats? demanded Merriweather, remembering the soggy rags he had seen protruding from the mouths of grubby infants. Well, on the same order, sir. A rag wrapped about a bit of sponge and soaked in sugared lime juice. It keeps the mouth moist, and some liquid is bound to drip into him. If I can get enough into him to strengthen him, he has a chance of life. Very well, Doctor. We should be in Calcutta by day after tomorrow night. The young man's face lighted up. I hope I may have leave, sir. Jennifer? Certainly. Of course, your son might be at the landing to greet you. I hope not. I want a full-term child, and I should be with Jennifer when her time comes. Merriweather resisted with difficulty repeating the hoary naval chestnut that the father had to be present when the keel was laid, but not for the launching. Once Buttram had left, Merriweather found himself reading the reports left with him by McRae and Morrison comparing them with the reports he had completed for each phase of the operation. He must have his own overall report in hand for the Commodore and Governor-General upon arrival at Calcutta, and with the necessity of being on deck for the ascent of the Hooghly River, it was not too soon to commence. Dusk had fallen, and the pilot boat was in sight when he completed the chore. Chapter 13 Merriweather's estimated time of arrival was in error. It was almost noon the third day when the flotilla came in sight of the anchorage off the dockyard at Calcutta. At the point where Rapid had been accustomed to anchor, there was a towering frigate moored bow and stern. Merriweather recognized her before he could make out the pennant flying at her masthead. Pitt, 36, 
built and launched two years ago at Bombay by the Parsi shipbuilder Jam Setji and now flagship of Commodore Sir John Waldron, Commandant of the Marine. Deck there! Signals! came the hail from the foretop. Hamlin, midshipman of the watch, sprang up the starboard ratlines and focused his glass. Merriweather reflected that three months at sea under the demanding eye of Larkin and the heavy-handed tutelage of Dobbs had erased some of young Hamlin's sulky reluctance to do a day's work at sea. No salutes, Hamlin translated. Captains, come on board. It was typical of Waldron, Merriweather thought. A practical man, certainly entitled to the honour, to avoid the waste of powder and disturbance of the native population. He was happy that he would be able to report that Mr. Hamlin, son of the Commodore's dearest friend, was shaping up and might become a competent warrant officer. He had opened his mouth to give the order when he heard Hamlin's command to the signal quartermaster to repeat the signal to the squadron. The boy was learning. Rapid came to anchor and carried out a stern anchor. Only then did Merriweather order the gig over. He remained on deck to see the other ships moored, the prize safely between Comet and Tiger, the Bombay Marine ensign flying proudly over the tricolor. Sang had his full-dress uniform laid out. He came on deck five minutes later, buckling on his sword and descended to the gig as the pipe wailed. Waldron, in company with Commodore Land, master attendant at Calcutta, and Tollett, his flag captain, received the three officers in his cabin. Broad-shouldered and balding, he was not distinguished in appearance, but his abilities were unquestioned. Welcome, gentlemen. I see the Bengal squadron has completed its mission. Now, where do I employ you? Merriweather was stricken. He glanced at McCrae and Morrison, standing impassively by his side. No comfort there. Sir, I think we must refit. Perhaps careen. Clean our bottoms. Waldron laughed. Tollett, take those reports from Merriweather. Be seated, gentlemen. This occasion calls for a round of toasts, and I want an informal report before I have to read those documents. The affair was soon over. In an hour... The toast had been drunk details of the capture of four French privateers extracted from Merriweather, McCrae, and Morrison, and a light luncheon consumed. Walden dismissed the group with a cheery, I shall see you gentlemen tonight. On deck, Commodore Land explained, Sir Thomas Jeffrey is entertaining, a dinner for the Honourable Alfred Robert Percy, one of his old friends in the Foreign Office, since your ships were reported from downstream, I am directed to invite you gentlemen to the affair. It begins at ten. The Commodore's barge hooked on at the gangway, and he went over the side as the pipes squealed. The dockyard workboat was pulling away as Merriweather's gig came alongside Rapid. Hamlin handed him a sealed letter. Forward. The purser and his mates were hauling the mailbags from the gangway to the shade of an awning to be opened and sorted. Merriweather continued below, cast off hat, sword and stock, and seated himself at the desk. The superscription was in the handwriting of Lady Caroline, he realised, as he broke the seal and unfolded the sheet. Dear Percival, well, that was a twist. Lady Caroline had been quite formal in her addresses to him, usually Commodore or My Dear Sir. It was, however, no more than a note of invitation to foregather at the Governor-General's palace an hour before the dinner, since he was to be her escort for the evening. Merriweather sat a moment looking at the brief note, trying to read some other deeper meaning into it, then laughed at himself. He shouted for the messenger to summon the officers and warrant officers. Liberty would be granted in an hour, but he wanted the task of refitting Rapid to commence tomorrow morning. Dr. Buttram had gone ashore with the mail boat, he soon discovered. Lady Caroline received Merriweather in her sitting room, extending her hand with apparent warmth. 
there was time for only the barest murmur of amenities before Sir George and Lady Barlow entered. Ah, Commodore, we are delighted at your safe return, and most successful too. Servants came in with wines and spirits. The party was joined by Mackintosh and Loxley, secretaries to the Governor-General, the Captain of the Guard, and three anonymous young ladies. Amidst the chatter, Merriweather did his best to be attentive and responsive to Lady Caroline. Her eyes were darker in this light than he remembered, but the red-gold hair glittered in the candlelight, and her complexion was unblemished. Truly a beautiful woman, widow or no, he decided. Wondering again if the Percival of the note meant she considered him a serious suitor. He was by no means sure of his own feelings and desires, he thought, finishing off the glass of dry sack. Sir George appeared to be more reserved tonight than Merriweather had ever seen him at such an affair as this. Ordinarily, he would dominate the occasion, but now he sat in a corner content to sip his wine without joining in the conversation. He kept his eye on the clock, however, and at a quarter of the hour decisively led the party out to the carriages to arrive at the entrance to Sir Thomas's residence on the stroke of ten. Merriweather, with Lady Caroline on his arm, took station in accordance with the whispered directions of Loxley. He was conscious of a blur of colour, the sounds of violin and flute in the distance becoming audible as the buzz of conversation ceased with the entrance of Sir George. He soon found himself making his bow to Sir Thomas and Lady Geoffrey and in turn being presented to the guest of honour. The Honourable Alfred Robert Percy was an alert man in his middle forties, with regular, unremarkable features that just missed being handsome. Ah, yes, Commodore, he said briskly. Thomas here was telling me of your voyage to China last year. Most interesting. I should like to talk to you at some point. I was out there almost twenty-five years ago and slipped into Canton myself. Indeed, sir. I don't imagine it has changed very much, but then I saw very little of the city. It will be interesting to compare notes, however. And now I see Thomas is ready to dine, Percy said in dismissal. There was dancing later, and Lady Caroline did not lack for partners. In her stately but graceful way she appeared to possess boundless energy. Sweating under his full dress coat from his exertions, Merriweather finally sought out the cloakroom he remembered and found it empty. Unbuttoning the coat, he opened it wide to catch the breeze at the window. He heard the door close behind him. Well, Commodore, will you share a bit of that breeze? said Percy, unbuttoning his coat. I'd forgotten how hot Calcutta can be in the spring. Certainly, sir replied Merriweather, moving aside. It was in 83 that I made a voyage out to China as supercargo in my cousin's ship, Carlton Castle. I had some notion of a career in the company, being a younger son, but when I got back to England I found a place in the Foreign Office, but I've been in that line ever since. He glanced sideways at Merriweather. The breeze was serving its purpose. The shirt no longer stuck to his ribs. I was ashore in the company factory outside Canton when I became acquainted with a young Chinese who spoke very passable English, not pidgin. He was being educated as a scholar, and was serving as something of an apprentice to the Ko Hong at the time. I invited him out to the ship to examine our sextant, charts, and chronometer. In turn... He invited me to his home. He dressed me in a robe, stained my face and hands, put a wig and cap on me, and I went along. Percy laughed deprecatingly. Don't know what would have happened had I been caught. I was tried by a court of inquiry at Bombay Castle last year for the same thing, said Merriweather. Yes, I know, but you accomplished your mission and then came clear. I spent three days ashore pretending to be a deaf-mute, attended two banquets, and saw most of the city. I found that Chinese family most hospitable. Percy looked again at Merriweather with a slight smile. My host even provided a companion for my bed. 
Well, thought Merriweather, customs did not change much in twenty-five years in China. I was treated to very much the same courtesy, sir, he managed. I thought as much, said Percy with a chuckle. We must discuss the specifics of Canton at greater length. And now, I must go back to Thomas and George. A guest of honour should at least be visible. By the way, Commodore, what part of England are you from? London, sir. Born and bred there until I went to sea. Oh, but you don't have the accent of Bow Bells. This is only the second time I've encountered the name Merriweather. Not a very common one. Merriweather turned and looked at Percy as he buttoned his coat. The man had a faraway expression on his face, staring out into the darkness. It's been thirty years, yes, thirty years this month, for I celebrated my sixteenth birthday there. Got a beautiful fowling piece as a gift. Still use it when I get back home. I spent the spring holidays with my cousins, the Spencers, in Surrey. I was mad about horses, still am, for that matter. There was a groom in charge of their stables named Merriweather, a quite knowledgeable horseman. I must have worried him half to death with questions. What kind of tack was best? Whether the Eclipse or Matcham lines were better stayers? My family bred from Eclipse. I did learn a great deal from him, and he had a pretty little daughter, just my age. Ah, we had a wonderful time, my cousins and I, that spring. Merriweather felt a hand of ice seize his heart. He stared at this man for a moment, seeing the bright blue eyes, the hair, once brown, now greying, the regular features not scarred or powder-burned. He did not trust himself to speak, but turned away, held the door open for Percy to precede him into the corridor, and escaped to search out Lady Caroline. It was three in the morning when Merriweather brought Lady Caroline back through the gates, past the sleepy guard, to be admitted to the entrance hall by the Indian doorman. His hopes of a good night kiss were dashed as he saw the door to the left leading into the library open, light streaming from it, and the shadow of Sir George looming in the doorway. Good night, my dear Lady Caroline. Merriweather murmured, bowing over her hand. It was a delightful evening. He straightened up as she passed through the curtained entrance at the end of the hall, conscious of the presence of the Governor-General. Come in a moment, Merriweather, said Barlow. In the library a cigar smouldered on a plate and a silver coffee service rested on the long table. Coffee? Merriweather poured a cup and took the chair indicated. Hell of an hour to be about, growled Sir George. But I couldn't sleep anyway. Different for you young sprouts. Dance all night and none the worse for the next day. He picked up the cigar, looked at it critically, and stubbed it out on the plate. I'll not deny it. I was upset by the news. I thought Burley would hold his ground, but he switched, went over to Minto, Lock, Stock and Barrel. He'll regret throwing mud in the eye of Wellesley some day, but too late for me. Merriweather felt blank. He did not understand what had happened and drank a bit of the coffee, as he saw that no reply was necessary. It happened last July. News only reached me in January, but it will probably be a good while before the appointment is publicly confirmed, and even longer before the new Governor-General reaches Calcutta continued Barlow. Of course, once the news gets about, my authority is crippled. Everyone will be looking forward to the new man and paying little enough attention to the acting governor. Only bright spot in the affair. My people managed to get a commitment to commission me governor of Madras. At least I'll be able to relieve that poppin' J. Bentink there. Light dawned on Merriweather. Sir George had been denied the permanent appointment as Governor-General of India. He felt a curious regret. The man was cold, hard, merciless in many respects, certainly not a likable sort. But during the past year he had acquired a great deal of respect for Barlow and his abilities. 
The man was honest and courageous, doing his best to govern India in the interests of king and company. He finished the coffee. I guess I've come a long way at that, said Barlow slowly. My father was a silk mercer in London. He did manage to give me a decent education, but I've made the most of it. But Percy told me tonight that counted heavily against me. Swung Burley over, in fact. They concluded they wanted a blue-blooded baron to follow Cornwallis and Wellesley. He shook his head. I always thought the man and his abilities counted, not his pedigree. At least I told myself that. He shook his head again. Merriweather realized that commiseration at this point would be presumptuous and decided to change the subject. Sir, Your Excellency, this man Percy I met tonight. Who is he? Another politician, mainly. Holds an appointment at the Foreign Office with the rank of Under Secretary. He has served in Italy, Sweden, Portugal, and Spain, so Thomas tells me. His mission out here is ambiguous to me. He came through the Mediterranean and overland to the Red Sea, only ten weeks from London. I suspect he represents the Minto interests, and is here principally to look over my shoulder for the time. I mean his family, said Merriweather, trying to appear offhand. Oh, said Sir George, looking at him sharply. He's a younger son of Lord Percy of Bennington, if that's what you want to know. The family is a collateral offshoot of the Percys of Northumberland. The title was granted by Charles the Second for services during the Restoration. Not an ancient one, as such things go, though his family is very old in England. His mother was a Spencer, and his brother holds the title now with male issue, so Percy is not in the line of succession. Hotspur's family, Merriweather thought, then said, He was quite courteous to me tonight. He told me he had been in Canton some years ago under very much the same conditions as I was, and wanted to talk further about China. I was curious. Sir George stifled a yawn. Well, Merriweather, I shouldn't keep you any longer. I feel as though I might sleep now. This conversation is entirely private, you understand. Sir George stood up in dismissal, and Merriweather found his way back to his tonga and thence to the ship. Two bells of the morning watch struck as he came alongside. No more than time for a nap before he must be up and about, he thought wearily, hanging his clothing on a chair and stretching out on the bed. He had barely dozed off when he came wide awake with a start. He turned over, sought sleep again, and found it quite impossible. The evening had created tensions that made sleep hopeless at this point. He felt as though he were on the verge of some great discovery, if he were only able to think the matter through. Grey light was visible through the skylight as he heaved himself off the bed and sat at his desk staring into the gloom. The coincidences were devilishly convincing. He remembered his drab, gentle mother toiling in the kitchen at Bellflower House on Belgrave Street until she died quietly in a consumptive coma. He had been twelve and she twenty-nine at the time. Her father, an old groom with a close-trimmed white beard, had come up to London to take the coffin and Merriweather back to Lord Spencer's estate in Surrey. The burial service in a country churchyard had been read hastily by a rural curate, with only his grandfather and two other men, whom Merriweather understood were his uncles and their wives present. The next day his grandfather had brusquely taken him back to London and signed the articles that made him a ship's boy in the India man Dunvegan Castle. Merriweather rubbed his smarting eyes with his knuckles. The reminiscence last night by Percy of his visit to Surrey was exactly thirty years ago this month, and he was then sixteen, as was the pretty little daughter of the groom, Merriweather. 
He had turned twenty-nine last New Year's, and suddenly Merriweather was convinced. He had seen and conversed with his father. This conclusion caused no exultation in Merriweather's soul. He approached and examined it warily. There were enough other alternatives in what might have occurred in the affairs of a sixteen-year-old girl thirty years ago in the springtime to make the matter by no means certain. But the physical resemblance was there. Eyes, hair, features, even the manner in which Percy carried himself. And the name Percival, just such a variant of Percy as a romantic young girl might bestow upon her bastard son in memory of the cavalier who had seduced and deserted her. It was goddamned circumstantial, he told himself in the grey daylight, as four bells sounded. Sang came in with a tray of breakfast. It was then, without conscious logic, that Merriweather decided he would declare himself as a serious suitor for the hand of Lady Caroline. Chapter 14 Larkin, the prize crew, and the marine detachment from the third prize came on board just before noon. They were sweat-soaked and dirty, a week's growth of beard on their faces. God, Captain, Larkin told him, refusing the chair lest he soil it. It was like guarding the door to a lion's den. Sixty men to control two hundred. It was all we could spare. Merriweather told him sharply. That was why I sent Gunny with you. Of course, Captain, but the Frenchies had two enterprising, able seamen. We couldn't identify them till this morning. And they made four serious tries at retaking the ship, the last of five bells in the mid-watch this morning. We've been at anchor off Fort William for a week, while they built more prison quarters ashore. That major... Larkin snorted at the memory, said he couldn't spare even two files of soldiers to give us a little relief. Any casualties? inquired Merriweather. Five men, including two Marines, wounded, none serious. The Marines killed eight Frenchmen and wounded seven more this morning with a volley, after they broke open a hatch forward and managed to get quite a party on deck, armed with axes and capstan bars. We were standing watch and watch, and Gunny was on deck. Larkin mopped his brow. Fort William took the prisoners, and Commodore Land sent a shipkeeping party. They'll be busy a while. The Frenchmen made a holy mess of everything below. Very well. Take a rest. I have given orders to McCamey and Dobbs for maintenance and replacement, but there will be no supplies before tomorrow. Larkin mopped his brow again, pale blue eyes above the stubble of beard, glancing wearily from Merriweather out the port to the dockyard and back. Thank you, Captain. Merriweather concluded that a tour of duty that could affect the steel and rawhide Larkin in this fashion must have been exceptional. If time permitted before another operation, Larkin should have a holiday. He turned to the stack of requisitions as the purser came in with more. Late in the afternoon, Merriweather called away the gig. He felt again as though he should explode unless he escaped the confines of Rapid. A drink and dinner at the club, probably with his old friend McClellan, would help to clear the air. At the arsenal, he could see no sign of McClellan until a European artificer pointed far down to the other end of the building. The clang of hammers on anvils, the wit wet of two man ripsaws cutting through teak, and the buzz and shriek of metal on grindstones combined in a deafening cacophony as Merriweather threaded his way through men and machinery. McClellan, his first lieutenant of a year ago in Rapid, and now in command of the arsenal, was standing behind a Chinese artisan. The man was pushing a handle on a pump-like mechanism back and forth. The device was inserted through a hole in the side of a heavy box. McClellan's lips were counting silently with each stroke of the handle. Just as Merriweather came up, 
McClellan touched the shoulder of the Chinese. Two thousand! He shouted over the noise. Enough! McClellan stepped around to the back of the box, reached in, and unscrewed something. He emerged with a metal flask, which he shifted rapidly from hand to hand as though it was hot. He laid the flask beside three others on a bench, and only then saw Merriweather. Ah, Captain! he shouted. Welcome, and come outside! In the shade outside the building, the din subsided to a gentle mutter. McClellan mopped the sweat from his big red face and took the hand Merriweather extended. This big Scots officer possessed one of the most inventive and ingenious minds Merriweather had ever encountered. Indeed, Merriweather still was using the accurate adjustable sights that McClellan had designed on the long nine-pounder pivot guns that served not only as bow and stern chasers, but as broadside guns as well for rapid. Those sights had earned him some thousands of pounds of prize money last year, though, of course, McClellan had shared in it too. You know, Captain, that first prize you sent in, Monsieur. Yes, the brig. I inspected her ordnance, of course, and found two cases of muskets in her armoury, never been opened. There was German lettering outside. Must have been some loot Boney took in Austria to put up for sale to the privateers. I was curious to see the quality of Austrian arms and open one. McClellan paused, lips pursed portentously. Merriweather wondered what he was getting at. Captain, they weren't muskets at all. They are air rifles. What? Air rifles? I never heard rifles, sir, in which the ball is propelled by air, McClellan continued. Those flasks I've just filled form the buttstock of the gun, and hold enough pressure to fire at least twenty shots at very near the velocity of a musket ball, with little noise, no flash, and no smoke. Oh, said Merriweather. I see. He made an effort to show interest in this phenomenon which was obviously of such importance to his friend McClellan. I had heard of them, of course. Old Benzinger, the German clockmaker in London, saw a test of them in Vienna twenty years or so ago. They were invented by a Swiss named Bartolome Girandoni, a doctor used by Austria against the Turks. These must have been stored away in some arsenal and then captured by Boney. I have twenty-four of them, each with two extra air flasks and a pump. I don't believe they've ever been used, McClellan said with satisfaction. You are just in time to witness a test of one. The shade was pleasant, there was even a bit of breeze off the river to evaporate the sweat, and it was much too early to visit the club. Merriweather accepted the invitation. McClellan came back carrying what appeared to be a conventional musket, except that its butt stock was one of the metal flasks. He snapped his knuckles against it, and it rang like a bell. There were some ordnance instructions printed in German in the case. My master mechanicism hung over and could read them. They said two thousand strokes of the pump for full capacity. I have no idea of the pressure, and so we filled them in the box in case the flash should explode. McClellan's Scottish burr had thickened with excitement. He took a pouch out of his pocket and poured gleaming, smooth-cast lead musket balls into his hand. Even have the moulds, fifty-one calibre, he said. It holds twenty balls, but I shall fire only ten. He dropped the balls into a metal tube located at the right side of the breech pointed the barrel up, moved a cross bolt back and forth, and then pulled back the hammer with an audible click. Merriweather became aware of a buzz of conversation and looked around. A dozen European artificers and twice that many Indians had ranged themselves along the wall of the Arsenal building. The same little Chinese artisan who had sailed with him to the Andaman Islands and later to Bombay last year came trotting toward McClellan. He saw that a plank, tall as a man, a foot wide and an inch thick, had been erected across the yard some fifty paces distant. 
McClellan put the piece to his shoulder, sighted, and pressed the trigger. There was a light, high-pitched whap that did not disturb persons walking along the river path a few yards away. Quite different from the forthright flash, roar, and cloud of smoke of a musket, Merriweather could see the hole in the centre of the board, a foot from the top, daylight showing through. McClellan raised the gun, manipulated the lock mechanism, and fired again. A second hole appeared beside the first, and he continued to fire until the tube holding the balls was empty. Less than half a minute had elapsed from the first shot. It was miraculous. The plank was cleanly pierced by each ball in a pattern about six inches in diameter. Not very good shooting, grumbled McClellan. But then I can improve these sights. The velocity and striking force compares very favorably with the service musket, I think. He took the air rifle back inside the arsenal building as the artisans gathered about to examine the target. The bell at the dockyard gatehouse told the end of the working day as Merriweather waited for McClellan to get his hat and coat. Merriweather and a board of officers from the dockyard concluded that Rapid's bottom was not so foul as to require careening. The fresh water of the Hoogley would improve it even more by killing off the barnacles. Standing and running rigging were renewed, and with the assistance of a legion of Indians, the sailmaker was cutting a complete new suit of canvas in the sail loft ashore. Commodore Sir James Waldron remained at Calcutta, lazily, he said, awaiting the southwest monsoon, before he continued east on his tour of inspection. Larkin was granted his leave, and improved it by hunting tigers up the river in Bengal, bringing back four magnificent skins as proof of his marksmanship with the long Kentucky rifle. Dr. Buttram had come racing up the ladder this morning, his face one radiant smile with the breathless report, A daughter, sir! Prettiest girl you ever saw! And Lady Jennifer? Fine, sir, fine! We've named her Catherine Anne after her grandmothers. Well, congratulations, Doctor. We must drink to the young lady and her father, if you'll be my guest at lunch, said Merriweather, wondering what it must be like to be a father. And now... Whatever happened to that Havildar that came aboard from the Frenchman? Oh, he's improving. The sugar teats worked fine. He retains solids now and can sit up, though he is still quite weak. With the repairs on deck finished, I'll move him up under an awning, sir. Good. Is he strong enough for an interview yet? I think so, Captain, said Buttram slowly. I don't want to tire him and then he has lost most of his teeth. Just fell out from the scurvy. Tomorrow will be soon enough, Merriweather told him in dismissal. I want Gunny present, and he is over at Fort William today. Below in the pleasant draught from the windsaws, Merriweather considered how almost two weeks of freedom to leave the ship at will had improved his perspective. The last few days at sea had been torment, but after a few hours ashore now he found himself as anxious to get back aboard as he had been to escape its confines. It was one of the penalties of command, he decided, the compelling continuous necessity to assure himself that all was well with the ship. He thought of the orders issued by Commodore Waldron last week. McRae in Comet would sortie south tomorrow to find the Royal Navy squadron east of Ceylon, deliver dispatches, and then show the flag of the marine up the Coromandel coast at Pondicherry, Madras, and Ganjam. There were still company packets and country ships holed up along the coast in fear of the French. Morrison in Tiger would sail east in company with Pitt to the Strait, and then return along the westbound shipping lanes to Calcutta. Only Rapid was still without orders, but the Bengal squadron had been effectively disbanded. Merriweather felt no regret at the loss of his courtesy title of Commodore, but the lack of orders for Rapid was ominous. Pray God it would not be the furnace of the Persian Gulf. Merriweather's thoughts shifted abruptly to Lady Caroline. 
he would see her tonight for the seventh time in thirteen days. He felt a thrill of anticipation. Her kisses night before last had been passionate. He had tried to tell himself that she was a woman of experience, a widow, and not a trembling maid. But it made no difference. The resolve he had made two weeks ago at dawn solidified. Tonight, risking rebuff and ridicule, he intended to ask Caroline for her hand in marriage. Merriweather was still stunned. It must be halfway through the mid-watch, he computed, but he would not strike a light to see the time. He had been back on board at least two hours. The proposal, once hesitatingly ventured, had been almost instantly accepted. Sir George and Lady Barlow had offered their felicitations and congratulations, with bumpers of sparkling wine to toast the happy couple. Sir George had called him aside later to explain that Lady Caroline had no dowry or fortune of her own. Her living was for life or widowhood, and the corpus was entailed upon her son. This was a minor relief to Merriweather. Calcutta and marine gossip would have no peg upon which to hang. Lady Barlow told him that, by agreement with her sister, she stood in locus parenti to Lady Caroline, and planned to announce the betrothal a week hence at a reception and dinner. That Minto may arrive at any time now, she said, curling her bitter mouth. I hope to have the wedding reception here. No need for a long engagement, neither of you are children. The one other thing Merriweather remembered of that hectic two hours of festivity and plans was the expression on Caroline's face. Under the crown of red-gold hair, the trembling lower lip and luminous eyes fairly shouted her love to him across the room. Her stately reserve had vanished, and she was plainly and simply a woman in love. He hoped he could reciprocate enough. He promised himself he would justify her love and felt an unaccustomed tenderness well up in his breast. Suddenly, he wondered what that man Percy, his father, would think of this marriage. Chapter 15 Buttram had the Havildar on deck in a litter, screened from the sun and occasional showers, but open to the variable breezes that forecast the southwest monsoon. His arms and legs still appeared to be no more than sticks covered by skin, but the eyes which had appeared so disproportionately large in his face two weeks ago seemed to have shrunk. Jemadar Gunny of the Marine Detachment in Rapid stood by him passively. Remember, Captain, the man has lost most of his teeth. He is still quite weak, and he may not be able to speak distinctly, said Buttram. Very well, Doctor. Now, you... Tell me your name, rank, and organization. The reply was indistinct, a whistling note overlaying the words, but intelligible. Sir, I am Luigi Havildar in the Third Company, 1st Bombay Marine Battalion. I have escaped from Mauritius. Almost the same words he had uttered when first brought aboard Rapid, Merriweather remembered. Tell me how you came to be on Mauritius. Merriweather urged. Sir, my platoon was in camel transport with two companies of sepoys last August bound for Mangalore from Bombay. It was said we were to reinforce the garrison there after the mutiny at Valor. The indistinct voice failed and the man closed his eyes. Bartram leaned forward, gaze intent upon him, then the man opened his eyes and continued. A French ship captured us, sir, and we were taken to Mauritius. He closed his eyes again, and Bottram motioned to the Indian boy of all work he had brought on board last week to spell his assistance while they were on leave. The boy picked up a cup of lime juice and held it to the man's lips. He swallowed twice and lay back, licking his lips, the shrunken, toothless gums exposed. After a moment, the man continued. The Frenchman offered us our freedom if we would enlist in their militia. 
many of the soldiers did. Not a single marine enlisted, though they starved and beat us, and set us to breaking stones for roads. The man's eyes flashed, and he raised his head to look proudly at Merriweather. How many of your men were alive when you escaped? Thirty-one, sir. Nine had died. And where are they confined, Logi? Three miles north of Port Louis, sir, in a stockade near Tombow Bay. When I escaped, I thought to stow away in the American ship bound for Madras. Alas, it had left, and the French privateer was in its berth. And when was this? Three months ago, sir. Very well, Logi, said Merriweather. I am glad you are gaining strength. I shall report your story to Commodore Waldron. Thank you, sir. The Havildar lay back and closed his eyes. Merriweather nodded to Gunny and went aft. Sir, said the Jemadar a quarter of an hour later, the grey in his hair and beard quite visible now under the skylight. I have seen this man at Bombay Castle. Two of my men have served under him, and another is from the same village. He is no spy, and tells the truth. Thank you, Gunny. I am of the same opinion. The erect military figure about faced and marched out. Merriweather leaned back in his chair and gave the matter consideration. The rescue of a man who claimed to be a non-commissioned officer of the Bombay Marine Battalion had, of course, been included in the report he had submitted to Commodore Waldron, with the footnote that his physical condition precluded questioning. Now it appeared some thirty other Marines were imprisoned by the French, but remained loyal to the service under the severest treatment. He had not heard of the loss of a camel, but Sir John would know of it. The matter must be reported, he decided, as he found paper in the desk, lifted the lid of the inkwell, and took the pen from the shot bowl. A half hour later he dropped the packet into the pouch to be delivered to the flagship by the guard mail boat in the usual routine. No, by God! exploded Commodore Waldron. I will not delay until the Royal Navy and the powers that be decide to take Mauritius. Tollett, the flag captain, showed his dismay. But, sir, no buts, Tollett. If I were not already committed to the East, I should go myself. The Bombay Marine takes care of its own. Those Marines are suffering for their loyalty to the Crown and Company, and I say we rescue them. Tollett subsided in his chair with an injured expression. Merriweather, sitting beside him with Commodore Land to his right, thought Tollett's presentation had been entirely logical. Only thirty-one Sepoy Marines involved, at last to count three months ago, and the island was sure to be taken within the next year. There's a break in the reefs along the west coast, giving entrance to Tombow Bay, and the camp appears to be on its south shore, continued Waldron. A ship can edge in close after nightfall and land a party of marines, much simpler than a cutting-out expedition. Such a prison camp will not be well defended from outside, and knowing the Creole militia, I'm sure the ones on duty will not be too alert. Should be an absolute surprise. Sir John's eyes were flashing, his hand whacking the desk to emphasise his points. Only a matter of two hours or so for you, Merriweather, once you reach the island. Merriweather was not surprised. He had anticipated something of the sort ever since Midshipman Hamlin had delivered the message an hour ago to report on board Pitt. He wondered how he could explain to Caroline and Lady Barlow that an important figure on the betrothal party next week would be absent. It was not too early, he consoled himself, for Caroline to learn the realities of the fortunes of war in the Bombay Marine. Waldron was continuing. Naturally, you'll keep this Havildar on board. He may even be strong enough to guide the landing force by the time you reach Mauritius. A voyage of six thousand miles, Merriweather thought, for thirty-one men, 
less those who might have died under punishment or from disease in the past three months. Still, this was a matter of high principle. One man or a thousand, it made no difference. As the Commodore had said, the Marine took care of its own, European or Indian, and demanded in return the very loyalty that had brought these Marines to their present straits. Commodore Land spoke up. I think we can get the balance of your supplies and water aboard today and tomorrow. I think you may get under way by day after tomorrow. Soon enough, sir? he asked Waldron. Oh, yes, replied the Commodore. It's going to be unsettled for a week or so anyway, what with the southwest monsoon setting in. I'll have your orders delivered by noon, he told Merriweather in dismissal. Caroline was merely stricken. Lady Barlow was furious, but she received no encouragement for her complaints from Sir George. He told her flatly that this was a private matter within the Marine, and of no concern to government or company. The betrothal party would be held, and the announcement made in the absence of one of the principals. It was even a minor relief to Merriweather to escape the glittering crush, the knowing eyes, the simpering or falsely hearty congratulations that he had witnessed at a similar affair before Dr. Buttram's wedding last year. In any event, he should be back before the tentative date for the wedding the third week in June. Merriweather came into Commodore Land's headquarters in the dockyard the next afternoon to pick up the Admiralty chart of Mauritius, last corrected in 1803. There should have been little change in four years, but the information was still sketchy, he found, as he looked at the reefs indicated along the west coast north of Port.